Hello. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Hi. Here we here we all are. Um, feeling rather ASMR tonight. We're just gonna we're just gonna keep things real real low key. Welcome, welcome. It is Friday night on twitchtv show and ordinarily this would be wild cards, but we just concluded our ETU campaign last week. It was just last week, and so this week we are back for our um, we're back for the first and the last time to do our bonfire chat back, <laughs> talk about ETU and all good things, Savage World, Saving Throw, all that stuff. The questions that you guys have submitted. Uh, looking at this question stock, there are several different uh, things that have been submitted, and if you have not yet gotten the chance to submit a question, you still have a couple minutes. I'm going to turn off the uh, response acceptance as soon as we are done getting everything introed. But hi, my name is Jordan Caves Callerman. I am the GM of this show and the Dean of the table, or I was the Dean of the table, but uh, everybody graduated. So there's no need for the old Dean anymore. Uh, but uh, here we are, here we are to do the bonfire chat back. Everybody else want to introduce themselves and the character that they played? Nah. Okay. I'll go. All right. <laughs> Uh, I am Ow. Dom Sook, and I played Ron Tagoth Stevens. Yay! <laughs> wow, did everyone get <laughs> muted at the same time? <laughs> I'm... I'm... <laughs> <laughs> you guys are fucking trashed. It's... Oh, hi, I'm Megan Caves, and I played Adelaide Blackwood. I'll go next. My name's Gaurav Gulati, and I played Calvin Everett Jr. And last but not least, Jordan Pridgen, and I played Joshua Charles Sawyer. Charles. His name was Charles. Charles. Yeah, this has been established. I don't remember that. Well, I, I guess that at all. that's remember. a great segue, because tonight we're going to be bringing up all kinds of things that we've probably forgotten about that the eagle-eyed members of the Alumni Association are here to remind us of. <laughs> Was well, no name was composition. composition. Book. Yeah, oh, composition Joshua book. composition. <laughs> That's so weird. Like the first day we we had those books. Would a person whose middle name wasn't Charles have a composition book? <laughs> no. That disappears out of reality. <laughs> oh wow! I see we got three more questions in. Um, so before we oh. jump in, here's the way things are going to work tonight, guys. Um, you have all been submitting your questions for us. There are many, many of them. As of right now, we're looking at 131. Uh, now, some of these are overlaps, and some of them are the same question multiple times, but we're going to make our best effort to get through all of them tonight. And then, time and weather permitting, uh, we will be able to take some live questions from all of you who are in chat. So just know, first, we are going to answer all of the questions that have been submitted through the questions doc. Then we will take any live questions from chat. So if any questions come up that you have, please hold them until the end. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, you're free to talk about them in chat, but we probably won't see them. You also- They have another minute to put questions in, right? What's up? Do they have another minute to put questions in, right? They do. This is gonna go until we are done with the intro. Uh, so- I just uh, saw the Fractured other... Avatar asking about it in chat. What's up? I just saw Fractured Avatar asking about it in chat, so. Gotcha. I think I posted. Dom did a good job. Oh, great, great. Everybody's doing the things that they're supposed to do. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is there are no uh, no shots, there's no actual gameplay tonight. However, there still are unlocks on the table uh, because we are still trying to keep the studio going even though we are not currently in the studio and we at Saving Throw are an independent channel and we do rely on the support of our uh, our community. Uh, if you are enjoying what you're seeing and you do want to see the extra unlocks, well, I'll just go ahead and say it. The unlocks tonight are uh, each one a epilogue for one of the characters here at the table. The fifth and final unlock is an epilogue for one of my NPCs. And I think that you will all be very interested to see that one but I can't give you too many more details about it other than that. These are not, and I, I will repeat, these are not crucial to the character's story. Consider these post credit scenes um, in like the longest Marvel movie that you have ever seen. Um, and, uh, and yeah, yeah. So if you are interested in those, uh, please do feel free to tip to support the channel. And uh, hopefully we will get a few, if not all of those unlocked. Also, 
this should go without saying, but there are major spoilers uh, tonight for anything else that has happened at any point during our ETU campaign, up to and including the conclusion of it. So if you are not finished catching up with everything and you don't want to have anything ruined for you, I would suggest uh, maybe uh, maybe muting us and keeping us on in the background <laughs> while you continue to watch other things. And then um, you can always come back to this later on once you're all caught up. Unless you're the sort who like that, I think there was an article a while back that was like, spoilers don't ruin the enjoyment of shows. And if you read that, that's true. Uh, no, it's not true. Uh, scientifically, <laughs> they said that, but that is 100% not the case for me. I am, me uh, things are ruined for me if there are spoilers that I learned. So um, however you are, we're glad to have you here. And if you don't want to have anything spoiled, we also totally understand. Um, is there anything else that we need to go over up top? Oh yeah, one other tiny, tiny insignificant detail. At the very end of the show tonight, we will be announcing what is next for wild cards. So if you are here just to learn that information, might I recommend coming back in several hours uh, and, uh, and joining us then. Or hang out. Halfway through these questions. What? I said, or hang out with us, because we're cool if people. Only, if they're only interested in learning that. Still hang out. Yeah, I mean, you can hang out if you want, but I feel like it's going to be unpleasant for everyone because they don't really want to hang out. They just want to know what's happening next. doesn't matter. If you don't hang out, you we're going to delete this video. It's not going to YouTube. You're never going to know. But oh, it's only if you don't hang out. Huh. We're going to say... Moving on. All right. So uh, is there anything else we need to cover up top on uh, on the saving throw side of things, Dom? Uh, no, I don't think so. That having been said, the questions document is now locked in 10, 9, oh, 8, man, I passed. 7, 6, 5, 4. This is what it's like to be dreamed three, by him, by the way. 2, 1, locking it. All right. We are locked in. Locked. Locked. Folks, we have a lot of really great questions tonight. Are you all ready to dive in? Let's do it. Yes. A, re a reminder. Okay. We have many, many questions to get through. So do try and keep your uh, responses concise and to the point. Uh, uh, can't JP. Show a lot of fun, but we can only do a couple of those tonight. So choose them wisely. All right. The first question coming to us tonight from Shimixon uh, <laughs> is the question that is and has been on everyone's mind uh, the entire time, essentially, that we've been running this campaign. Has? Is? Is this a good idea? Uh, I don't. <laughs> probably not. I don't have to answer this anymore. You know what? Yes. I, you know what? Good ideas are the less interesting ideas, like, 90% of the time. Right? Like, like you got to do ideas that aren't that aren't the best. Okay. Ideas. He's on to something. Harsh. No, I think that's a bit harsh on people who like do the right thing. That's a very American like dream way of putting that in my mind. Clearly we could talk about this at some <laughs> length, but since it was just a gimmick question, I'm going to thank Shimixon and move on. <laughs> Shimixon with the gimmick quish. I stand, yeah. I stand pretty strongly behind my answer. All right. Uh, this next question comes to us from Agomai or Agome. Uh, I, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that. For the Dean, what are some adventures slash character interactions slash moments that you would have liked to play with, but that just never came around? That's a great question. This is, what um, this is, a, this is a good question. There, a lot of you asked a question somewhat like this, so we will probably, I'll be uh, notating you later on, but we'll probably be skipping over it since we're going to answer some of it now. Um, but uh, there is so much. Uh, I have a tendency when I am running these games at the wild cards table to just throw out story hooks and ideas left and right and just see what sticks. Uh, and there's always invariably some stuff that slips through the cracks. Um, I will say one thing in particular that I never got the chance to fully develop was Professor Cutter. Um, Professor Cutter at ETU is actually the subject of not just one, but two savage tales uh, that could have happened over the course of uh, the student's time. And I was trying to build him up in earlier seasons uh, for those adventures. However, it just never really felt right. I never really had the right space for it. And then uh, the moment had passed. Um, so I never really got a chance to uh, develop that. 
I will maybe answer some more in depth later on when this question comes up again. But for now, <laughs> that will have to suffice. So wait, OK, I want to say this real quick. And I, I won't go too long on this. But from my perspective, I had no idea whether Professor Cutter was a character you made up or a character from the plot point campaign. Uh, not Cutter is, specifically. It's a Cutter, real person. That's, you know, that's the biggest thing for me is like, I really want to like look at the degrees of horror campaign and find out what you made up and what was in there already. Now you can, we're done. Go uh, nuts. Okay. <laughs> uh, next question from Mace134. Dean, how did you decide to wrap up the Ron Tagafian plotline as you did? I am going to put a hold on this Mace134 because a lot of people were very curious about this. And there is a, a version of this question later on that poses um, things specifically to me and Dom about it. So I will save the answer for that uh, for later on. But to Mace 134 and to the rest of you who were curious about that, hold tight. The answer will be coming uh, later on. Uh, this one again is from Agomai or Agome. What was the scariest moment for you all? Like in, in the story? I have given you the context that the question <laughs> provided. So you can <laughs> how best you can fit. Final question. Um, I don't know. I have a lot of different responses to that because there's the anxiety that I have uh, about um, doing a show. <laughs> and that's one kind, like certain elements, certain things that can happen in the game, they can scare me. But the thing in within the story that was the scariest that stands out is, is probably the thing in the corner. Um, just because that whole episode was just... I don't know. There was just something kind of uh, visceral about it, in a sense, in the imagery. And I really liked it, so... Right? Yeah. That's what I'd um, say. For, for me, it would have to be the time that my GM uh, described my character eating roaches. Oh, God, I hate it would that. Be, it would be that part. It Which that time? Part. That, it was that one. It yeah. scary to me. It's but it's gross. Oh. For me, it's definitely my incapacitation in one of the last, like three or four episodes or whatever it was. The, the one where Randy was in our house. Because right. I, I, I mean, I rolled the first roll and it failed and I did a re-roll. And the first thing I saw in that was that one of the dice had rolled a one and the other die had fallen out of my sight. Like <laughs> it, it fell off the book I had in front of me. And I, and it was like, there's one in six chance that Sawyer's just dead now. And, and we've talked about it before. And if I died at that point, it would probably just be like, well, see you next game. <laughs> so I, I was really worried about that. There was some drama there. Um, mine was uh, uh, Brad, uh, the, the, drug, the, drug, the dealer. drug dealer. From, uh, from sophomore year. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah. That, that was, one he was, more he was than, scared. I mean, I definitely had, you know, sweaty palms through thing in the corner and, and towards the end of the campaign and stuff like that when like like the siege and and stuff but uh i think brad had the most visceral reaction for me for for being terrifying hmm. yeah that was a that was an interesting uh like episode that, where we got to explore some of the the real world horror of uh etu a little bit more closely that was that was interesting yeah. and not something i planned for even uh, not like that is always my favorite element in these these games personally what, what's up that, that sort of thing was always my favorite element in these games. Like like dealing with the like real personal horror that would deal, it would come with a lot of this stuff. Sure. Yeah, I mean, that's a big part of horror. So uh, great question. Thank you for that, Agamai. D uh, did everyone get a chance to answer? It's a little bit weird doing this remotely, so I'm... Yeah. Yes. All right. <laughs> Your next question from Mace134, and this is a Deadlands Lawless question for the players. Hmm. Was a worst nightmare assigned to your character? And if not, what would their worst nightmare be? Nope. N uh, no. No. Yeah, no. We weren't. were not assigned any nightmares. Um, um, hmm. Worst nightmares are, of course, important in Deadlands because if you do come back harrowed, uh, that is what the Manitou makes you live through. Um, but I did not assign one to any of the characters. So if you guys can think of one or or have one uh, that makes sense for for your characters, feel free to share it. But if you don't have one, that's also fine. I think that. Um... Cherries would probably be losing the the status of, of Chi Master because she was a um, 
a street urchin and essentially like the realization that she's still nothing the feeling of being nothing uh as a street urchin i think would be her worst fear dark i feel like, uh, well, I feel like Eldon would have had something about like helplessness because i think for him it was probably a bit of an adjustment like coming to terms with having lost an arm and still being a like capable person and and, and what i don't know how deep we went into this i don't remember exactly but like the, the backstory that JCC gave me was that he kind of got into a criminal life before he um, got involved in Empire. And I kind of imagine it's because having lost his arm was sort of such a, like, I can't do anything anymore moment. So, so something like that, where it's like he's lost control of his body, he can't do anything. I'd say Ransom probably... Uh essentially being invisible or being unable to be heard uh would be his biggest nightmare like having mm. his tongue removed or something like like that he's used to being oh, okay. sort of center of attention and uh kind of commanding a room and i think not being able to do that would be really hard um i think wheeler's greatest nightmare is probably rejection in the harshest way in that he would put himself out there either with a great idea an invention or even even asking cherry out or something like that like rejection from all fronts just being told no your idea is stupid we've already laughed you out of school at this point we're gonna reject everything you do from now on and him just being sort of cut away because of his ideas if that makes sense sure yeah i think those are good answers thank you guys uh next question from the Hussman slash Obocop hey. for the Dean. What was your favorite thing or event to describe to the players? This is a really hard question um, because uh, the nothing stands out in particular. My descriptions are often improvised. Um, so I, some of them are winners and some of them aren't. Um, and the things that stand out in my head um, are when I have either hit on a, a way of describing something really horrific that I can see is having an effect on uh, the players at the table, or I discover something fun and entertaining in uh, an NPC that I want to play with, and I, and I see that the players are having fun with it too. That is way more fun than I discover something fun in an NPC that I want to play with, and everyone's like, Okay, cool. We're done talking to this guy. That's 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 fine. Um, so uh, those are among my favorite things to describe to the players. Uh, this one too uh, is from the Husman uh, slash Obocop. Uh for the Dean. Follow up question: What percentage of things or events do you have written out for descriptions, or is it all just notes? Uh, and yeah, I I um, in fact uh, the. Deadlands uh, Kickstarter that just finished, I just submitted my notes from uh, the Lawless two-parter that we did, which included um, my outlines for both episodes. I do an outline that's pretty bare bones and skeletal. Um, the only descriptions that I write down are any words or descriptors that are important or crucial for the player's understanding of what's happening or solving the mystery in some way. Uh, the rest of it, I just hope I don't uh, struggle with uh, when it comes to the moment, uh, there there are sometimes it goes well, and there's other times where I was like, oh, I made that thing oozy, and I didn't mean to do that, but I guess it's just wet now. That's different. Um, so it's a mixed bag, but I, I do tend to improvise descriptions. Um, this one from Mace134. To the players, did any of you grow to regret your character's major when you realized that the Dean was going to keep quizzing you on it? <laughs> no, I was like, no. thank God, at least I know a little bit about English because <laughs> it crosses into drama territory. Nope. I, I do, it's not that I regretted journalism because it was very key to Sawyer, but I sort of wish that I had spent more time looking into it because I felt very much like one thing I've tried to do with characters in the past is like they know things I know so that I can talk intelligibly about it and I don't know journalism all that well. So I sort of felt a little um, out in the woods when it came to talking about that stuff. Like when 
okay, this is like an example, but like in like one of the last episodes, when JCC mentioned that my character would have like a fear and loathing in Las Vegas, like a Hunter S. Thompson poster in his thing, I was like, of course he would. Why didn't I think of that? <laughs> because anyone who knew was super into journalism would have totally been into that. But so well, I didn't regret certain it. types of journalism I at least. I've known more about it personally. So, Dom, no regrets on the anthropology questions. Yours, I feel like, <laughs> were by far the hardest questions uh, at the table. You, yeah, you definitely, uh, every time I would, like, be able to answer everyone else's question, then you'd give me one that I'd be like, what? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I, I enjoyed it. I took two anthro classes in college, and uh, I loved them, and... If I if I went to my first my first major idea, which was to become an archaeologist, I would have I would have probably known all of them, but I I didn't go that far. So no, it was a lot of fun. I liked it. Okay, all right. Oh oh, and I see that we have uh, the alumni association has unlocked the first epilogue actually, um, which is Sawyer's epilogue. So we will get to that uh, here in a moment. Let's see. Um, we will answer. Uh, seven more questions, which will put us at an even 15, and then we will do uh, Sawyer's epilogue. So thank About you very 10 much. About 10% of the way there. For unlocking that. Yeah, there we go. Um, <laughs> next question from Mace134. To the Dean, which was your favorite character to portray in the entire series, and why was it Barrett? <laughs> um, Barrett was obviously a lot of fun for me to portray. A lot of the NPCs were, but um, it, it's it's funny to me how immediately the answer to this question jumps to mind. My favorite character to portray in the entire series of ETU was the, um, I think he was the Walden books or Crown books. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> was still being paid, uh, despite the fact that the company no longer existed. No, um, I just, it wasn't Walden books. It was like King or something. Like it was that? B. Dalton, I think. Was it, yeah. it was it was one of those various bookstores yeah. that no longer exists uh, that used or to be everywhere. Books. And that was an improvised thing because I did not expect the study group to want to check out other bookstores <laughs> in uh, in Pinebox. <laughs> I had to just come up with other bookstores. And um, I don't know. I was really tickled by that guy. And I want to know a lot more about his life. <laughs> um, he was my favorite. I don't even remember his name, but that was him. That's why our next campaign is a spinoff of people who sell books in just a uh, bookstore. Box, Texas. <laughs> Savage booksellers. <laughs> uh, this question comes from Ryan Sweet. What was the easiest session to play as a player? To play as a player? What was what the was, easiest? Uh, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, that's hard. You know what? I will say all of these sessions were harder than Deadlands, which... It's like a weird thing to say, but like it, uh, I, I had to think more about like, cause, cause I know I personally wanted Sawyer to be a less mature character than I've like played before in a lot of things. And the hardest sessions were things like the ones where like we were playing Savage Worlds together, you know, because that's when you have to like really think about what your character doesn't just think about themselves, but they think about other things. <laughs> Sure. Um, my, my answer is actually the total opposite of JP's because for Calvin, for me playing Calvin, playing the Savage Worlds adventure is actually the easiest thing because I can imagine what a jock would do at a game like that. <laughs> but I'm, it's much harder for me to imagine what a jock just does in school because I didn't really have that many jock friends in school. So my information of that is just based off of television and movies and that always seems so heightened and weird. Wait, wait. Are you calling Calvin a jock? I mean, sort of. No, maybe not a jock, but like a more like, 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 like an entire year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You you know the kind of person I'm talking about that goes to college and acts like this. So it, it was easier for me to play him Robin as a Harman. fish out of water than it was for him for me to play him as a school kid. Sometimes, and now that I think about it, I guess it could go either way. But that, that's what I thought off the top of my head. Sure. Um, I mean, I will agree that the a a Adelaide GM's Savage Worlds episode was complicated. That that one was <laughs> trying to, yeah, there's just a lot of layers of things to keep in mind. It was fun, but weird. Uh, so that one was definitely hard. But yeah, I don't know. Uh, ETU, it's just a different beast than Deadlands for sure. And it, it had different obstacles. Um, yeah. 
I don't know. I don't know that any one stands out beyond that, though. So that that episode, I, I feel like I would say it was hard, but it also like one of my favorite things to do is play a character playing another character. <laughs> so meta. <laughs> Which is just really fun, and it's it, it can be difficult to do, but like it's when it, it can just be one of the most like fun, rewarding role playing performance kind of things to do. So, I like yeah, I like that. What I didn't like was having to keep track of two different sets of rules in my head. That's that's if 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 I was just playing a character playing a character, I'd be like, this is great. Uh -huh. it, it's it's the mechanic, it's the technical stuff that I find hard. Yeah. How about you, Dom? Yeah, I I don't I I don't know that I have one that was particularly easy. I mean, I I chose a lot of character things that were going to be difficult for me, um, uh, from the get go. So uh, I there wasn't there wasn't really anything. I mean, when when it when it got more mechanical, like when it was you know the combat situation or something like that. Like obviously, I had specked out ron to be able to do that stuff and so that was a little bit more straightforward um but those were only like portions of episodes so uh i i wouldn't say that the episodes were hard but it was like it, to pull out one that was necessarily easier than the others is is difficult because ron was such a uh crazy character to play sure. <laughs> cool all right well thank you guys um, so this question comes from Doe Jersey, uh, and uh, this one I think we can answer. This one, this one has all the parts that all of the ones kind of have. Uh, so this is also about the the decision that Ron Tagoth made at the very end of our uh, campaign. Was Ron's decision to not start Ron Tagoth's apocalypse a close decision? And JCC, did you have a ripcord plan? Should Ron have accepted the offer? So. First, I want to hear from Dom about uh, where what was in your head uh, for all of that and how that decision came. I'm curious about JCC's side of this answer too, but which which one would you prefer? Answer it, JP. No, no, no. You, you, you <laughs> I want to hear yours. I agree. JCC's in charge here. Like, but I'm, I'm just saying, I'm curious. Um, I have thoughts. Uh. uh... Yeah, I mean, I I came very close to accepting um, the the offer. I I really wanted. I had no idea that that was coming, and I really wanted to see where it would lead. Um, but uh, I I think in terms of I I always think in terms of of or I try to think in terms of character arc and where I want the character to go. And I I had been establishing a lot that Ron had found his true family at ETU. And I think that he would realize, or he did realize, that he didn't want to lose it the way that he had been taught it would be lost. And he had, you know, we, we established in earlier seasons that Ron was having second thoughts about um, the the cult and stuff like that. And uh, I think I think this was this was the where he was going. I thought this was a better direction for him it would have been really neat to see what would have happened but also like i love that we had a win we had a success and i didn't want that to be like i didn't want to see what would happen if it didn't so um i i like the way that this question is phrased uh jcc did you have a ripcord plan should ron have accepted the offer what you actually saw was the ripcord plan. Uh, my my belief was that Ron would accept the offer. Oh, so really? the deck was stacked in my favor because the the fear rolls that Ron was making, had he failed any of those, he would have been compelled to accept the offer. So I was like, one way or another, this is probably going to happen. The reason I felt that was because uh, just e even though we had handled all that stuff with Ron and seen uh, the arcs that he'd gone through as far as questioning the cult, when it came time at the beginning of this season, when his, uh, when his people came to town uh, and he was asked whether he would accept the mantle of destiny, uh, Ron said yes, which mm -hmm. was a surprise to me at that point. I expected him to say no at that point. So I was like, oh. Where was there like being like, don't say yes. <laughs> right. Well, he he had said yes, and I was like, okay. Well, then, interesting. We can we can play with this later on. Uh, there is, 
an additional question later on that will offer us a little more uh, in, insight on this. But that was my, my ripcord was him saying no. So that is what you got to see. <laughs> uh, thank you for that question, Doe Jersey. Uh, this one comes from Mace 134. Dean, I noticed that you tapered off the high strangeness events in later seasons. Was that a conscious decision? And if so, what motivated it? Uh, yes, it was a conscious decision. And here is why. I love the high strangeness tape. Uh, table in ETU. Um, it is great, and I actually used it a few times in our Deadlands campaign uh, because I think it just adds some some wonderful weirdness to things. I did have it as something that would happen in earlier seasons of ETU, but the problem with the high strangeness table is that the events that uh, you randomly generate with it are very weird and very specific, and many of them feel very meaningful but they're not they're just sort of weird environmental things that happen and when you put those in front of a player it's kind of like they go into a dungeon room and when you're describing it as the gm you accidentally spend too long describing how nice a tapestry is and how they're <laughs> positive that the answer to their problems has something like, with this tapestry let's burn the tapestry Let, well, let's recreate the tapestry in another <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, no, it's just a nice tapestry. So the problem with the high strangeness, um, which I ran into, is if it's not related to what's happening, it ends up kind of introducing a random red herring for players to chase after and get distracted from the main thing. When we did introduce high strangeness, I always tried to skew it so that it had something to do with what was going on, but that just ended up being too much uh, like mental gymnastic work. Uh, and I decided it would probably be easier to just uh, not not do it in future sessions. But I am still a big fan of the table. And a uh, if, if you are successful at using it in your games, power to you. I'll be honest. I remember a couple times specifically where you said something happened. And I was like, this is a plot thing. <laughs> and then later you were like, and we've unlocked a little bit of high strangers. And I was like, oh, <laughs> it's not a plot thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it can, be, it can be confusing. Uh, this question comes from Artemis28. Is Helen LaCroix related to Simone LaCroix, or is it just a coincidence? Same question. Um, you would have to ask uh, Ed Wetterman and Preston DuBose about that. Those are the guys that, uh, that wrote ETU and wrote this plot point campaign. Um, I do not know. I had just come off uh, concluding our Deadlands campaign where uh, Simone, Baron Simone LaCroix was uh, the main antagonist of Dom's character. So as soon as I saw that, that's what I thought. And in fact, um, although I missed it in my first several read-throughs, uh, Helen is described as being uh, darker complected with, uh, with uh, like raven black hair. Um, so... And, and she is originally from, uh, I believe, the Bayou area of New Orleans. So I would say I found the connection a little too uh, convenient to ignore, but I, I didn't play with that. Um, but I, I thought the same thing. I don't have the exact answer for you. I can say as when it came to our game, it didn't matter. <laughs> um, this one comes from Silvana. JCC, what process do you go through for writing the end of a campaign? I actually finished my first campaign in Tales from the Loop on the same day as your finale. Congratulations. And it took me days of pondering to come up with a suitable and hopefully satisfying ending. Um, well, I have only written the end of one campaign, which was our Deadlands campaign. Uh, for this one, we were running the Degrees of Horror plot point campaign, and the final two episodes of this season were as written in uh, Degrees of Horror. I obviously tweaked things a little bit to incorporate some uh, elements from our show, um, but largely that ending was written um, by uh, the, the, the adventure itself. So I cannot take credit for, for that one. Um, so I, I don't I don't know what process I go through for writing the end of a campaign. <laughs> I've only done it once before now. <laughs> All right. Uh, next question, and then we will jump into Sawyer's epilogue. Oh, and I see we have also unlocked the next epilogue as well. Thank you very much to all of you in the alumni. Uh, Adelaide's epilogue oh. has also been unlocked. Uh, here is our last question before we jump into the first epilogue. Uh, this one comes from Savage Riggs. The study group was confronted with many dilemmas over the course of Wildcard's ETU. My question for the Dean and each of the players is, is which proved most difficult for you to navigate and why? 
Which decisions? Which dilemma? Dilemma. Which dilemma proved most difficult to navigate and why? Okay, I know my answer. Go for it. I guess I'll just say it. Um, and Sawyer didn't end up being really able to do this, but when we were on the roof of the building and we had the choice of, God, I don't remember the names right now. I would have to check them up through my book. But like when it became clear that somebody needed to die for that, like fucked up. For Ariel and Matt? Thing, yeah, 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 Ariel and Matt, Ariel and Matt, oh. that's right. When it became clear and like Sawyer was like trying to strangle the person to death, like I remember that being a really difficult decision because it would be a hard decision and it makes sense and it was really difficult. And before that, we had never killed someone who was a human, um, who we were sure was entirely human. Like we, we had dealt with the, that professor, but he was, he had already murdered somebody and he was attacking us. And it was like, well, we gotta do it. And after that, there were a couple of points where we like killed people who were people who were Nazis or cultists or something like that. And that bit of like decision-making had already kind of been done when we had to deal with like deciding whether it was worth it to kill somebody to stop somebody else from dying. And I, I, I think that was a really fun, interesting, difficult decision. Well, what I think is interesting, because to me, inherently, most dilemmas and decisions and just figuring out how to navigate was a lot harder in ETU. And I think that's because it was a modern setting uh, with modern rules. So like, it's funny to me that we're like, we just killed a person. We're in Deadlands, we're like, bang, 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 you know, everywhere and people are dying. or Yeah, or fantasy or anything. So um, it, it, it left it like, there's some aspects of that that are fun. And then there's just a lot of murkiness, like in Deadlands or in another game, I can go, well, I'm, I'm a paladin. I'm, I'm really good. And I do all the good things, but in, in this modern world, it's like, and, and half the things we're dealing with are, are murky, even if it's monsters at times. So, um, I don't know. I don't know if there was a particular dilemma. So many of my dilemmas and the conflict of which way to go, um, it, there was just no definitive, like with Rosaline, I, not that it was always clear, but I would often go, okay, here's a definitive way that I think Rose would go. Whether it's good or bad is not the point. This is what I think Rose would do. Adelaide, she was, a, she was good. She wanted to do things well, but that wasn't all she was. And it was just difficult. <laughs> it wasn't as black and as black and white, I think. If that's an answer to that question. <laughs> I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And from the mm -hmm. non-cannibal side of the table? <laughs> Ooh, thanks for the introduction. We just, we just, we figured out in ETU that we were the non-cannibal side and they were the cannibal side. Yeah, exactly. yeah, it's it's handy how the cannibal side figured out that the other side was the cannibal side. <laughs> it's easy how you guys just seem to be like completely washing what actually happened and there's video of it. So you sure. guys are cannibal side. <laughs> Cannibals. Um... Uh, the only decision that I thought was difficult to make in the moment was a bit of a meta one. It was when uh, my body was, Calvin's body was taken over by that pirate ghost oh, spirit. God. And so Jordan had basically, for that session, he didn't know who was going to get it. It was whoever touched the bracelet first, it clasped onto, and they were invaded by that pirate spirit. He handed me a little note card that said, uh, I, I honestly cannot remember the name of the pirate, but he said, this is the pirate's name. They are yeah, yeah, yeah. pirate. Yes. Uh, and you said, basically, play him like a real pirate. Don't play him like a joke pirate. I don't know if that's what you wrote, but you wrote something to that effect. He's not a Disney pirate. He's a real pirate. So make him seem that way. So basically how I played him was as realistic as possible, including not being afraid to murder the populace that gets in his way. And at that point, I had, you know, I was like, am I going to shoot Sawyer? Like Calvin wouldn't do it, but Three-Eyed Jack probably would. And so like I made that decision and I think it made for a great moment. Which but it, it was tough. <laughs> by the way, like definitely helped solidify the like ongoing yeah group meme of Calvin shooting shooting Sawyer all the time. And that wasn't the second. That wasn't the first time you had gotten shot. So that's why it was that had set the pattern. I think. Yeah. Yeah. That one. That one set the <laughs> definitely the pattern. <laughs> Dom. Uh, um, I, I would probably also go with what JP said. The um, the killing because uh. Ron, I, I was not 
I would not have chosen Ron to shoot him. Um, but uh, I, I, I felt that it, not that it needed to happen, but but it kind of did. Like like it was, it it was something that felt very strongly that I was like this this has to happen, and if it's. And and then I after it happened I was like you know I'm actually kind of glad that Ron did that because it it was not something that I thought Ron would do and then I the more I thought I thought about it, I was like yeah Ron would would take this into his take matters into his own hands you know he he would um, uh, honor the the wish and 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 uh, kill this guy basically um but but yeah it, that one was was a hard one to i just i don't think any of us really wanted to be the one that pulled the trigger but but it was it kind of presented itself that way so yeah when uh garav shot me in that part of me was like you motherfucker and the other part of me was like okay i respect what you've decided to do here <laughs> thank you um, my dilemma, which was most difficult, uh, was of an entirely different nature. Uh, this was season two, episode four, I want to say, uh, Beautiful Smile, which was the, um, art museum episode. And, um, what happens in that one is the, the painting, uh, is cursed and causes, like, a mass breakout of, like, romantic, uh, aggressive romantic affection, essentially, among everyone who sees it. And I was so focused on the part of the episode that happens later on where, you know, uh, someone got transported into the painting and they had to fight the scarecrow to find their exit that I didn't realize until we got into the middle of the situation at the art museum at the table, I was like, oh crap, this is a consent minefield. <laughs> yeah. um, because what the, 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 the point of that scene was supposed to be everyone was under the influence of uh, the magical effects of the painting but the study group at that point did not know that and I had NPCs aggressively approaching them uh, sexually and physically and I realized as that was happening I was like oh I should have thought more about this um, so uh, that that one was, was kind of tricky and I, I, I found myself kind of um, trying to figure out a way to resolve that situation without making anyone feel more uncomfortable than they needed to feel. Um, but uh, that one, that one was, a, a, that one was a, a tricky one for me. So uh, that one stands out in my head. And uh, thank you for that question, Savage Riggs. Now, I suppose we should catch up with our dear old friend, Joshua Charles Sawyer. The time is um, uh, not too long after the finale of our campaign. The very next day. For this, so let's see how this goes. Uh, are you are you ready to um, inhabit Sawyer one more time? Yeah, let's do it. The very next day after graduation, the Risen Church in Pine Box, Texas, has been decorated modestly, um, but still but still fairly uh, fairly nicely for an impromptu wedding. The wedding, of course. Laura Lee and Marco. And as the doors open and the music starts to play to announce the bride, it becomes clear. Uh, Marco standing nervously up at the front of the altar dressed in what looks like probably the nicest outfit that he had available in his closet. Everyone else keeping a kind of casual low-key wedding aesthetic going. But when the doors open and the music plays, here comes the bride. In walks Laura Lee in a stunning and clearly very expensive wedding dress. Um, it is immediately evident where all of the finances for the wedding uh, were poured. And as she walks down the aisle, arm in arm with her father, beaming at the crowd and her face spins around looking at the assembled guests, it appears that she is looking for one person in particular. And when she finds him, tucked away in the corner on the far side of the church, sitting on the end of a pew. Her eyes light up with something that could be uh, joy or surprise. It's hard to tell. That person, of course, is Joshua Sawyer, sitting over in the far end of the church, watching the wedding occur. And as you are doing that, Joshua, you hear from behind you, oh, well, this is quite a lovely ceremony, isn't it? <laughs> and turn around to see the bright-eyed face of Forrester Harris, 
the Pine Box Pawn shop owner. Oh, no. I'll be honest, I'm a little surprised you were invited to this. Oh, I wasn't invited. So, what are you doing here? Well, I should think that would be obvious, boy. I am here to collect. Have you already collected? You, you took 15 years from my life for the questions that, by the way, just led me to do things I would have already done if I just spent some time thinking on it. I took no such thing, my boy. It was your choice to use your phone to seek answers, and it was your choice to accept the consequences. Yeah, and I've accepted it. I'm not seeking you out to try and get revenge or something like that, but I don't see what it is you could be trying to collect on. Well, it seems to me that perhaps I have not lived up to my end of the bargain to hear you speak after all. I promised you everything, and you seem dissatisfied. Well, I got three questions. And the questions I got were honestly so vague that it didn't honestly change what I was trying to do. It was do the ritual. It was, I don't remember. Jordan doesn't entirely remember what the other two were, but. Uh, but Sawyer lines them out one after another. Sawyer knows because Sawyer has obsessed over these answers. Well, it they happen. seems to me that's perhaps uh, a problem that might be had in the asking of the question. But still, I hate to have a dissatisfied customer wandering around and I can see from the looks of you, he says, looking you up and down and taking in your clearly 37-year-old uh, form, that uh, you might not fit in too well with your contemporaries now. So I've also come to collect on the rest of what was promised to me. What do you mean the rest of what was promised? Well, you offered everything <laughs> for everything. And did you think everything included a mere 15 years of your life? Well, did you think everything in return meant the words uh, agree to do the ritual? Because that's not everything. At best, that's a vague situation of advice. I don't, my boy, which is why I've come to you. See, with this convergence event behind us, it, Seems that uh, there is not much that currently requires my attention here in Pine Box, and as you are altered and no longer uh, a member of your own community in certain extents, I thought perhaps you could join me on my travels. You have a curious mind, after all, and a desire to learn, and I can show you things that, my boy, I promise you, no one else can show you. It might be nice to have a little companionship. What's the catch? No catch. Except, of course, that there would be no coming back. If I'm honest, I, I almost feel like I can't come back already. When, when I try and talk to people I've met, I mean, I try and talk to my family and I don't know, it's clear to them that I'm I'm not, I don't look like I used to. I don't know, it's just, it's, it's too hard to explain. He nods and clucks sympathetically as you, as you speak. And then when you have reached the end, he looks up at you. Well, my boy, I must be honest as well. It's not exactly an entirely voluntary thing. And he reaches out and puts a hand on your shoulder. And moments later, as the preacher at the front of the church gets to his point of the sermon where he says, and now if anyone should have any reason why these two should not be joined in holy matrimony, speak now or forever hold your peace. And Laura Lee, her body tense, looks around and casts an eye back over her shoulder to the far end of the church where Sawyer was seated, she finds no sign of either him or that curious old man sitting behind him anywhere to be seen. This has been an epilogue for Joshua <laughs> Sawyer. Thank you very much, alumni. <laughs>
That's fun. I like that epilogue. <laughs> well, good, because it's the one you got. <laughs> through, and then uh, here in a bit, we will get to see what happened with Adelaide afterwards. Um, that was, if of we, course, before Nick Fury showed up. Yes, if, question. If we, if we make more, if we get more money, can we have alternate epilogues? Is that what's being suggested here by... No, no, <laughs> but I do see that we just unlocked our third epilogue. <gasps> Calvin Everett Jr.'s epilogue yeah, has baby. been unlocked. So we will get to those in a bit. But first, more questions. This question comes from Wok Wok. Will we ever see the study group go up against the chickens in the mist as a surprise bonus game someday? Oh. Possibly as a Patreon bonus or a convention game? Possibly. <laughs> it's possible. Anything is possible. Next question. Savage Riggs asks, all of you did an amazing job bringing an incredibly entertaining ETU campaign to life, and now you're going to be exploring something else entirely. What are each of you looking forward to the most moving forward without giving any uh, away? Uh, I, like, I, I like character creation. So making new things is always fun. So diving into whatever it is. I, I think I'm interested. You know, ETU was our first experience um, creating characters after doing our very first campaign. And so now having two, it kind of takes some pressure off in a sense uh, of, of this, this next campaign in my mind and, and the character that I create. Uh, so I, I think I'm looking forward to that. Character creation is, is not my favorite. I find it incredibly stressful and frustrating <laughs> because I am a perfectionist, but, um, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it for this one just to kind of, I don't know, keep that those data points going, for lack of a better way to put it. <laughs> I, I, I'm just excited to do something new. Um, uh, Sawyer has been a uh, a fun character, but a difficult one. And and a lot of the difficulties come from like how similar the character is to me in some ways, but also like different in other. This is a super difficult thing to explain, but like some of the, the the similarities between me and Sawyer are like difficult to play, if that makes sense. And some of the differences are difficult to play, which is, sounds like everything, but. <laughs> sure, no, I, that makes sense. Yeah. What about what about for you, Gruff? Uh, I'm looking forward to, I don't think this gives anything away, but I'm looking forward to a campaign with a structure that's, that's that, I, that I'm used to, that I'm used to, I guess, a structure of like what happens between sessions, because sure. we've talked about this between the five of us before. I don't know if we've talked about it too much to you guys, but the structure of waiting months or weeks between each session for ETU is difficult. We found it difficult. There is um, going to be a chance to talk about that a bit more in depth later on. There's a couple questions that cool. address that, but you're, so, you're looking forward to a different format, essentially. Yes, basically, yes, that, basically this. All right, and uh, the question was posed to all of you, so I do not have to answer. Uh, Jay brings in our next question. Now that you're done with ETU, anyone care to reveal a backup character they had ready? And Dean, if you oh. were the fifth member of the study group, what kind of character would you like to have brought to the table? Uh, yeah. I do you have a backup character in I, I had one in mind. Um, it was actually this is kind of same thing from our original campaign i had two that i was kind of playing with uh the other one would have been like a goth kind of like uh dramatic overly dramatic kid or or kind of like a, a kid who's in trouble a lot um but i really wanted to go opposite of rosaline not that that was rosaline but i felt like it had more similar elements although it was, it's hard moving into modern, but yeah. So had Adelaide died, I would have probably gone that route. I, um, so the unalternate character I thought about, and I thought about when we started it was like a character who is a, um, uh, more of a local and kind of a, a I don't want to say good old boy. Cause I don't mean like the from money kind of thing, but but the idea is that like he he just liked cars and like doing um, mechanical kind of thing, and he was like there for an engineering degree for uh, just like making engines and stuff like that. And he just like going out with his like car and doing donuts out in the you know uh, 
a feel kind of thing. Woo! Yeah, yeah. Way, way more of like a <laughs> having a good old time Texas boy kind of thing. Definitely grew up with a lot of guys like that back in back in Houston. Same in Virginia, honestly. I imagine. <laughs> what about the the rest of you? Did you have backup characters in mind? Yeah, my, my alternate character was I, I so for undeclared I did a foreign exchange student. And I want to do another foreign exchange student for this one, but from Britain. I want to do like a British, like punk rock kind of guy, that was like into like hard rock and just had a had a bad attitude about things. And uh, I, I didn't flesh him out completely, but that was my other choice between that and Calvin. But I, I really enjoyed playing Calvin, so I'm kind of glad I went with Calvin. Uh, I did. Calvin sounds fun though. It does. It does. I I didn't have a backup character planned. Um, I mean, I, not Dominic that I signed the contract. He's the executive producer, so I'm <laughs> yeah. not allowed to kill any of his characters. Yeah. <laughs> true. If if only that were true, but no. Um, uh, yeah, I I mean, it wasn't like I was expecting Ron to make it, uh, but I, um, in fact, I kind of doubted he would. But um, I I just I don't I don't like. It's kind of like a. I, when I went to college and I was studying to be in, uh, in an actor and stuff, and I know exactly were like, what you're going to say. Yeah. I do they're, too. Like, they're like, don't take, don't, don't have a backup plan, become the actor. And uh, that, that was the worst advice anyone could ever give <laughs> personally. Oh. Uh, but um, uh, I, I do hold that true with, with my characters. I don't, I don't like making backup characters because if I never get to play that character, like I'll be pissed off. Uh, I only like to make characters that I feel I will get to play or see in action in some degree. So I don't, I don't like making characters that will never see action. Oh yeah. I wouldn't want to fully flesh out two characters and be like, but what about this one? Right. Yeah. <laughs> No, can I say something real quick about like just RPGs in general that I think is kind of cool? Yeah, as, as long as it's quick, like, we're almost 20 questions in. Okay, and I'll keep <laughs> it we'll be quick. But as, as opposed to just acting, in RPGs, you can play characters who don't necessarily look like you do, who are not exactly like you are, and there's a, like way, way more freedom as far as who you can play and like what you want to play. And I think that's amazing. I think that's like the best. Yeah. That is a cool aspect of the game. Um, if I were to be a fifth member of, of the study group, um, uh, honestly, I think the group could have used a Dennis. So I think that uh, a character like Dennis, who was just like, um, which we'll get to later, because uh, uh, there is a question about this, but I did stat out all of the uh, the roomies as uh, wild cards for a convention game that I ran that was literally the B Squad's adventure when the study group was uh, busy. And we'll talk more about that later on because someone has a question about that. But yeah, a Dennis style uh, support character would have been would have been good, I think. Um, next question from Evil Dice Monkey. Did any of you study for the pop quizzes that JCC gave before finals? No. No. <laughs> Can okay. you study for a pop quiz? I think that's the... I didn't know what he was going to do, but I did like do some very basic journalism study sort of stuff to like be prepared. Um, Meg, is Megan is, has currently stepped away, but I'm oh, gonna she's say, not there. I I'm going to say no, she did not. Uh, <laughs> she did not study for them. Um, often, I, I think part of that has to do with the fact that no one ever knew when or if I was going to do those, because often when we got to an episode that was a test episode, everyone would be like, that's today. That's this episode. Oh. Mm -hmm. Oh, we're already doing finals? Like, so um, I, I don't think there would have been any way for people to prepare for that. Evil Dice Monkey also asks, Jordans, did you have a plan for if Sawyer flunked out? Would he still have been in ETU, but as a townie? Or would you have tried to introduce a new character at that late stage? So I would like to get JP's thoughts on this because I definitely have uh, some ideas, but I'm curious to see what you think. I was worried about it, but actually like me and Rob talked about it a decently often amount of time. And it was like, okay, if he fail, like I'm gonna try not to fail, but if he fails, we'll find a way to like make it interesting. And I think in my mind, it would have made sense for Sawyer to like stay in and maybe even lie to his parents about having flunked out kind of thing. It's but funny. Like, 
yeah, that's exactly what uh, my plan was, that you would become a, a townie in ETU and you would lie to your parents and they would still be sending you money to go to school, which you would just be using to finance your investigative efforts into uh, what was going on in Pine Box. That was my plan. That's exactly what I thought would happen. It's so funny because, and, and, and here's the thing. I mean, obviously we had some like donations from the, the crown to like help things out, but like it was very real possibility that I could have failed. And I oh, yeah. kept failing, like it just kept happening. Yep. I got a critical failure on those points. So like we we, we very seriously kind of like, I, I, ver I very seriously thought about this as a possibility for Sawyer in the future. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Evil Dice Monkey also has an another question. And uh, for this one, there's a timestamp included. Uh, so this would be uh, the season three premiere, which was ETU declared at one hour, 59 minutes and 18 seconds. JCC quote it, quote, ask us about our ghost story in Tombstone sometime. Oh and my God. Is now a good time to ask about that story? <laughs> Evil Dice Monkey wants to know. Wow. Uh, can, anyone, <laughs> can anyone give us a, a succinct uh, summary of what happened uh, on our ghost uh, okay. expedition. Okay. okay. So everyone was telling us <laughs> everyone was telling us to do this ghost. We, we wanted to do something ghosty in Tombstone because why not? And so everyone was telling us to go to, what, what was it? The, the Birdcage? The Birdcage. Bird the Birdcage Bird Theater. Uh, it, it's an original building back from the original uh, days of Tombstone uh, back Tombstone. to Wider. Like, like the originality of it was like it was cool. Yeah. Very cool. So, um, so we're like, okay, cool. So we come back later that night, and uh, uh, we are immediately met with the people who go to ghost tours in Tombstone, and and we're like, okay, all right, cool, 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 cool. And uh, we go through, and the 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 our host was was awesome. She was very cool, very knowledgeable. We we toured around. Um, and it was a you much know, more historical tour than a ghost yeah. focused tour. Yeah, I mean they have like a, the apparently the owner of the birdcage is also like a uh, amateur like antiquarian, and so they've picked up a lot of things that there were rooms that were just like packed with shit he had found. Well, the main yeah, the I'm main cool stuff. Yeah, was... the main theater room was basically a museum of old stuff, and uh, there was it. It wasn't like set up or anything like the theater used to be or anything like that. Anyway, it was it was still pretty cool. So we went around. We went around, and and <laughs> I I immediately had to pee, and they <laughs> locked the God. door. They locked the door, and I was like, Sh I shit. Okay, okay. So we go through and I'm like, I can make it, I can make it in a, a 45 minute tour of this place. I, I'll be good. I'll be good. And so we go all the way around. We go all the way. We go downstairs and every moment there's just a, like, you might see a ghost here. And everyone looks and looks through the oh. door and stuff like Picking that. It's like, no, you know. yeah, there's nothing. There's nothing here. Uh, and then, she, and then we walk back up to the stage and she says, okay, now we're going to do, uh, if everyone's comfortable with it, we're going to turn off all of the lights and then we're going to talk to the ghost. And I'm like, no. <laughs> and, uh, so I'm about to explode and, uh, they have seats all set up around the stage and we all sit down and she turns off the lights and, and then it proceeds, black. It, it is, it is absolutely pitch black. And she proceeds to go and ask if there are any ghosts there. And apparently there's like four or five different ghosts that, that hang out and do things every once in a while around here. So she's asking, hey, Tommy, do you want to come out and play right now? Nothing. Okay. Hey, I Black Bart. Yeah, I, you know, what, what happened? What happened with you today? And you can't ask the ghosts, like, how did you die or anything like that? Because they don't like that. So so we're all just sitting there waiting and waiting and waiting. And then it gets to a point where she's like, okay, now we're just going to go on radio silence. Everyone be quiet and just wait for something. Well, it was be quiet and wait for something. Or if you want to ask a question of the spirits, you can also, you can also call. Yes, you can, you can. Yeah, you can ask you. Yeah, you can ask them now. And so, so There's we get to there. We're what? on like a, a, a honeymoon, I think. Yes. Yeah. So there was a couple that were sitting next to me and they were a young couple who uh, uh, were apparently just had been married and this was their honeymoon. 
and uh, the <laughs> the guy immediately when it becomes time to ask questions, he's immediately asking, "Did you all hear that?" And yeah. everyone's like. So, so a sound would happen in the dark and it was clear, it's 15 people in creaky ass chairs. So it was mm -hmm. clearly <laughs> someone moved in their chair and it creaked and he would go, did everybody hear that? And, and someone <laughs> no. would go, yeah, I think that was my chair. I moved and he would go, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Oh, and she said, she said that sometimes the ghosts will like make your, your hand or finger hotter or something like that. No, like you'll, or colder. She did oh, he did. He, he went, did. he just went. Is anybody yeah. one of my hands is really hot? Is anyone right. else in that? Yeah, 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 yeah. One hand is hot. <laughs> you know, yeah. the, the best part was that his his fiance or his his wife what the whole time being like the ghost just like you, the ghost like you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ghosts, <laughs> ghosts are, are into you. That's I, that's what's happening here. I want to add some context to this too because um, being someone who grew up in the new age world the way these people were acting is is very accepted mm. um but i think the point is that the the tour itself and the tour guide was very like it was kind of like okay we're all here we're all agreeing with this and then these guys were still kind of extreme from that point so i think it's easy to look at something like this and be like oh it was ridiculous anyway but it actually they framed it in a way where it, it, to me really wasn't that ridiculous but thought, we had a bunch of people who kind of like were trying to emulate it to such an extreme that it was the, like yeah the the tour was great the tour yeah. and how they set that up was awesome it was these two particular people who it was just all like, about them it was yeah their it was tour. yeah yeah. It was. I'll, I'll be a hundred years sitting there in the dark. I was like, "When does this end?" <laughs> oh, you were. Oh, yeah. I. Yeah, was, I, mean, you were awesome. I was so uncomfortable, and then every time I was all like, "Okay, okay, okay. I think we're almost done. I think we're almost done." The guy would go like, "Wait, did you see mad? that light?" You, but it kept yeah. being like, <laughs> "My EMP reader." like went off and it's like well everybody turned their phones back on so like that yeah. Makes yeah i don't know i don't know yeah don't that know. was his response to everything was i don't know so that was know. our our ghost story in tombstone in a in yeah. a nutshell uh one guy who just was determined that all the ghost stuff was happening to him and him alone mm -hmm. Uh, Savage Riggs on, with the next question asks now that your time with etu is over looking back what is your fondest memory Hmm. Fondest memory from ETU? I, um, I, hmm. I liked a lot of it. I I thought it I, I, for me it was it was it was fun to do just like the the fake college experience thing over again, you know, and and, and even just like playing out going to parties and like going uh I say overextended, but I don't mean it that way. It's not like but like just getting drunk and hanging out with people and, and like being a kid and figuring out like what are the right choices and what aren't, I, it, was, it was fun to like kind of deal with that in ETU for me. Um, yeah, I, I think as a role player, um, it's for me easy to kind of, you know, want to play a character. I don't always feel like I get to be in per as a person in the sense of like i said something cool or i was able to talk my way through something like things that i get anxiety about in my day-to-day -day life um but specifically i wanted to create a character that struggled with that stuff um because i think it's easy to not highlight those kinds and to also not play those kinds and there's something that can be really gratifying about kind of being bumbling or or not winning um so i enjoyed that aspect of adelaide while it was difficult because you know you always want to be like but i'm smart um and not that she wasn't i just played with a different aspect for that she just stepped into stuff put her foot in her mouth all the time and it was fun and challenging at the same time but i i that that is really something just kind of the heart of adelaide that i that i enjoyed it was difficult but i enjoyed it and that's why i enjoyed it i think yeah um, animals uh, but, uh, I got a fond memory. Um, my fondest memory was uh, when any time that we, uh, as characters, spent time not doing the creepy stuff, but the college-y stuff, 
because that was me sort of living my college life with friends I wish I had in college. <laughs> because I went to community college, I didn't really get the college experience. So this sort of was my college experience just put into one uh, year and a half uh, segment of my life. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, it, uh, honestly, like I, I, will, I would have loved to go to college with uh, the four of you. That would have been wonderful. We would have had so much fun, I thought. And this sort of gave me a slice of that, if I, if I could uh, imagine what it would be like. That's, that would be this. Yeah, uh, I, um, I mean, I think, I think it was, it was really fun to um, sort of inhabit these characters who were so different from our Deadlands characters and kind of have that um, um, exercise basically every week to to inhabit someone who would do something I wouldn't do you know um, and that that was really that was really um, exciting for me so yeah I mean cop out answer I guess but I liked the whole thing I liked I liked doing it all <laughs> all right all of it. you can't say no to him all of it was the answer. Um, Enter the Rectangle wants to know, when Ron is president, will he abolish time zones so we can watch wild cards from overseas without getting up so early? Yeah. For sure. Is that, is that how that works? Yeah. yeah. You, well, if you I just mean, say it. If, if that's the platform you run on, then yes. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. As your advisor, I don't know if I'd Ron. throw no time zone. Time zones, time blame. Okay, that doesn't make any sense. He's not going to be an advisor. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have the same time zone in the Pacific United States as in England. That well, way... Well, just those yeah. two things. No, yeah. that's... That's it. You don't oh, have to you get doing? up early <laughs> oh, at all. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> it's great. It's perfect. That's how this one works. Cut the feed. Cut the feed. Enter the Rectangle <laughs> also asks, to the Dean, Megan, and anyone else this may apply to, Within your comfort zone, can you talk about some of the pros and cons of GMing for your significant other? I've done it a few times with varying results. How many significant others have you done it for? <laughs> um, no, sorry, no follow-up questions to the Google. <laughs> that was the question. That was the, that was the question. No, I don't. Not JCC. No. Um, we, we actually, um, uh, Gaurav, Megan, and I used to record a podcast called Experience Pointers, and Megan and I did one episode on this actual topic. So if you want to hear us mm -hmm. talk a bit more at length about that, uh, do uh, check out the Experience Pointers uh, wherever fine podcasts are archived. It's still on um, Yep. If it's still out there. And yep. um, we can give you some more uh, info on that. It is a, a very interesting subject and one that uh, we could probably pontificate on for, for quite some time. But uh, if anyone would like to offer up some feedback on that, if you have been in that situation or have any um, uh, experience with it, um, please do. Well, I will say that it um, it really differs from person to person, and I imagine uh, relationship to relationship, depending upon the just the things you struggle with anyway. And and yeah, like Jordan said, we talk about that in that episode. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. I feel like Jordan has a harder time playing at my games <laughs> than GMing me per se. Um, but that's because he's got the GM mind in the sense that, well. Not only that, there's the dynamic of just GMing for your significant other, and there's the dynamic of GMing for your significant other at a table with other people who are not your significant other. There are multiple things to keep in mind, and um, that's where it can get, I think, complicated because, like, for Jordan's, which is something he said before, um, he te he doesn't want it to ever look like he's playing favorites with me, so he tends to be shittier to me at times. <laughs> um, that, is, which... that is something I struggle with. Yeah, I I, I will I will often uh, go so far as to like sometimes throw Megan under the bus just so I can be like I'm not she's my wife, but like not like that. Yeah. Um, but I will say that uh, if you are playing a game with your significant other, especially if one of you is in the role of a GM, uh, issues from your relationship will come up in the game. Uh, they will be present. Mm -hmm. um, you cannot escape that. And uh, the most important thing is to maintain communication between the two of you and uh, talk about things like that privately uh, when they do come up at the table and um, have uh, just, just have an understanding that both of you are there to play a game uh, and uh, don't, don't intentionally be jerks to one another and keep open lines of communication. 
and that is the best way to navigate it. But I mean, your mileage is going to vary based on, like Megan said, the individual chemistry of, of the people involved in that relationship. Yeah, yeah, there, there were definitely times where um, uh, I would have a character that would respond a particular way and he would interpret as me responding passive aggressively or something like that or vice versa. Because um, of some situation that we had gotten into privately before or yeah. something like that. So, and it's, it's, it's very strange, so yeah. Um, but just know, yeah, it, it's not it's not necessarily a cakewalk, but it, it can be done if you if you want to do it. You, you have done that too, Grav, haven't you? GM'd for a significant significant other. Yes. Uh, so I, I've actually I'm actually in the middle of a campaign, uh, a D and D five E campaign that I started running when the came when the pandemic started uh, for my uh, current girlfriend and her uh, her friends. So people that I hadn't really played with before. Um, and one of the really cool things, like I totally agree with everything Megan Jordan said, it can be it can be tough to navigate, but once you get going, and I'm sure you guys can agree to this too, is that there are some really cool benefits of living with someone that you play this game with, because as a GM, you can get almost immediate feedback of like, what did you think of that moment in yeah. that game? That's like specific true. things that you wanted to. And then also at the same time, like your significant other can like hype you up for your game and be like, I'm really excited. Like that was so cool last week. Let's, I'm really excited. And my friends are telling me they're also very excited. So uh, I'm, I just want to play more with you. And that's, that's really nice to hear as well. So. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. there's, there's some definite pros for it as well. I mean, it's, it's, it's also like, it's a hobby that if you both enjoy it, you can share that together, um, mm -hmm. which is uh, a really nice thing. I, I feel like um, that's not always easy to find. Um, but yeah. Any other thoughts on that? Anybody? That's a very truncated answer, but yeah, I it is. <laughs> talk at length about this, and we have other things that we have to answer. So, um, um, JP burned into ash. Yeah, he does. Well, he's, he's still there. He's dead. I'm sure he'll be fine. Okay. Um, Enter the rectangle also asks to the dean during Deadlands, you wrote most of your adventures. What influenced the decision to use a plot point campaign for ETU? Um, a couple of things. I had uh, never uh, used a, uh, a pinnacle plot point campaign before, and I really wanted to try it out because I really like the um, uh, the kind of uh, uh, intent behind it and the way it worked, and it seemed like something that would be interesting. Um, and also, prior to uh, the Deadlands season or the Deadlands campaign on Wild Cards. I did not, I didn't write campaign stuff. I, I had very little experience writing my own games. I had almost exclusively run uh, pre-written adventure modules or uh, adventure content and kind of tweaked it to make it my own, um, which I still did a fair amount of in uh, the Deadlands game. But that's that was like my first time really getting um, a feel for what it's like to create your own sessions. So when it came time to do ETU, I was like, oh, well, this will be easy. This will just be a return to you know the way that I'm used to running things, um, and it actually ended up bringing some some interesting challenges to the front, which we might have a chance to uh, address later on. But um, it was mostly because um, I really liked ETU. I thought Degrees of Horror was a really interesting campaign. I wanted to try a plot point campaign, and I wanted to share as much as we could um, the 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 full authentic experience of living through the Degrees of Horror campaign. I wanted to uh, share that with those of you who have not gotten to play it or read it, um, because I, I think it's I think it's really interesting. So um, wait, 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 clarification though, in, in Deadlands, you did like at least two adventures that were like pre-written things, right? But I, I, I didn't do, I don't think I did any adventures that were like completely pre-written, but I yeah. would pull elements from uh, the various different plot point books or other Savage Tales and kind of rework them. Well, I feel like Night Train was at least the oh, most- Except for Night Train, yes, yes. Yeah. Which we have a question about later on. We can talk more about that too. Um, Fetlock Gaming asks, what happens with Bug Boy? Does the study <laughs> group ever talk to him again? Do they visit him when he gets out of prison? Um. Sawyer visited him before he got out of prison. Like Saw Sawyer went back and visited him a couple times after we saw him the last time in the uh, in the story. I don't think Adelaide would. No, no. I don't think it's funny because, at least from my perspective, the connection that it feels like it looks like our characters had with bug boy is not the one i feel with bug boy so to adelaide he's just a person that we encountered like anyone else's 
Um, yeah, so I just don't, I don't think she would, but that's, that was just my perspective. Yeah, I, I yeah, feel like, right. I feel like he, Bug Boy could have been, if we had more time, if there was like another year of school or something, he could have been a character that somehow came back and redeemed himself fully. Like that's, th this seemed like the start of some sort of redemption for him a little bit, but we just didn't have the time to like f fill that out basically. But it's it's possible he could have He maybe. could have been an anime villain that, uh, yes. <laughs> that by the next season was uh, just one of the gang. Exactly. exactly. I have a question. That episode where the guy had the carapace and stuff, did mm -hmm. you expect us to go back to Bug Boy? What's up? Did you expect us to go back to Bug Boy, that episode? Yeah. That episode was a savage tale um, okay. from uh, from Degrees of Horror and uh, talking to Bug Boy was a uh, a major way to figure out uh, some stuff that was, was happening in it, but not the only way. Um, sure. I did expect you guys to go back to Bug Boy, yes. Makes sense. Uh, Ron, did you ever spare a thought for um, Johnny Chafe? I mean, Dom didn't, but I <laughs> feel like Ron Ron probably would have gone to visit him. Just really, yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, I think I think in the last conversations that they had and stuff, Bug Boy was attempting to be rehabilitated, um, and uh, I think that Ron might, might have tried to push that a little bit because he wants he wants people to be better. Sure. All right. Enter the Rectangle asks, in the Three-Eyed Jack episode, was the plan always to have Calvin pick up the curse? Or were there plans in place if one of the other study group members picked up the curse bracelet first? Garav did an amazing job. It seemed like it was planned. Oh. Um, as as Garav uh, already mentioned earlier, and yes, he did do an amazing job, but no, uh, that was going to happen to whichever one of them first picked up that bracelet. I had the, the note card written out and it was going to go to whoever. Um, and that was as far, I think, as I had planned in that episode. Okay. So we, they pick it up and pirate mayhem ensues and we see how they decide to solve it. Who was your guess as to who would pick it up? I don't know that I really had one. I mean, I, mm -hmm. I, I didn't, I didn't think, um, I mean, thinking, thinking back on it, 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 it seemed least likely to be Ron. Because the thing that would have to happen is like, you dig up this buried treasure, you see there's just like a skull and a bracelet in there and someone goes like, I'm gonna touch that bracelet. And that just didn't seem like a Ron uh, move at that point. So I figured it would be either uh, Sawyer or Calvin because Adelaide was not present for that episode. Um, but had she been, I still don't think it would have been Adelaide. I still think it would have been uh, Calvin yeah. or Sawyer. Um, but yeah, yeah, that was not planned. That was all Garof. Not planned, yeah. I, I will say that is, um, something sort of a testament towards JCC's trust in us as players in that he didn't pre-choose somebody. He just trusted that we could, any one of us could take this character and just run with it and do whatever we wanted and it would still be okay and fine to be televised even. That's, funny. that's was just saying. That's a, that's a point for each of you uh, because yeah, I, I would be, yeah. I would, I would trust any of you to uh, be the, the central part of something like that and just make it your own, which you do. Yeah. I would have been a problem. <laughs> well, I mean, it's not like Garab wasn't. Uh, <laughs> Maid wants to know, what the hell happened to or with Olivia? Who was she? How come? This mystery is killing me. <laughs> Who is Olivia? This whole campaign? Spill the beans, JCC. Wait, what'd you say, Dom? Who is Olivia? <laughs> is, he ask, is, he, is he being serious? No, he's you? not. He's know. got that jokey oh. face on. Look at that jokey face. Olivia is kind of, in a way, a, uh, a backdoor Patreon NPC. And I say a backdoor Patreon NPC because it is an NPC that, um, that Clint Black created and started talking about in our emails back and forth when he was helping me. Uh, and I, when I say helping, when he was primarily coming up with the, uh, the very specific edges for each one of the study group, <laughs> talking about you know, this, this um, idea for, for a different character that, that he had, he thought might be fun and like a chance to like come back to the well later on. And Clint was so very helpful and so generous with his time and with giving us uh, resources for the game. I was like, I, I see some opportunities to play with Olivia. Um, the, the primary idea, and this differs somewhat from what Clint um, presented, but that's the way the Patreon NPCs tend to work. You guys tell me, uh, an idea for a character and I go, okay, I'm gonna use some of that. 
<laughs> um, Clint, uh, the, the basic idea with Olivia was she was an alternate universe member of the study group. Um, she was the study group's fifth member in a different uh, reality that was very close to uh, the study group's reality, but not the same. And on one occasion, which was the episode she featured in, um, she just, their, their paths, their reality just sort of accidentally bled over. Um, and that was that primary thing. At the very end of the campaign, the idea was that her study group had failed to stop the convergence. And as a last ditch effort, she as the only survivor um, found a way to tear through back to the study group's reality and try and do what she could to prevent this version of Calvin from suffering the same fate that her version of Calvin suffered. And that was basically the idea of what happened with Olivia. After that, that was unfortunately the last amount of energy that she was able to commit into things and she perished along with the rest of her reality. No! So that, I know, I know, but that's what was happening with Olivia. Uh, Ozark Haller asks, for the study group, what are the moments that challenged you as a player and do you look forward to these kinds of moments and challenges? There were a lot. Yeah, that's that feels like a loaded question to be entirely honest. Um my my answer to that is is a little vague, which is that I wanted Sawyer to be not necessarily the most likable character and that sounds like not great, but like um but I I, I thought back to myself in, in college and I was like I I feel like I've I've grown from there and I feel like I still would want my character in college to be someone who has not figured out everything I figured out, if that makes sense. And there were points where I made decisions that were as Sawyer that were like less likable, less like good, less thought out than thoughts that I think I would have as a character dealing with that stuff. And it, it could be difficult sometimes because you would also like see that reflected in people who are watching the show and people would sometimes be like, oh, this character's annoying or I hate this about this. And it, it, it honestly could be difficult to like not play a character that is necessarily built to be liked all the time. Does that make sense? Yep. yep. Sure. Yeah. And, and my answer is actually pretty close to that in that so Calvin is also one of those characters that does things and says things that the group doesn't actually agree with. Their characters don't agree with it, but at the table, the players are trusting each other to be like, yeah, you that's a funny thing that your character would do. We get it, we're gonna play into it, but we're going to act like we're very angry. And sometimes our role playing goes a little too far in that when I'm like, wait, are you guys actually mad at me <laughs> for what I'm saying? Cause like what I'm saying makes sense to me, I think, and a prime example of this is when um, we went out on that lake to, to uh, look for sunken treasure for Glenn, with Glenn Mack and an alligator attacked. And I'm like, we're not going back in that water. This is bullshit. And everybody's like, no, we got to go back. And I'm like, guys, no, let's, let's play this real because why would we go back in that water? This is ridiculous. And then they were like, no, Calvin, you're being stupid. You can go back to the car. And I'm like, well, I can't do that because then I'm out of the episode. So, uh, okay. <laughs> uh yeah, I agree with all of that in that I also think this kind of comes back to the modern aspect of this campaign. And it's not that like, say, for example, in Deadlands, we didn't try to play grounded characters, but it's really different when you're dealing with Deadlands. It's so much more removed. Oh, ETU is so much closer. Yeah. And, and I think personally, <laughs> it taught and maybe we'll continue to teach this group of players a lot of things that I feel like we kind of are having to learn the hard way. Um, <laughs> much like what both Jordan and Garab just said, um, because they were playing characters like that, I think, and because we all want to dive in so hard to the RP, I think we misunderstood each other a lot. Um, and I think it caused confusion on the player side. So uh, like it, interpersonally, it was like, wait, it's sort of like what Grau was saying, wait, are you actually mad at me? Or is this a character thing? We'll have a chance to delve into that issue a little bit more later on. Sure. Um, so yeah, I, I found the aspect of trying to navigate all of that and navigate the interactions way harder in this campaign uh, 
in general. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then also trying to think, sort of like what we were talking about earlier, you know, in like a fantasy campaign or even Deadlands, it's like, shoot the bad guys. You can't really do that in ETU in quite the same way. There's modern rules, and modern rules are complicated and gray and confusing, and oh, it's hard. <laughs> yeah, it, I, I, I agree with, with all of that. It's... it's um... It's it's hard it's hard to kind of separate yourself, especially when you're playing uh, in a modern world and you want to have some sensibility. We're v we're very committed to playing these as real as possible. And Deadlands, for for a lot of reasons, um, uh, is somewhat super heroic, and uh, yeah. you mm -hmm. don't have to. There there's you're you're divorced enough from that world that you can impact it in ways it's it's very cinematic and stuff like that whereas etu could absolutely be done that way but we decided to take it a fairly realistic uh, in a fairly realistic fashion i know it's silly to say that as someone who played probably the most obscene character <laughs> in it but but I tried to play the truth of Ron, and um, and everyone tried to play the truth of their character, and and that that can be really fun, and it's always exciting at our table when I'm playing with these four, and getting what they are giving me, and uh, but it can it is difficult, especially with the moral decisions and stuff that ETU pr presents, to make choices based on your character. And have it be a separation of what you would do as a person and stuff like that, and and it, it's hard because you get into the meta, and yeah, if you get if you start thinking about the meta and you start playing kind of min maxed versions of what you want to do and stuff, then yeah, you can have a lot of fun with it. But also, I felt it kind of it broke that um, that hazy line of realism that we were sort of playing against. To be to be fair. I honestly kind of think that we never went too deep as far as like metagaming our, our group as far as a like combat group or anything like that. I think we never optimize things. I, I, I think that's a good thing, personally. Like I thought it was interesting. Oh, I, I never optimize anything with a character because um, this, this is a like great it. this is a great line of conversation. But we are almost a quarter of the way through these, so we <laughs> oh are boy. going to have to pick oh up the pace a little bit. Again, there are some repeats. We'll be able to skip some, but we we should keep moving. Does anyone else have anything they want to throw in on that last point? All right. Ozark Howler also asks, oh, and real quick, I should also notate, um, all of the Alumni Association working together have unlocked the rest <gasps> of our epilogues for this evening. So thank you all very much. We, we will also be seeing Ron's epilogue and uh, my final epilogue as well, which I think you'll enjoy. So thank you for that, guys. Uh, we're going to answer a couple more questions, then we'll jump into Addie's epilogue. Um, Ozark Howler also asks, for the Dean, is there something from the ETU setting or degrees of horror, a character, adversary, side story, et cetera, that you wanted to work in your campaign but just couldn't or wish you had more time to explore? Um, yes, plenty. Uh, like I talked about earlier, doing some more stuff with Cutter. There were several, several one sheets for ETU and Savage Tales in the back of degrees of horror that I really wanted to run and just could never figure out the right time to do it or I'd forget about them until it was too late in the story for them to really feel impactful anymore. Um, so I, there's so, there's so much meat in, in, in that book. It's, it would be almost impossible to, uh, to use all of it. Um, and I was stressing myself out trying to, so I kind of just backed away a little bit from trying to work so hard as the campaign went on to incorporate every element of ETU and just try and focus on the things that made the most sense for the game we were playing. Um, but there's a lot, uh, Ozark Howler asks favorite moment from the entire campaign. Uh, did we already answer this question? I think we covered. I, I thought that we yeah, did cover this. I think we did. We kind of talked about that. I don't think I talked mm. about mine though, uh, and I have several. But but one that stands out um, happened in the first season, which was the um, the house party that you all attended that the cops raided, um, and uh, Sawyer and Adelaide got uh, got. Uh, essentially in yeah. trouble with the police for underage drinking. And the reason I really liked that scene is because it immediately put me back in my own college experience. Um, I, I, mm -hmm. I, I remember being at a party at someone's apartment and everyone was like, hey, the cops are outside in the parking lot. No one can leave. 
And like we, I just, remember that. <laughs> everyone like shut the curtains, and we all just sort of sat. Like I hadn't, I, I didn't drink really in college, so I was just sitting there. I was like, well, I can't leave because I don't want to get my friends in trouble. So it's just a bunch of like college students who were various degrees of drunk, just sitting in a room trying to be quiet and still <laughs> while the cops were out in the parking lot. And that just took me right back to that. A freshman year. <laughs> yeah. At Brent's. Yep. So with Stacy, uh, where we went to the house she was in, right? And we went and like we, we we found all the bodies that were in her like stash and mm -hmm. like Sawyer because he had the curiosity thing going on like pulled one of them back and just saw like a rotted maggot covered body kind of there and I really liked that moment I thought that like wasn't a really interesting moment for ETU where it, like diverged from just being a college experience and I like that sure anyone else are we uh, good from earlier. Yeah, I, yeah, I like a, yeah. SF Giants 49er says to JCC, I'm amazed how you not all loose ends together after four seasons, or <laughs> did you plan this one and a half years ahead? But I don't expect <laughs> you to tell us. I just admire your talent. Well, thank you very much. It's very kind of you. Um, I, again, can't take um, full credit for this because the uh, all the n loose ends being knotted together, many of those are done by the plot point campaign itself. Um, the only loose ends that I tied up were the ones that were specific to our game and our table. Um, so uh, again, you'll, you'll have to direct that compliment towards uh, Ed Wetterman and Preston DuBose, uh, the writers of ETU. And um, before this next question, I think it's time for us to jump in to Adelaide's epilogue. Yay! So Megan, are you ready to inhabit Adelaide one last time? Wait. Once she once she focuses up. Once she focuses. Now I'm go. focused. There we go. <laughs> um, this scene takes place almost immediately after the events of the finale, as Adelaide and the rest of you stand in the football stadium as everyone uh, is streaming out after graduation to go celebrate with their friends and family and party, and each of you are caught up in in your own individual. Um, moments and family units adelaide you have a moment where you break away from the rest of the group and stand on the field and just survey the very mundane very normal looking place where just minutes ago you stood in another realm and witnessed a demonic horror and so many horrible things and as you're taking in the stadium and all of this you see a single figure on the opposite side of the stadium, sitting up very far away in the stands. It's, it's difficult to make out uh, this young lady's features and see exactly who she might be from this distance, but you can see that she's looking at you. And as you watch, you see her press her fingers to her mouth and just blow seemingly you specifically a, a distant kiss. And as you stand there watching, she fades from view. And as you're looking at the spot where she was, you feel someone come and stand right next to you and turn to see Sonia Alvarez also staring up at that same spot in the stadium. Blackwood, uh, Adelaide. Sonia? That there is now a very large organization, a very large, a very powerful, well-connected and wealthy organization with a leadership vacuum at the top. And it seems they're accustomed to taking orders from a very intelligent and occult-minded, headstrong woman. And she looks at you pointedly. Okay, it, thank you? You're giving me a compliment? What? What? No, oh, are you serious? No, I, I was saying, I think I should run the Sweetheart Foundation. <laughs> oh, um, okay, sure, yeah, I guess so. She kind of nods and, and she takes a moment and she looks back up at the stands. And then without making eye contact with you, she says, of course, it is a rather large job and I could probably use an assistant 
with a quick mind, skilled in the occult. Yeah, you probably could, but I don't know. You might need to be a little bit nicer to your assistants if you want to keep one around and like have one that actually wants to work with you. Is that an indication of interest, Adelaide? I mean, maybe. Well, maybe I could learn to be a little more personable. Maybe I would be a little more interested then. Well, maybe then the two of us should just think on this for a moment. Okay. And as you both stare up at the empty stands <laughs> where just moments ago a solitary, sad and lonely figure sent her last gesture of love, Sonia just tentatively reaches up and places a hand on your shoulder. I think that Adelaide kind of like, you know, the, it's nice. It's nice to have this connection, but then she begins to get awkward because it's still happening. She doesn't really know what to do. So she just kind of. Fair enough. We'll, we'll build up to this. <laughs> yeah. And this has been an epilogue for Adelaide Blackwood. I like it. Hey. Thank you very much for unlocking that, alumni. We have more <laughs> epilogues to get to as we go. This question comes from SF Giants 49er to Garav. The device that Wheeler has on his arm, is that a Fallout Pip Boy? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, it, it is. Wow. It's a Fallout Pip Boy. Good eye, SF Giants 49er. Oh, yeah, well done. Uh, BSB Care 1 asks First, congratulations on surviving, I mean, graduating. Second, what is the most emotionally satisfying moment of your four years at ETU or the most emotionally devastating? Oh. And if you feel oh, you boy. already addressed that with an answer that you gave previously, that's fine. But if you have anything new or different that comes to mind, um, sure. Um, I, I will say um, there were a few moments that were fairly emotionally devastating to me in various different ways. Um, I think I've talked about this before. JCC has this tendency to create these characters, whether they are good or bad or intended to be um, kind of like uh, disposable or not. He creates these characters I just feel bad for. And I'm like, well, now I feel bad for needing to like shoot this guy or, or turn him into the police or whatever. So there are definitely lots of moments of that. Um, and uh, I, I, the, um, ugh. Ariel and the other one, I forget his name. Matt. Matt, that was tough um, because I really wanted to be able to save everybody. And I knew there, it wasn't gonna work and it felt like it was because we had failed somehow. That was hard. It was hard um, with Lauren, just, I don't know. I, I, that, that, it's just hard. It's hard because it, it like touches on a, you know, a real thing. You're like, oh no, this, this, fake person is dying uh and the god those damn bugs those bugs were just this <laughs> really upsetting those roaches um yeah and then uh uh what was the other part of the question it was rewarding emotionally rewarding uh satisfying or devastating yes um the very last episode was very rewarding because i felt like and even though most of it was luck of our goddamn dice oh it felt god. like we Finally, like, we're like, yeah, we finally kicked ass. We went through all this bullshit where we s half sucked half the time. And now we're killing all these demons. Fuck you, demons. Um, it just felt like the culmination of like that, like, ah, finally that release of all this work we've done. <laughs> Can we just address how fucking amazing it was that we like never rolled any crit fail? Oh my God. That was insane, yeah. <laughs> that last whole episode, yeah. I mean, you guys definitely <laughs> saved up for it. Right? True. Uh, anyone else? Um, I, I would say the, um, the divorce of Ron's parents and then the subsequent uh, reveal of <laughs> them not being his parents at all was, was uh, surprising. <laughs> and, uh, but also uh, that, that was really cool. 
it was really really uh, i suppose rewarding in in many ways because we've been uh, dealing with the parents uh and i mean you know i took the overprotective parents uh hindrance so it's like i knew what i was getting into but but that way of paying off that hindrance was was brilliant that was all jcc but yeah i thought i thought it was um i thought it was that was a good end to that arc of of uh the character i really liked the or well it, it was tough to deal with the the episode with at the end of the first season with breaking up with Laura Lee because it 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 almost a little too closely uh mirrored some of my other co like my my real life college relationships which was like but it was fun it was fun to play it was difficult but it was fun um i'll say that the emotional journey that not many of you probably know this because not many people came to our uh, our LARP that we did at um, Genghis Khan this year. Um, but so it, it involved Barrett in a, in a, in a very, it, the majority of it was Barrett actually. So JCC playing Barrett and Calvin, me having this like, me and him interacting in a real space together. And we had been through almost three years of school at that point. And we sort of care about him at that point. Like when he came in as a hindrance for my character at the start, we all like immediately hated him. And didn't think we were gonna get along at all but over time the emotional journey of like being with this person and now he's going through a lot of stuff and we are the only ones who can help him and we are happy to and we are concerned about his well-being we had some moments of banter that i don't think many people heard because it was just me and and uh, sawyer or not sawyer me and uh, barrett just talking in the corner about like no you're gonna be fine you don't need to do that man you're gonna be cool it's gonna be fine but no one heard it but just me and him it was just really fun role playing this emotional connection that me and him have as a roommate i thought anyways that was fun. Yeah. Um, BSB Care asks, kind of along those lines, so hypothetically, the Dean runs a one-shot of the B-Squad, Dennis, Barrett, Laura Lee, and Marco. Who plays which character, and what is their one special edge? And I actually have the answers for this, because like I said, I did build these characters out for a convention, but I am curious. Lightning round. Who plays what, and what is their one special edge? Wait, which of us play which characters? Yeah, Dennis, Barrett, Laura Lee, Marco. I mean, the obvious is that we play our own roommates, but I yeah. think it's the least fun, right? Uh, well, it, then in that case, uh, that would mean uh, Sawyer would have to play Mark. Uh, JP would have to play Marco. Yeah. But I can just play <laughs> Sawyer. <laughs> <laughs> or a better version of Sawyer. Or you play Laura Lee and I play Marco. That's true. That could totally work. Which at that point, I'm just doing a Sawyer impression. I would um, love to see that. <laughs> their signature edge? For each one of your roommates, what would you guess? Um, Dom for Dennis. Lorely, uh, uh, gaslighter. That's not an edge. I'm in bond. <laughs> I, I think you said custom edge. No, no, <laughs> no. signature edge. Signature edge. I mean, uh, bond out there for uh, for Marco. I think what? Common bond. Uh, common bond. Okay. I think Dennis would probably have a uh, a uh a social edge or 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 something similar to common bond or maybe elon or, or be a zebra or luck. <laughs> be a zebra yo yeah. i'll be honest if i was like picking a character to play i would probably play barrett even though sawyer hated barrett <laughs> oh i would love to see that too <laughs> i um, think laura lee would have mean mean as a hindrance mean. yeah that's not an edge oh, you but, said okay. edge oh i can't get back <laughs> sorry uh Gruff? I, I honestly don't know, because edges are more mostly combat based. I guess they're not an ETU. No, hmm. no or in Swade. Yeah, I can, yeah. I can tell you what they all were for my game. I would love to hear that. Uh, so my game all involved the B-Squad being called up by Glenn Mack to investigate uh, an extraterrestrial, uh, well, no, to investigate a, a, a thing, something that was being sold as a love potion around campus that ended up being related to a meteor that had fallen from the stars and was uh, really messing with people's pheromones. Um, so Dennis was a complete support-based character. Uh, yeah. He was a, uh, I can't remember the name of the edge, but he had free rerolls on support roles. He was just yes. everybody's cheerleader. Barrett 
was all taunt and um, uh, humiliate and also had the edge, again, I can't remember the name, where if he got a raise on his taunt roll, everyone would attack him instead of anyone else. Um, Laura Lee was uh, in tim full intimidation um, and was just uh, strong-willed and had um, the menacing edge, I believe, as well. <laughs> and then Marco was a, uh, a Tai Chi enthusiast uh, who actually was the, um, the fighting, the only uh, capable fighter in the group because of his exceptional Tai Chi skills. And I would like to give a shout out. I played two games and both were really fun. But the second game that we played at Genghis Khan, everyone kept failing their pheromone related roles. And at one point, everyone at the table became devastatingly attracted to Barrett. Um, <laughs> And uh, it was just, it was a lot of fun uh, to play with. So uh, that's my answer to that. Uh, all the good names were taken, asks. It can be challenging working with spouses or even close friends you might live with, even when working means sitting around a game table for a live stream production. Sometimes couples or friends fight and that spills over to work. I haven't seen evidence of that and wonder if you all just get along fantastically all the time or if you've ever had occasion to mask that from us because the show must go on. Um, I will field this one. Uh, That's a cool question. It's a cool gonna... question. And it's an important question, especially because, you know, we, we are we're playing a game. We're also trying to provide entertainment and we try to um, to blend those lines. We don't sacrifice the gameplay or we try not to uh, and we try not to sacrifice the entertainment. Um, and we are all friendly, but we didn't come into this as friends. Uh, we kind of all got to know each other through the process of playing wild cards together. And, and, and we are friends. And, but, but being in a game group with people, um, especially one that meets as regularly as we do and has continued on for as long as it has, is like being in a relationship with somebody. Um, and there are problems that, that come up. I mean, there's clashes of personality, both personally and at the table. Um, and there are things that you have to, uh, to work through. There's uncomfortable things you have to confront. And there are uh, things that you have to try, uh, decisions you have to make, essentially. Um, if you are at a game and you are not enjoying the, the group that you're playing with and the dynamic, essentially you have two choices. Um, you can, uh, well, three choices, but one of them is just continue to play the game and be unhappy, which isn't really a good choice. <laughs> um, one, one choice is to choose uh, to leave the game and decide that it is not enough effort for you to want to put in that work to continue to play with these people. It's just not worth it to you. And that's totally fine. Um, you have to be the judge of that. And if, if the game group that you're in doesn't feel like something that you want to continue to be a part of, there's no shame in walking away. Um, but if you do want to continue, you have to make the decision that this is this is worth enough to me to continue that I am going to deal with confronting those uncomfortable things. I'm going to have those difficult conversations and I'm going to trust that we can get through this and come out the other side uh, closer and stronger and more understanding of one another and better able to communicate. And that is something that is stuff that we run into at the wild cards table. We do, uh, because this is a live performance thing, we keep that, you know, largely between us every now and then. Sure. Things do spill out onto the table and we'll talk about them from time to time, but that is something we are continuing to learn how to navigate behind the scenes with one another, uh, in the context of playing the game, uh, doing the show and just being friends, uh, with, with each other. Um, does anyone else have anything they want to add to that? Well, I think it's funny that you that you say that we mask it because I don't always feel like I'm able to mask things when they come up and that causes a lot of anxiety for me. So I just think it's interesting. It is something, especially since all of us uh, to varying degrees have performance backgrounds. Um, especially for theater that's just drilled into you the show must go on idea of you know it doesn't matter what's happening in your life when you go on that stage all of it is left in the wings is really the whole thing and so um uh, that's just something I'm, I'm i'm quite used to but you don't always know it's working <laughs> so uh so having said that you have no idea how much we love or hate each other you're welcome well, <laughs> <laughs> i I think it's an interesting thing to bring up that like we even though like we we are all part of saving throw like before I got involved in wild cards I didn't know anybody who was involved except Dom and I only knew Dom because he did producer duties for mass and um and dark sun uh, dark sun right before that and 
honestly, like we we've become very good friends. Like we 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 hang out all the time. We we do stuff. Whatever you guys can judge how much you you assume we, we are. never hang out. <laughs> I don't know what he's talking about. Well, we don't anymore because we're all <laughs> stuck in our houses. But but look, we've become very good friends and that sort of thing. And and uh, you know th- there are ups and downs to that. Like like the more you get emotionally invested with the people you're playing with, the more that decisions that you make that you disagree about can like be feel problematic. And the more that it can feel important, the more that it can feel like a, a, a positive aspect in your life. And I, I, I don't know, it, it, it's not easy to say exactly how it works. And I think that I, what I, one of the things I really love about this group is that we, we do know how to like talk through at least like what we want the tone of the the game to be and that sort of thing um but 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 it's not it's not entirely easy and and as much as everyone is like oh i just love the dynamic of this group it's like we've had our problems too and we've tried to work through it we we have as a group of friends tried to deal with the division between being friends and being like almost co-workers in this sense, you know? I, I will say when it comes to interpersonal dynamics or anything else that we do on wild cards, uh, the things that we do on stream that we make look easy are a result of a ton of work that happens behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. Um, you are just seeing the the on-camera portion of, of what we do. And if, and if any of that seems easy and like it comes without work, uh, just know that that's not true. Uh, <laughs> all of the work is happening in a place that you aren't seeing it. Working um, really hard to make sure we look like we like each other because real, we real absolutely wait, wait. do not. <laughs> I, I, I want to put an example out there. I think it's a great example, which is we we started implementing uh, stuff about like safety standards, like like about like feeling safe about what you're doing. And obviously, like we we ended up, you know, being remote for a lot of what we were doing. But like X cards, um, talking about things like that, and and that's stuff that like you almost take for granted when you're working with a group of friends, mm-hmm. you know? but, but it just helps no matter who you're part of to like have as part of your group. Yeah. Yeah. Even, even Jordan and I, even I filled out information for Jordan as a GM, because while we know each other very well, um, that's not even a discussion. It's one of those things that like, you can still run into stuff. And so, yeah, it's important. Anyway, side note. I, I will say, um, like we were talking about earlier with jamming for your significant other, any relationship um, takes trust and trust um, can only be built and maintained through communication. Uh, so that is uh, something that um, you know we try and carry forward. Hopefully that's something that you all feel comfortable and able to do in your own game groups as well and um, will contribute to the health and longevity of them. So uh, great question. Thank you for asking it. It's a good life skill in general that is very hard to learn, but sure. great to learn. <laughs> Timmy David 95 asks, if you had to pick just one NPC from the entire campaign to have as a roommate, who would you choose? Dennis. Dennis. Dennis is my answer as well. <laughs> uh, I pick I pick Keith. Nikita. Well, Nikita. and also <laughs> Philip is awesome. So. Philip played him amazingly. I love that character. I, love <laughs> I don't know if you'd want to be roommates with Keith. Though. True. Um, yeah. I could yeah. see that. Lots so, of weed. Right. But, I, don't know. I think Calvin would. Questionable weed. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that also, too. Also, that's yeah. True. That's an easy one, though. Dennis is clearly the best roommate out of all of them. So yeah. um, it's Dennis. Uh, Emperor Riptide. Uh, looking at chat, it's definitely Randy. Randy? Oh, yeah. It was a close second. Emperor <laughs> Lauren. Asks, what is you and your character's favorite college movie, i.e. Animal House, Real Genius, etc.? Animal House. What do you got? Animal House. You and your character? College movie. Oh, I really like Happy Death Day. Oh, Happy Death Day is good and is it's, a college movie. It's I mean, fun. It's not like, I wouldn't classify it as no. a college movie, but it does take place at a college and it is very much, a, it is an ETU-esque. It's a college uh, movie to me. Sure. Oh, wait, uh, for realsies? Hmm? House is the first time I ever saw boobs in a movie because my dad and his friend who were, we were like on a trip together and the 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 moms, like the the moms were out, they were like, 
we're gonna watch a movie and they watched animal house and they were, a couple times they were like cover your eyes right now and i was like <laughs> and there were boobs and i was like what is this <laughs> and he still doesn't know he still doesn't know but that's why animal <laughs> house is stuck with him it's a puzzle to be solved uh what about the rest of you your your college movie your character's college movie I I am drawing a blank on college movies. I, don't I know I literally college. had to look it up, but I will say I will say Ron's is the freshman by uh, with Harold Lloyd because uh, that's the, the extent that he's gone and seen any college movies. Okay. Uh, Dom's favorite college movie, How High. Probably PCU, right? <laughs> is that a college movie? How High. Sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> According that's to Wikipedia. All right, uh, Gaurav, how about you? Pass. I can't. I literally cannot think. Someone in chat said Police Academy. I'm gonna pick it's Police hard. Academy. A college movie. I don't have uh, one character that I played, but I used to very much love the movie Old School. Uh, I haven't seen it since I was in high school, so I wonder if it has aged fantastically and if I would still enjoy it now. But for the time being, I will say that is my favorite college. I movie. think it's still good. I think I saw it somewhat recently, and I still think it's good. I think it holds up. Well, it's good to know. Um. Kawagaris asks, which episodes are taken from the Degrees of Horror campaign and which ones were the Dean's original creation? Uh, this one's relatively easy. So um, the titles of all of the episodes, assuming Dom did not change them from when I gave them to him, um, correlate to the titles of uh, the uh, episodes from Degrees of Horror. So if it was a uh, Savage Tale or a Plot Point campaign episode, uh, the name of it matches the name that is found in Degrees of Horror. If it was not, uh, it was one of mine. The only exception to that that I can think of offhand uh, was The Siege. The Siege is actually inspired by a savage tale um, from Degrees of Horror called Walpurgis Night. Um, but because of... What the siege was? What's yeah. up? Can you remind us what The Siege was? That was uh, the episode where we were attacked and everyone attacked your house. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that is a, a inspired by a, a savage tale called Walpurgis Night. Uh, the rest of them, I believe, are named after the, their episodes from Degrees of Horror. So if you have a copy of Degrees of Horror, you can um, check them against the YouTube titles. If you don't have a copy of Degrees of Horror, I recommend you get one. It's very worth your time. You know, I'm going to get one. Uh, you, you guys should. I actually, I actually, and, and maybe chat would be interest, interested in this as well, but if you guys read Degrees of Horror and provided your thoughts on uh, on I'm how it played that. versus how you read it, um, I'm sure people would be interested in reading that. I know I would be. Boy, I, I'd be dying to read it. I'm, I'm just like, I've wanted to ask you questions about this the entire time we've done this. So. Well, hey, you've carte blanche now. I don't have to keep any secrets <laughs> anymore. Uh, Kawagaris also asks, what was the deal with Sonia and Inspector Bishop? They were working with the Sweetheart Foundation because they were always really as unhelpful as possible to the study group. <laughs> um, your take on uh, Sonia and Bishop. Were they working for the Sweetheart Foundation? Yes or no, Megan? Um, maybe Sonia, but not Bishop in my mind. Okay, uh, Dom? No, neither. Gruff? No, neither. JP? I don't know if they were working with the Sweetheart Foundation, but they were not working for us. Nor were you working for them. Um, the uh, They were not working. Neither of those characters are aligned with the Sweetheart Foundation, uh, at least not in the way that I ran the game. My feelings and thoughts on them, um, just as there were multiple evil factions in Pine Box that were vying for the control of the Convergence and had been drawn to the town for that reason, so too were their, were their heroic and protective uh, factions. And Sonia and Bishop um, were each leaders of their own uh, heroic factions within town. However, much like the study group encountered, uh, the more you learn about what's going on in Pine Box and the shadowy machinations of uh, things like the Sweetheart Foundation, the less uh, likely you are to trust anyone else in Pine Box uh, who knows, even once you know they know what's really going on, they might be there uh, as a mole or a spy or to sabotage you, you never know. So in my mind, they were heroes. They just were working on different things. Uh, Bishop was mostly concerned with the vampire presence in Pine Box initially. Um, he was, he started off as a vampire hunter. That was his course to discovering what was going on. Um, uh, and uh, Sonia was just dealing with uh, the dangerous books uh, to be found around. Um, so that is the answer to that. 
I, I maintain that whether they were like overall helping us or not, it makes sense to me that Sawyer would not trust them because they had their own things going on and they were like a certain level of authority. So like we had enough reason not to trust Bishop and not to trust Sonia that like Sawyer feels very justified in that. Um, Caligar also asks, the plot was supposed to be that mysterious until the end or did the study group miss a trigger to uncover the plot quicker? Great this, this was a central difficult issue for me in running uh, this plot point campaign because um, I wanted to present as, as well as we could and a, um, a, uh, a, 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 as close to a pure or unfiltered uh, presentation of the plot point campaign as written. Um, with obviously our own episodes meant to fill things out. And my read of it is, yes, things are fairly um, fairly um, mysterious until the very end, especially when it comes to uh, things like uh, uh, the cross, uh, the lantern of the deep, and things like that, not knowing what their purpose is. It was tricky. It was very, very tricky to run this plot point campaign for me as the GM with so many moving parts and so many things going on in the background, you can't, there are things that are explicitly stated in those final two episodes that are meant to be revelations at that point. And I couldn't really see a way to introduce any of that stuff much earlier without it being really unsatisfying to the players that they were unable to come to discover more information or more difficult for me to continue to hide that information from them. So my response was to try and come up with my own subplots um, to essentially uh, dominate the focus of the seasons that didn't have quite as much direct impact uh the sophomore and junior year specifically you're doing very important things you just don't know that they're important to who or why um so it is a little bit tricky in play um a better gm maybe could have found out a, found a way to weave those in uh, a bit cleaner but i did the best that with the information i had in the way that i thought i could um so i will say it is both a combination of the plot point campaign and the way i chose to interpret it uh, but a very good question caligaris anyone have any thoughts on that i mean i don't know it's hard to, to know on this side of things um if you don't have immediate thoughts we're yeah, close to 50 questions read and at that point we will do the next uh epilogue so let's keep moving through this Caligaris asks, what would happen if Ron accepted the calling to uh, of the Devourer to the world? Um, so we already talked a little bit about that, but we didn't say what my original plan was. Um, my original plan was to change the ending of the game based on the decision that Ron made there. Um, but in order to see um, what that would look like, uh, you would have to go back in time and convince Dom to make a different choice. Um, wow. It was, oh road, my. it was the road not taken, and I don't see any point in dwelling on the details. Did I have a plan? Yes. Would it have changed things majorly? No. But it would have changed things. Um, Batman no is cool 100 <laughs> asks, if you were to recast the wild cards with real life friends from your college years, who would they be and why? Everybody, uh, in the interest of time, I just want you to do this for your own character. Did you know someone uh, in your college age years who would fit as your character and why? Yeah, yeah. Give, give no more information than you're comfortable giving. Oh, uh, my, my senior year roommate, I think would be the closest. Her name is, is Cherith. Um, and she, she was a dramaturge, uh, which for those of you who don't maybe know what that was because I didn't until I went to college. Um, they're essentially like the the historian for a play. They they do all the the historical research, any of the research you need, and put a package together for you, and they're there to give you that information. Um, all right, so that was a path you could major in at, in our drama department. But yeah, she was just like this really sweet, kind of soft spoken, but also had a background. Uh, had like you're power. doing fine, but quicker than this. A fiery <laughs> aspect to her, but she was very like kind of. She's, she was just a good person overall, but that didn't mean that she didn't also get into like fun things. Dom? Uh, I, I, I answered this question somewhat in an earlier uh, bonfire talk back. There were aspects of Ron that, of, that I ha knew people were like uh, in college, but no one who was like Ron in college. 
Graf? Uh, yes, I had a friend named Levon in high school who was very much like Calvin. And now that I think about it, might have been one of the main inspirations of Calvin. But he was also kind of a huge nerd at the same time. So he was like, the, he no, was, was he Calvin. Was, he acted, well, okay, let's, yeah, well, maybe. Um, but so much so that he had like a, an internet, like underground internet club in the high school that everybody knew about and talked about. So I mean, sort Calvin of like a Sawyer. In World of Warcraft. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah, he also did that too. Sure. Okay, fine. He was this guy. <laughs> Thanks, Levon. Jordan? Sawyer's version of me. Uh, I I mean, Sawyer liked journalism and I didn't, but like, but the the general like drivenness to do the thing that he cared about, like was was very based on me, kind of thing. Um, so it'd be like a version of me. I mean, I I think that I I have more of a openness to being funny and and um, ridiculousness than Sawyer does, and he was very like down to earth. And I kind of base it on my dad a little bit because he's like. Why would I watch things that aren't true when there's so much interesting things that are true? And I've never really understood that, but I'm like, okay, let's try it. But like, yeah. Um, all right. I, I didn't have uh, any, I didn't have a roommate. I didn't base uh, any of my NPCs knowingly on any one person I went to college with, but the closest thing I had, I had a very good friend uh, who actually I went to high school with and we went to the same school. We lived together for a time. He's probably the closest to an actual living Dennis that I have uh, ever met. He's, he's one of the most solid guys, uh, I, I think, currently alive. Um, and uh, I think guy. most people who know him would agree with that assessment. Yeah. So Dennis is the closest I've gotten. Um, Eric Blishy asks, players, was there one particular event where your character turned from a list of attributes, edges, and skills into the persona you carried through the remainder of the game? And if so, what was it? And I think I have an answer for this for all of you, but I'm curious to see if you guys have one. I say you huh. do that. Like, yeah, you do it, man. That way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no one wants to answer this question? Nope, I want to hear you. No. Yeah. I, I do, but... Well, then we'll let JP go. <laughs> um, I kind of think that a, a, a big moment... I don't know, I, I, think, I think there were a couple of moments for Sawyer where he kind of had to, to go from someone who was just like watching what was going on to someone who was like actively being a participant in everything that was happening. And I, I think that the, the sophomore year situation where we had to like fight that person who was a professor, I think was a big defining moment for Sawyer personally, so. Um, my thought on, on this particular question is, and this is just my opinion as your GM, I'm not in your heads, but I do see what you guys bring to the table. I don't really feel like many of the players at the wild cards table um, start off viewing their characters as a collection of skills and edges and attributes on a character sheet. I think from what I see and from the way you guys approach things, you guys start from a place of who is this character and what are they like? And then you figure out a way to represent that through the rules of the game. So yeah. from my point of view, you guys come to the table with, um, with these characters pretty much all but fully realized except for how it works when the rubber hits the road. Yeah, that's kind of what I was going to say that I I simultaneous fe simultaneously feel like I started not thinking like that but also never got away from it in the sense that much like we talked about with just the structure of this, I found it very hard to ever sink down into Adelaide like I felt like I could with Rosaline. So but I also feel like I started off with a fairly strong sense of who I wanted Adelaide to be, if that makes sense. I I sort of think like if we're going into like Savage World edges, and this did make a difference to who I thought the character was, I think the combination of calculating and level-headed really informed me as to who I thought Sawyer was under pressure, if that makes sense. Sure. Anyone else? Uh, I think we were great from episode one. Episode one. <laughs> no joke. That episode is such a good introduction to our characters. Like the way everything's set out of once we meet our roommates and then we all meet each other. Like it was all just flushed out so well that it tells our character story really well. Sure. I'll agree with that. Dom? Nope. You got all right. it. All right, great. Uh, so uh, Owen Lean asks, how many shins would Calvin skin if somebody once told me this world was going to roll uh, me? I really uh, hope you appreciate uh, how long I slow played this. Uh, 
tongue out smiley face. Oh, wow. Oh, let's quit it. Oh. Got him good, Owen Lane. No. Mm -mm. Wait, but, but it'd be like five at most, right? I mean, maybe. I don't know. No. Um, <laughs> Owen Lane also asks, so assuming the characters survive the Convergence, super behind on the series because I fail, what event in their future lives makes the study group most relieved they studied at ETU? JCC, answer oh. for Barrett? Oh. Uh, so we got, I, I know that we have a lot to say on this stuff, but it's already 10, 15. We got to keep these things short and sweet. We're rolling. Pick and choose your times to expound. What, what event in their future lives makes them most relieved they studied at ETU? I guess Adelaide's work with the Sweetheart Foundation. Yeah, that would come in handy. <laughs> If Calvin does end up going to Hollywood, he has plenty of stories to tell. To turn well, I mean, to he's, the next, he's the next person coming up in our epilogue, so maybe we'll learn about that very shortly. Also true. With with Sawyer, I, I think that learning what's going on at ETU like, sort of made everything else seem um, unimportant. So uh, being deeper into understanding there's something else going on was really important to him. Uh, the friends he met along the way. Ah, um, for, for Barrett, I will say the experience uh, in his future life. Uh, there's there's multiple. Um, a low key uh, uh, subplot of our senior year was Barrett was possessed by a demon um, at our ETU LARP, and uh, we expounded on that in a, a video uh, that he posted on his channel. So um, he spent the rest of his life uh, as a host to uh, Marnathak Imperator of Ash, um, and so um, that was a really defining moment for him. Uh, and I'm sure it came up a lot in the future. Uh, Eric from the Norse Foundry crew asks, if it isn't chosen as the next game, has there been any thought given to doing a Deadlands Noir show? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the answer. Um, guess I'm Salad asks, Dean CC, the first Chupa they saw in season one, episode one that helped them was Paul, wasn't it? Don't play me. Any controlled Chupas wouldn't have attacked Jackson or stopped the first sacrifice that the study group apparently ruined. Guess I'm Salad. I hate to disappoint you, but the plot point campaign as written specifically calls out that Paul and the Needler are not the same. The Needler is part of the, the Needler is part of an early generation of the superhuman project's Chupacabra uh, experiment, and the Needler was not intelligent enough to act independently, and that's why the psychic, who was always nearby, was assigned as its handler. Um, the, the woman in the black turtleneck who often showed up around the Needler was uh, there to keep it in control, and it was her being killed at the end of season one that caused the Needler to go on a rampage and and uh, and all of those events to unfold. So unfortunately, no, that was not Paul. That was the Needler. Sorry to disappoint. Really cool idea, though. Um, and had I it to do over again with that idea in mind, that would be really fun to explore. Um, so I encourage you, if you ever run ETU, to incorporate that idea. I think your players would think it was pretty cool. Having said that, Calvin, are you ready to be Calvin one last time? Yeah, let's do it. The time is 15 years after the events Ooh. of uh, the Convergence. And Calvin Everett Jr., just Calvin Everett now, um, is, a, uh, is hard at work on his sophomore uh, film directing effort. Uh, his last project uh, was hailed as, by, by critics, universally almost beloved by critics and audiences alike as a return to the Bayesian action uh, escapism of the early 2000s. A delightfully retro and updated look at explosions and camera work that keeps you glued to the edge of your seat and the screen throughout its runtime. Um, big shoes to fill. Uh, your own shoes, your own uh, freshman effort as a as a big budget filmmaker made quite a splash, Calvin. And as you're on set for your uh, your latest project, you are having a lot of problems today. Um, there is uh, Crafty didn't show up, so everyone is hungry. You're trying to get that figured out with your AD. Um, there's a long haired boom mic guy that seems new that keeps dropping the boom into the shot. Uh, the extras keep looking at the camera. 
we find you calling cut in frustration uh, on a scene as your uh, AD comes running up. Oh, come, come on, cut, cut. Oh, I'm, shit. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, everyone. Let's let's take five for a moment. I, I am I am so sorry. I don't know what is going on today. I. I, I mean, it's like nobody read the script. It's like, did anybody read the script? Any, no, they definitely, they definitely read the script, Mr. Everett. They definitely read the script. I mean, honestly, the actors are the least of our problems today. I, I don't know what is happening on the set. I'm going to talk to the PAs and I'm, I'm going to talk to the sound department about that boom guy. He keeps dropping the, the mic into every single shot. Yeah, he wouldn't be doing that if he just put his hair up in a ponytail. Stop touching your hair, man. Damn. Okay. Okay. And and he he does, his hair is just all over his face, and he just kind of like you can t you guess he looks over at you. It's hard to tell. It's like dealing with cousin it. But he he kind of nods, and his hair bobs up and down, and he raises the boom mic up. Okay. All right. So um the next scene is the effects heavy scene, uh, and this one's crucial to the script, as I understand it. Um and by the way, may I just say it's an honor to be working with you, especially on your second project that you both wrote and are directing. Uh, so, so um, what is what is the, the 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 focal point? What is the one thing you want to make sure happens in this next scene that doesn't get ruined? And I will make it happen for you, Mr. Everett. Okay. So th this next scene, it's real important. We get this one right because uh, the special effects are important, but also I need the emotion to be 100% correct. This is this is the moment in in this character's life where he finds out that his his car is inhabited by a spirit. Uh, of a ghost and uh, and she is uh, a very important character in this in, in in this person's life so I need this emotional connection to be there I need the special effects to be on overtime to make her look good okay. so I, I need this to be right this is the one scene this is the one that's going to set this one apart from all the others we've got a great effects house lined up for afterwards we just got to nail this one take so i i will go talk to everybody uh whenever you're ready you give me the sign you yell action we will make this happen i am not gonna fail you mr everett and she goes off and just starts like making things happen all right all right it's show time folks action and the camera pushes in on the empty car and the green screen within that will reveal the the first manifestation of the spirit within this car. It's a dramatic scene. It's a surprising one. It's an emotional one. And as you are watching the monitor, you see the boom mic just <laughs> edge down right into you, the shot. You Wookiee man, get that shit out of, oh my God, right now, oh my God. <laughs> and as, as you are calling cut, oh the boom God. operator takes off his wig and reveals himself to be <laughs> your college roommate, Barrett Morrison. You just got total Barrett, Calvin. Ha! And he looks over at one of the key grips who has been <laughs> filming him this entire time. That's right. That's what happens. Even when you're a big shot Hollywood director now, you get on Barrett's show and you're going to get totally Barretted. Fucking you. We hired you, man. You went through a whole process. We trained you. I know. I had to falsify background and everything. I have a <laughs> social security number now. What a waste of goddamn time. Okay, cut. Let's get a new boom bro, guy. Bro, 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 bro. You're not really mad, are you? Was that shot like expensive or something? Yeah, that shot was expensive. Are you kidding me? Luke Skywalker's up in here, man. Are you kidding? Oh my of god. Of course he's furious, you fool! You ruined our one shot at stardom! We could have approached Everett with our latest pilot idea, but instead you had to do your insipid prank! No, I didn't. No, I didn't. It's not like that, all right? We're bros. He understands. No. Okay. No, I am sick of your foolishness. <laughs> it is time to show the world what we can do. Mm -hmm. And as <laughs> this conversation is happening back and forth between Barrett and the demon who still lives inside him, you see Barrett's flesh start to change and a blue light start to shimmer out from within. And as everyone around you backs away in terror, not quite sure what is happening, Calvin Everett, you start to feel pretty hangry. Oh! oh. <laughs> <laughs> this has been an epilogue <laughs> for Calvin oh, Everett. God. God. All right, E.T. Mr. <laughs> asks, obviously, Barrett is the best, B-Squad for life. Any particular inspiration for the character? Personally, he kind of reminds me of Jean Ralphio on Parks and Rec. Uh, Jean Ralphio oh, is great. 
Um, Bear, right? Great character. Not a conscious inspiration for Barrett, although I believe I had watched the show at that point. Uh, the closest thing to an actual inspiration for Barrett, there is an obscure um, internet comedy sketch from maybe like the late 2000s, early 2010s called How to Be Tight by Magic Hugs um, that was done like a awful MTV show with a terrible douche of a host. And Barrett is loosely inspired by that character. So Google How to Be Tight by Magic Hugs <laughs> and watch that. And hopefully it's not an awful sketch at this point. There's a new sketch with Baby Barrett in it. There is. Oh, my God. Um, SNL just recently did a sketch from home called, ba called Dad Pranks that oh. is literally um, Barrett as a child. And, and I, know, I know that you might be like, oh, that's cute. But no, watch the sketch. It's Google weird. SNL Dad Pranks and watch it. It is literally Barrett. Uh, yeah. He starts his video by going, what's up, everybody? It's you, boy. Um, and, <laughs> all, and it's all just mean-spirited pranks that go way They're too awful. far against his dad. Um, it's <laughs> it's perfect. It sounds funny. I, I awesome. have really bad hiccups, and I think that that's Barrett's fault, honestly. I mean, it could be. We can't prove that it's not. <laughs> <laughs> ETU Circuit also asks, is there anything that happened during the campaign that you wish happened to you when you were in school? I mean, I wish I knew uh, martial arts, like Ron knows yeah, martial arts. That'd, that'd be, be cool. pretty badass and was a football star. But no, um, I, I would not want to be subjected to everything that Ron was subjected to or any of the players, honestly, characters. Um, my... Uh, my... My freshman year relationship, my, my girlfriend then is like almost bizarrely similar to my Laurelie relationship in in the show, show. So I would not say I want anything to happen. I would say it kind of like did happen. That's not an audio <laughs> issue. JP just has the hiccups really bad. I have hiccups. It's 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 going really bad and I can't I can't even think about it. <laughs> All right. What about what about Garav and Megan? Uh, I wish I had uh, a house uh, with cool roommates. That would have been cool. Yeah, yeah, that would have been cool. I roommates are difficult, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, yeah, no. I, 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 my college experience had its problems, but I think I preferred that. <laughs> I wish I had had a spooky fucking supernatural mystery to solve in college. I have gone my whole life wanting something like <laughs> the, the episode where they investigated the ghost in the uh, in the theater department. I modeled um, the description of that theater building off of our theater building from college. And I wish something like that would have happened to me back Come then. Come on. You but know that theater is haunted. I'm going to say... Uh, uh, the opposite of some of the stuff you guys are saying. I wish a bunch of this stuff had happened to me. I think I'd be a way more interesting yeah. person. Uh, the description of that theater teacher made me think of my high school theater teacher. I mean, it should make most people think uh, if they've ever had a theater teacher, they've probably had one like that. I don't remember. Who, who'd you model it after? I don't know that I did after oh. anyone in particular. I try not to do that. Um, uh, but yeah, that's that's my answer. I would have loved a spooky mystery uh, to solve. Uh, real quick aside, just to explain my thoughts here, I remember being eight and going to the grocery store with my dad and being in a really like bad mood and him being like, what's the problem with you? And me being like, I'm just bored. I don't want to be here going to the grocery <laughs> store. I want to be camping on the side of a mountain with an apprentice mage. <laughs> <laughs> and my dad was like, that sounds sweet. Oh, okay. <laughs> Oddly specific, oh, but all right. <laughs> Um, so that's me. Um, that's Mike great. Dukes asks, you've tamed the West and walked the hallowed and haunted halls of academia. What game is next? Stay tuned to find out. Yes. Let's try. <laughs> the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. Simmy David 95 <laughs> asks this question, which I very much enjoy. From your time at ETU, what is one piece of advice you would give to incoming freshmen? Don't, Don't worry. Zebra. <laughs> Don't be a zebra. Don't worry too much about school. <laughs> That probably depends yeah. on your game. <laughs> Mine would be, if you know something is true and everyone says it's not, believe yourself. Okay. You said you said okay. don't be a zebra, Groff? Yeah, don't be a zebra. Explore everything. Get out there. Do the weird shit. You only got four years. Get out there. Sure. And mine, I, mine I, is believe yourself. I'd be the opposite. I would say do be a zebra because you are going to be safer that way. Ooh. Yeah. Ooh. I mean, you guys never tried it. Uh, it's an awesome edge, too. And we um, move out, so we're good. We is do. that everybody? Yes. All right. 
Sergeant Awesome wants to know, when do we saddle up next? Good question. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. uh, it's a good question. Even Sergeant now. Awesome also asks, will we ever see Gussie again? <laughs> good question. <laughs> I think I think Gussie's probably do done, right? Like she, she's part of another campaign. It's done. Yeah, she accidentally wandered into uh, into like a, a, a world of darkness game, and it's just like just wondering why <laughs> she she's there. From uh, tabletop RPG to tabletop RPG, mm -hmm. so, uh, some other group has her right now. Hoping that each leap will be her last. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy! <laughs> Sergeant Awesome also asks, when can we start a Wild Cards Living Campaign World? I mean, if anyone wants to start a Wild Cards Living Campaign World, that you would have be a blessing. Yeah. Wait. Do it. That's how Gussie says We're all oh for it. Escape Box Aaron wants to know, where is Laura Lee's wedding episode? Wild Card's wedding episodes are the best. <laughs> um, we've only had one, uh, but thank you very much for, for thinking that. Uh, we just did see a little bit of Laura Lee's yeah. wedding, or at least as much of it as we are going to see. So. Also, Escape Box Aaron, is, is it, I know we have played Fiasco together in the whole thing. Like, just imagine one of those like settings for the 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 wedding episode right yeah oh so much drama um also congratulations on your recent nuptials escape box aaron uh what? congratulations, congratulations. and escape box ted love um, you guys it's amazing congratulations Luke, really rithland green asks you played forrester harris very well and i'd like to ask which faction was he aligning himself with I know some people are going to say that he's obviously a villain with his needful thing shtick, but painful sacrifice is a thing angels demand as much as devils. I know he's part demon, so he could easily be on the side of humans. Forrester Harris, uh, as we've already talked about, there were multiple factions in town trying to uh, gain control or use the energy of the convergence. Forrester Harris was on Forrester Harris's side, um, but just a little bit, as evidence, I, I want to bring this up actually, um, because of the epilogue that we just had. Uh, Sawyer was making a comment to Forrester Harris about how um, the answer agreed to do the ritual was a, uh, a very poor answer, a vague one and not very helpful. Um, however, uh, Forrester Harris, I think more than he cares to admit, was also on the side of the uh, the normal humans of Pine Box and wanted them to succeed. Uh, so I, I think um, that the answer was was the answer that you needed. Um, Simixon asks for Dom and Ron. Walk us through your thoughts on opening the door slash portal for your namesake. Was there any was there any chance of fulfilling your destiny? We already talked a little bit about this, but was there anything else that you wanted to add to it, uh, Dom, from earlier? No, not really. I, I mean, yeah, I, I did consider it, uh, but it just it didn't feel right for the character. Did you me. almost do it in the moment though, or were you always like just gonna be like, nah? I, I, I was one. very close. I, I, was, I was super wondering. I, I swear. I swear. I, 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 I was very i very much wanted to uh just i was just insanely curious to see what would happen but uh i i i also no okay all right <laughs> ron ron um in the end was was a hero through and through uh the husman slash obocop asks for the study group it's surprising none of them switched majors if they had what would they have switched to I mean, I don't find it that surprising. I never switched majors in college. I didn't know well, that many people who did. I went through four majors before before I, I settled in one, so. As a counterpoint. Holy cow. I just don't think she would have switched. I think Adelaide was very set. <laughs> uh, politics, maybe? Maybe just to get prepped for Ron's- Poli uh, Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe maybe physical education, education of some some kind, maybe. <laughs> Coach Stevens. <laughs> um, Philly Cheesesteak asks, "What was the funniest or scariest part of your four years at ETU?" We've already talked a little bit about the scary part, but does anything stand out as the funniest part of your time at ETU? The roaches. That was the funniest. <laughs> no, I thought that was really funny. I, I thought I, I thought that like totally red as as like a, a frat thing for me. I'm always terrible at these types of questions because my brain does not retain <laughs> the, the stuff until someone else mentions it. Well, as soon so as someone I, asks. 
it's all gone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I can't, I can't recall that there, I that suffice to say there were a ton of hilarious moments. Dude, uh, I, I felt everything with you and coach was fucking funny as shit. I love coach. So good. Coach was awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Coach was I loved, fun. I love those. I did enjoy bits. coach. Um, one of, the, one of the funniest moments that I thought, uh, was when the episode where you introduced Marcos to us, because oh we all God. immediately realized what you were doing at the same time. We're, and I was just like, yes, mm -hmm. this is exactly what I wanted to see with this character and JP and Lorelai. Oh, it was just, I was thought, I thought, I thought for a moment when we were doing the, the final episode with Randy, right? When, when I looked out and saw where like, he was outside and he had the, the like stuff set up. I thought he was, I thought he was Marco for a moment. Ooh. Oh, interesting. <laughs> I thought he had become Marco to like fuck with me. <laughs> hmm. That is, that is an interesting idea. Um, <laughs> did, did everybody get a chance to say theirs? I mean, I didn't, but I don't know, man. That is a uh, really hard... big mouth moments. Yeah. Sure. I don't know if any of them like stand out specifically, but I do remember several times of you being like, yeah, you can come with us. Yes. Or, yeah. or things like that. And that was always kind of fun. I would say, I, yeah. I would say the, the book, uh, uh, the, that whole investigation out throughout bookstores was hilarious. Mm. And uh, usually anytime the library IT guy, was the library there. IT guy. Um, yeah. Yes. And when you guys would jump in and play the game as other students in the library, that was also fun. We'll talk more about him a little bit later. Okay. Um, Philly cheesesteak asks, Dean, did any of the players surprise you in their decisions? Yes. Um, but I will say um, the, uh, I, I, I feel, and this is just me. They may, they may disagree. Other players may disagree. You all may disagree, but I feel like I've got a pretty good read on how, on what Megan and JP are going to do in a situation. I am less likely to, to accurately guess how Garav or Dom are going to respond uh, to, to situations. I, I will say I am more frequently surprised by the, by the decisions that Dom and Garav make. Um, and none specifically jump to mind. Uh, except for the one we've been talking about most recently, which was uh, Ron refusing uh, the Devourer's uh, call. Um, I was almost positive he was going to say yes, um, but he didn't. And uh, just like before that, I was almost positive he was going to tell the Ron Tagathians no, but he didn't. Um, <laughs> and um, with with Garav, I'm never quite sure what's going to happen. Uh, Garav definitely keeps me on my toes as far as uh, things go. So when Garav ended up being three-eyed Jack LaSalle, I was like, we'll see where this <laughs> goes. <laughs> Wild card, bitches. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, I get surprised by things they decide all the time, but I'm also yeah. getting very good at figuring them out. I think some more than others. Um, mm -hmm. So that surprise is, no, I can't even say it's lessening. Um, <laughs> all of them throw me for loops from time to time. I mean, that's part of the fun. Uh, the Hussman slash Obocop asks, for the study group, which one of you secretly told others about Mellow Wolf? I don't think Adelaide processed enough what that whole thing was. So she probably told way, like a ton of people, like, yeah, that band <laughs> Mellow Wolf, I think. Adelaide, no, they specifically asked you not to. That's such a big mouth thing. That's such a like anxiety <laughs> brain thing. Not Sawyer. He didn't tell people, but like you would hear people be like Mitch and Mel Wolf and be like, <laughs> just like, just like look at him, like, come on, man, you know you're not supposed to to tell anyone. So okay, wait, wait, wait. we I I know we talked about like favorite moments, both as far as like dealing with issue issues and stuff like that, but like the 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 season one time where Sawyer like got into a fight with Laura Lee and everybody at the like the the, the music festival we were at, remember yeah that was a really fun moment for me i liked him just like being drunk and like making bad decisions decisions and like fighting with everybody he was talking to 
yeah, that was that was a fun uh, moment in a in a in a very emotionally devastating kind of way for me. <laughs> but it was fun. It was it, 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 it was it was emotionally devastating, but it was also like it was very real moment to deal with. Like, yeah, very real. Yeah. Um, Hobo cop slash the Hussman also asks for the dean. What is Glenn Mack's favorite Steely Dan song? <laughs> um, that came out of nowhere. Uh, the Steely Dan thing originally happened. Um, in the season two finale, which was uh, the virtual reality world that Randy had trapped all of you in. Uh, there were actually a couple of hints in that episode to what was really going on. I don't know if you guys remember this or not at all, um, but in that episode when you guys were talking to Glenn Mack, one or more of you saw uh, the shadowy figure of a woman that seemed to be like transposed over Glenn Mack and was kind of like getting in the way of... Uh, like his actions which was way back then a representation of the influence that helen lane had uh over over glenn mack uh which we might get a chance to talk about a little bit later um but the steely dan thing was just me panicking and trying to think of a band that i know nothing about that sounds like a band that dads would like and so i said steely well, dan what a, I great don't joke. Know. what a great joke i i, I just have to support you on that choice <laughs> I don't know a single Steely Dan song, so I'm gonna say Glenn Mack's favorite later. Steely Dan song. What 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 did I like accuse him of liking later? Hootie and the Blowfish, <laughs> something like that. And uh, and yeah, that was the moment when it happened in the real world, and he affirmed he's a Steely Dan man. Um, but uh, <laughs> no, no, it, it, it was it was, it was Jackson. Jackson. Um, it, it was Jackson. it was uh, what's his name? It was Jackson. Who was like he's a Steely Dan man. Yeah, yeah, that's I right. Love that. that was my favorite moments of the entire campaign. But. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I don't know what, I don't know any of their songs. Um, D4 minus one in love asks, did you ever, great name by the way. Um, did you ever consider doing the adventure brainwashed? I thought the cow mutilations from the LARP episode and Ron's cult coming to Pine Box was lead-ins to the module. There are a lot of 12 to midnight adventures which predate ETU, but take place in Pine Box, Texas. One of which is Curse of the Black Guard, which we ran as uh, ETU undeclared. Brainwashed is another one. Um, there's a lot of really good ones. Um, I haven't actually had a chance to read through all of them, um, but most of the reason why I didn't do any of those episodes is because they were all longer modules, and as the show went on, the aesthetic um, kind of naturally sort of developed into each being its own sort of self-contained time. D4 minus two in love asks, you did the new notorious TPK night train for Deadlands. Did you consider Chickens in the Mist or movie night modules? I've heard great things about both of those. I want to challenge uh, the players not to kill them. Um, and uh, especially in an ongoing story like we're trying to tell, um, it, it, it causes its own challenges if I intentionally set out to run a deadly game. Uh, night train was a way to test, uh, to stress test essentially. Um, the success of the uh, the players in our Deadlands campaign, but I didn't really feel a need to do that in this one. Okay, wait, wait. Well, let's be real though. Like Night Train, as as much as it was like a, a high stress test thing, was not as challenging as like a lot of the stuff we dealt with in ETU. Oh, I'm man. Don't don't tell John Goff that. <laughs> um, Evil Dice Monkey asks, did you give any did you give Megan any direction that she wasn't playing Addie when she was playing Stacy playing Addie in the siege? Yes, I did. Uh, and ordinarily I would do that on screen, but because of the quarantine and everything, I talked to Megan briefly ahead of time. I didn't give her much information. I told her, hey, when the game starts tonight, you're not gonna be Adelaide. You're gonna be Stacy playing Adelaide. You know as much about Adelaide as someone could know from observing her for a long period of time as Dr. M did. Um, and your goal is to get um, get Ron alone. That is your only goal. Your your secondary goal, if possible, is to get the lighter away from Sawyer. Yep. That's all. That's all I told her. Um, and then she jumped into it. Um, I real hard. All right. I, to be fair, I like without knowing that was the goal. I like fucking nailed it as far as stopping it from happening. Right. Keeping the lighter. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, I thought I had um, figured out a way to do it, but then you were like, no, it's in my pocket at all times. I was like, fuck. <laughs> um, Evil Dice Monkey asks, that was a pretty intense uh, role-playing session the study group had when Addy GM'd. Did that session put a dampener on anyone's opinion of RPGs? Was the satanic panic real in ETU? 
I mean, I don't know. Are any of your characters ever going to play an RPG again after that game with uh, Adelaide? So we liked it more than he expected. Uh, probably not in Pine Box. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good yeah. answer. Um, Philly Cheesesteak asks, Dean, how far into the reception of the wedding does Laura Lee turn to Marco and say, I want a divorce? Uh, um, I mean, that that's up. I, I think with the way things worked out that Laura Lee's going to settle. I think she's committed yeah. Yeah. Exactly, to this bit. That's exactly how I felt. Committed to, uh, to, to Marcus. To Marco. Okay. Um, the Jersey Driver asks, for the players, what in-character decision did you struggle the most with and why? Which we've already sort of talked about a, a little and some other issues, but does anything else jump out for you guys? Not really. No. no. I, yes, but I can't think of them. It, it, it's so, <laughs> there's not a specific thing in mind. I just remember feeling that like, feeling a lot. A couple of times. I, I feel like that too. Um, yeah, but I, I think we've, I think we've largely uh, sort of talked about that. Um, so we'll move on. DHR dog, Carl, Carl Kiesler. Uh, hi. Yay, Carl. Um, Yay, Carl. For the Dean, there are a bunch of ETU one sheets and Savage Tales available. Which ones are you sad you didn't get to run for the wild cards? We've sort of talked about this too. I will say though, there's a lot of really good ones. I, I almost ran Jack's back multiple times. Um, I came, in fact, uh, one week I was like, I had decided to do it. I was preparing to do it. And then I had a different idea and I just never found the chance to run Jack's back. But that one almost made its way into the game multiple times. Um, that one for sure. I'll just say that. Uh, DHR dog Carl also asks for the Dean. When are you going to finally get with Pinnacle to write up some of your ETU creatures, magic items, and adventures into a one sheet or supplement and make them part of the official ETU universe? You have some amazing ideas, JCC. Well, thank you very much, uh, especially coming from Carl Kiesler. He, yeah. You run, some, <laughs> you run some pretty good games too. Uh, I mean, okay. One of, oh, this is not an offense to you, JCC. None taken. But the most fun I've ever had playing Savage Worlds is playing the Taylor Park Shark Attack with Carl. Taylor Park Shark Attack with Carl Kiesler. Like it's it's the most fun I've ever had playing Savage Worlds. If you it go was to so fun. If you go to conventions and you can sign up for a game and it's a Savage Worlds game run by a gentleman called Carl Kiesler and there are <laughs> some available buy a ticket for that game immediately. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh. I will say. Um. I. Um just maybe like keep watching stuff that pinnacle puts out <laughs> that, that's all so awesome. vague um yeah. dhr doug carl also asks have you all ever thought about going back to any old campaigns and do another show with the same characters etu grad school that kind of thing i'm gonna answer this one uh for the players because i'll say at least when it comes to their deadlands uh, <laughs> uh characters this is something that i get asked uh quite <laughs> Quite a fair amount uh, by by some of the group, especially Megan. Um, and, what did I say? Um, I try. I'm trying. I'm trying, man. I do. I I think that you can poison the well of an entire story by going back to it uh, too many times. Yeah. Um, and I would only return to characters that we have concluded their story with if I had a really awesome idea or I thought it would be really really fun. But st the problem with stuff like that, a prequel even though you can go like, oh, it, it's, it's completely separate from the rest of the story. It, 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 it happened before, so it won't, it won't touch anything. It, it does. It changes, uh, it, it makes further decisions about characters. It changes the dynamic of, uh, of things. It can have unintended ripple effects that really and truly can uh, cheapen an entire story that you've already seen um, just by being handled wrong. So I would only ever go back to that well if I really had a, a good idea for it. I'll be honest. I think like Gabe, Gabe, Gabriel Pryor is, is my favorite character I've ever played in an RPG. And I would feel almost like it cheapened his story to like go back to it too much. You know what I mean? Sure. Yeah. Anyone else? Nope. You got it. Moving on, Vampire54 asks, group question, any plots or storylines that you hoped or wished you could explore more? Oh man, so many. Uh, Name I, one. Um, I wanted to know more about what was going on with the the um, 
And I, I guess we discovered a little bit, but like the, the, the items we found when we were like searching the, uh, the, whatchamacallit? Burn? The burn, the badges. Burn, the burn. And I mentioned like the last episode and, and, and we discovered that like somebody had one of the like fucking badges for the whole thing. President Nelson was badge number seven, the only badge of the 13 that you didn't find. The youngest member of the 13 Texas Rangers who had come to Pine Box, Texas during the first convergence to fight the demons that came through from the other side, injured in that battle and taken away from the, uh, the, the site of it. He was the one of the only survivors of the burn and stuck around at the school doing his best to protect people from the things that go bump in the night. So I will say from episode one, episode one, I, 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 I tried to take more notes than I would take. I, I tried to take notes that Sawyer would take, you know? And I wrote down President Nelson health concerns from like episode one. And we never understood more about that, but like. He was very old. Anyone um, else? Um, there wasn't any seeds set for this. And I was hoping there would be at some point, but we just sort of ran out of time is I would have loved to have a plot point where like Calvin had to do some sort of like street racing with Rosa. Like just, there's some crew in school and they're like vampires or werewolves or something that are like street racing and causing havoc. And he had to get in there, like infiltrate them and become one of them and the whole crew had to be there to do something i thought it would have been really fun that would have been fun i don't know that this is the, this whole campaign is kind of like oh that thing was interesting oh we have to go this way um so yeah i don't know i definitely liked the thing in the corner would have loved more like in depth information about like why what that thing is and why it exists and how it exists the thing in the corner from that episode that you like fucking nailed it on is like my favorite element of the entire campaign. Mm -hmm. It was Peaked early. <laughs> Peaked really <laughs> early. That was season one. Yeah. <laughs> it was all that was season one? Good. Yeah. No. Honestly, I've never felt a moment in Savage Worlds that has felt more like on point than that. Dom? Mm. Nope, nope, nope. Dom was 100% happy <laughs> with uh, all the plot. <laughs> um, DHR Dog Carl asks, how do you all pick the settings you want to play in? Do you vote? Does JCC spring it on you? Uh, it's, important, it's important to remember, we have only done that once. Uh, we came, <laughs> we created wild cards with the understanding that it could be different savage settings, but we're going to start in Deadlands. So I just decided Deadlands, and these guys came and played. Um, and then after that, um, I feel like the decision was like largely motivated by me to do ETU, but everyone was cool with it. Um, this, he is our leader. That was, the, that was the one time we chose a setting, so we don't have a system. Um, yeah, I mean, originally we were gonna every season was gonna be a different world, a different setting, but, uh, but then we started playing oh, Deadlands. Yeah, and we're like, I, yeah, yeah. Longer. I'm telling this yeah. to the people. I was telling this to JCC and Megan and and, and Tom and Grob, but like I have a friend who is like a big fan of um deadlands and they were like oh wait you guys like actually know like shane hansley and stuff <laughs> yeah it's weird so, it's uh, one thing i will say though it's really important for jcc not that it's not important for all of us but it's important for him to make the decision because he's the driving force of story creation mm -hmm. and if he's not passionate or excited about it it's not it doesn't matter what we're passionate or excited it about. extends out to everybody though like it does I, I definitely want to be excited about what we're doing but if if you guys aren't excited about what we're doing like it, it has to be synergistic it, right table has to be enjoying what's happening or it's not going to be fun for and i i said that i said that you know we, we're all on board as well but i i think uh he's he's not going to run something that we really don't want to be in and vice versa i'm not going to punish them nor am i going to let them force me into running right. something i have no interest in uh we we come up with it we arrive at it together um one more question uh and then we're going to find out what happened to ron to goth stevens uh dhr dog carl asks for the dean have you ever thought about running your own homebrew setting or run a setting that isn't an official licensed Pinnacle product? For example, Savage Ghostbusters or Savage Star Wars. Um, my own homebrew setting, 
I don't like to do that kind of work. Um, I, I, I really don't like to sit down and build a world from the get go. If we were ever going to do a homebrew setting of mine, it would start small and expand out and I would build it as we played. Uh, but I just don't have the kind of, uh, I don't have the kind of mind that can sit down and, and want to like build an entire world on the on the scale of like etu or deadlands and then be like all right now let's play in one small corner of it um i i would build it as we went I, that's just the way i would work um ran secret world secret world yeah i mean there's so many things i want to run in savage worlds um but um what's a popular ip you run, which i think you were talking about just before this show a popular ip for what that you'd want to run like he would oh. he mentioned ghostbusters and stuff so like what's a popular ip um a lot actually um uh the secret world is a great ip for savage worlds um animorphs actually would work fantastically oh, in savage worlds and re reading through those books i'm coming up with lots of hindrances and edges uh pokemon i think that i have a way to make pokemon work in savage worlds that would be a lot of fun um there, there's a lot but there's just not enough time in the last world. airbender last yeah. airbender that yeah, was, that's, that's what you mentioned about. before. That's yeah, what we that were was. talking about like before we yes. talked here because I'm, I'm watching with my with my housemate. So, all right, Dom. Yeah, are you ready to be Ron to Goth Stevens one more yes. time? Yes. This is an epilogue for Ron. A couple days after graduation, um, in in the fading, uh, you know, jubilation of of campus and the the gradual uh, abandonment of it as everyone leaves and goes back to their lives and goes home for the summer or moves on with their lives. Um, you specifically, Ron, receive a text message from Glenn Mac asking if you have the time to come by his office today. Do you accept? Uh, I do. Okay. Showing I should up have thrown you off and said no. Yep, yep. I would never <laughs> have seen it coming, and we would have ended there. Uh, you walk into Glenn Mac's office to find him nervously fidgeting behind the desk. Ah, uh, Mr. Stevens, or, or um, Ron. Please, please come in. Have a seat. Oh, thank, thank you. Um, how how are you? Uh, how are uh, you? I'm I'm uh, I'm well, thank you. Um. Uh, how how are you, uh, Professor? Uh, as 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 well as can be expected, I suppose. Um, I won't pretend, and and I won't avoid the fact that there is some mistrust between us, and that is entirely my fault. And I hope to one day be able to make amends to you and, and to your friends and to everyone in this town. But what are your plans for the future? I, I know that you have no family left as far as I'm aware. Where will you go from here, Ron? Um, to be honest, I haven't really considered it i i i think i need to see more of the world this he was, smiles a little bit as you say that but lets you continue this is just the beginning honestly i i wasn't meant to be here more than a year and i found people here that i trust with my life and that's an amazing experience that I would never give up, but I also have only spent time in Pine Box. I need to see more. I need to see what the world is like. Tell me, do you have interest in pursuing uh, field work in anthropology in support of your degree? Oh. I hadn't thought of that, but that's actually a really great idea. Uh, yeah. Well, it's it's funny you should mention wanting to see more of the world because I, I've recently been made aware of an archaeological dig in Egypt that has turned up something very interesting, thought to be lost for many centuries. And immediately, when I was contacted about it, my mind turned to you. I wonder, Ron, 
if you might be interested in accompanying me to Egypt this summer to investigate this site more closely. Wow. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I would. That that would be really great. Yeah, thanks, Professor. Thank Excellent. you for thinking of me. Excellent. No, thank you. I I think you're really going to be impressed by this, Ron. It, it's a site that we thought had been lost, only mentioned in obscure texts, but they, they found it beneath a level of excavation that had already been going on. It's it's known as the Nameless City, and I think you're really going to find a lot to like about it. Sounds great. And that is where mm. we end things for Ron. <laughs> that is an epilogue for Ron. <laughs> um, did I reference that right, Dom? <laughs> the, the Nameless City? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's actually in Saudi Arabia, but... Uh, Saudi Arabia? Ah! Damn. Yeah. <laughs> but but Egypt Egypt is way cooler. Oh, uh, Egypt's cooler. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I, yeah. Was, no, that was great. That's perfect. I love it. A, a, a Lovecraftian reference. Yeah. Uh, attempt at a Lovecraftian reference for uh, those of you who don't know. It seems that Ron's dealings with the great old ones have not yet come to an end. Ron That's is awesome. the Scorpion King. Ron is the Scorpion King, obviously. <laughs> uh, Jax wants to know, what was the thing with the computer guy in the library season one? Uh, oh. The best yeah, character in the entire thing. That, Jax, is what is uh, is known in improv circles as a game that we discovered <laughs> in the midst of this and decided it was fun enough to keep playing over and over again. Was it important to the story? Did it further anything? Not no. necessarily, but was it a fun touchstone to let us know, oh, right, we're in the library. Um, yes. I felt like it helped in that one, right? Yeah. I think we that. all understood. That character didn't matter, but... But when you were in the library, like that was who you had to deal with. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what the deal was with that. <laughs> BSB Care One asks, well, we had a canary for Deadlands. What is the official drink of ETU? Um, I will say it is uh, called the Madagascar Hissing Cockroach. <laughs> and it is a shot that is just filled with um, trolley uh, sour octopi um it's just all in that shot so when you take it you just feel it tickling your throat all the way down with vodka on top to make it gooey and gross i'll be honest i feel like there's something better i don't know what it is but like i think that's pretty good it's pretty solid all right well then we'll go with that guess i'm salad wants to know who caused the most property damage both intentional and unintentional bear in mind damaging trees with your car is surprisingly expensive calvin especially if those trees are important historical landmarks oh yeah so which one of you caused the most property damage uh, i mean ron kicked down some ron? fences and doors no i gotta say this is easily calvin uh ron or calvin yeah well, i did destroy a boomerang probably also when i threw you that destroyed a um artifact boomerang you ran your car uh into a historically important tree uh -huh. your house has been devastated through no fault of your own but legally you're gonna be um you know your name's and, gonna be attached okay, to yeah when you were a pirate you kind of had an, an entire biker oh, gang that yeah. uh, oh, ran yeah, through that, towns dude, that episode cool. alone probably yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, stuff up like for sure i gotta say calvin's damages are up here and everybody else's are like way that's further. probably true yeah, yeah. That yeah. makes sense <laughs> It's not zero. Like we all did some like pretty serious property damage. Not zero, just way further down. Guess I'm Salad asks, who out of the study group would continue monster hunting, and who would want to put it all behind them? Uh, I think Sawyer Sawyer would continue monster hunting. Oh yeah, you did. <laughs> I I think I think Ron would would continue doing something of the sort, and it looks like you it, definitely he did probably too. will. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think Adelaide probably continued. I think she could have yeah. gone either way, but I think she would have been curious. Maybe Calvin. I don't know. Uh, like... It's hard to say because Calvin started doing that on his, on his own. Like in the last year of school, he started just patrolling on his own. And it just depends. I don't think it's the same without Rosa, though. Without Rosa, I don't think he feels like he needs to do it. And that, that felt like a, an activity they did together. And I think if he did it by himself, he'd just be too depressed. Like he'd be talking to himself constantly. So I don't think he would. All right, I like those answers. Dead I mean, custodian, what? 
Go on. Oh, Dead Custodian asks, were the Blackguard trying to help cause the convergence to happen, or were they just a cult of power-hungry creeps? I must have missed something. Uh, the Blackguard were just taking advantage of the energy of the convergence. Uh, for more details on that, read Curse of the Blackguard and the entirety of the Degrees of Horror plot point campaign. Uh, no, they were they were just there to, to leech off the power of the convergence. They were not masterminds of any kind. That's my answer. Uh -huh. Makes sense. Uh, guess I'm Salad also asks Dean Big Boy, when did Sweetheart first notice the students? Uh, first want to control them. What dumb shit did the study group do to finally get put on the murder <laughs> list? This is actually an interesting question. Um, I will say the Sweetheart. The What's up? I want to know this answer. Sweetheart first became aware of the study group. And this is interesting. When you're reading Degrees of Horror, you guys didn't get to experience this, but there is a lot of information about all the things Glenn Mack does to prevent Helen from learning more about you all. Oh, um, interesting. He runs interference uh, for Helen the whole time. That's why he was so pissed in that episode uh, at the end of season three when you had to have dinner or breakfast with that one uh, professor who wanted you to go on that uh, mission mm -hmm. for him. That was the Sweetheart Foundation getting past Glenn Mack. Right. Uh, you all. But they became aware of you all. By the way, the the biggest reason that, that Sawyer did not trust him for the rest of the season. Right? Yeah. Um, but the reason they became aware of you all was because of Randy. Um, Randy was essentially a uh, a a free radical operative for Sweetheart. Um, he was a genius with tech and the occult, and they wanted to use the things he came up with. And as long as his uh, experimentation didn't get too destructive, they could rein him in. But his obsession with you all caught Helen's eye. And from Randy's obsession with stopping you all, that brought you to the forefront. The fact that Glenn Mack um, also had you all as protégés uh, only served to reinforce that. That's when they decided they needed to control you or otherwise do something with you. So it's all thanks to Randy, really. Hmm. I have hiccups now. <laughs> thanks, JP. <laughs> I, I hated Randy so much. I know. Well, that was the point. Like, he not only, like, like graded on me as a character, like, he graded on me as a person. <laughs> sure. Um, well, then I succeeded. Mace134 asks, to the Dean, were all the cards on the revised curse table drawn? If not, what were the unrevealed curse effects? Uh, I believe they were all drawn. Through okay, the wait, question. Yes. What happens if she drew a Joker? Um, if she drew a Joker, which she never did, that is correct. I'm uh, not sure that didn't happen. I will pull that up while we are answering this next question Please. from Mace134. Uh, to the study group, when Randy revealed that there would be one enemy for each of you during the siege, did you have flashbacks to the Los Diablos fight? Oh, <laughs> God, yes. I, I mean, a little bit when, when things were starting to turn against us. Um, but, but yeah, I, yeah, just in, in terms of setting, I suppose. But yeah. Okay. I didn't put those two things together at all. I was just like, who is going to be for Adelaide? Yeah, I felt the same way, actually. I'll be honest, I did not like see how it would connect for um, Sawyer, but then he ended up like actually being like fucking gored by a cartoon bull. Yeah. It's almost too on point. <laughs> I, I didn't even think about that, honestly, until you guys pointed it out at the table. Um, so I, def I definitely didn't think about that. Um, I believe a Joker was drawn, actually, because the Joker result is the character lucks out and the curse is abated for a time. Oh, yeah, I did In draw fact, that once. of the suffering normally afflicting her, the character's strong will shines through and she gains a plus one to all spirit rolls this session. I believe that was drawn one time, so I think uh, every result from the table made it in. Um, to Jordan P. and Garab, do you regret taking the party animal hindrance? <laughs> How did Sawyer and Calvin's amount of partying compare to yours throughout college? It was definitely difficult. Oh, like, man. It was a real, real um, hindrance. Yeah, uh, yeah, that was the most hindrancey of all hindrances. It kind of made up for annoying roommate, because, like, Barrett was, after a while, sort of a pleasure. But this party animal <laughs> just kept happening. And I, it just it just makes the entire session just awful for you. I spent a lot of time going over in college, so, like, it, it makes sense for me. Okay. 
Well, uh, it, it seems like uh, art imitated life or the other way around. Um, but yeah, it was a pretty, it was a pretty difficult hindrance. Yeah. Um, he who wants jeans wants to know, are there aspects of your characters that were influenced by your college lives? If so, would you share a short story or two? If not, what inspired you to play outside of your personal history? Um, so we've kind of talked about how the characters are inspired by our own college experience. Um, and we don't have the time for to each share a short anecdote from college. But if any of you, um, if there were no aspects of your character influenced by your college lives, what inspired you to do that? Uh, I, I don't... I don't know that there was much really inspired by my college life outside of, um, I don't know. I don't really think of Adelaide as being shy. Uh, me, I was a bit more shy. I do think of her as being anxious, but our, her anxiety and my anxiety manifest in two very different ways. Um, so yeah, I, don't, I really don't think she was inspired by my college life. She was just an aspect of my personality, an aspect, a different aspect that I wanted to play and try, try to play and to represent. I mean, Anyone else? I was definitely like a, a heavy partier slash drinker in college, so so I, I played that in Sawyer, or I tried to. Sure. Um, so I don't know what to say about it, but like, but it was absolutely like, the, yeah. I, I I tried to use my experiences to like inform what happened to my character. Sure. Sure. Um, 404 Data Not Found wants to know, will Calvin make a romantic comedy movie about Rosa and the ghost car? <laughs> uh, it kind of seems like, uh, maybe, although I didn't get the impression it was a romantic comedy. No, that's not, that's not how I pictured either, no. What is the genre of the film? Uh, adventure. Adventure. It is an adventure. It is an adventure film. Uh, uh about, about a boy and his ghost car. Mm -hmm. Um, See me, David ninety five wants to know for both the players and JCC. What was your favorite plot twist slash reveal slash stinger? Um, oh, uh, mine was when after the whole pirates uh, taking over my body is him awake at night in his bed and realizing he still has some essence of this uh, ghost inside of him and him just going shit. Like, yeah, that, that was my favorite. I really like that one. That was good. Uh, the my parents not being my parents. Was oh yeah, that was pretty one. good. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that was a pretty good one. Forgot about that. <laughs> Did you? We're gonna talk about that in a bit. Yeah, I'd say Are that we... or Ron Togoth at the very end. Mm. Oh, okay, interesting. Mm -hmm. JP, I don't know. <laughs> too many, too many to choose from, or not enough. It's we may big, never know. Um. What? It's a big set of choices. It yeah. is. Uh, BSB Care wants to know, for the Dean, was there a place or area in Pinebox you wished the study group explored more so you could flesh it out? Not really. Um, I mean, there were plenty of places in, in Pinebox that we didn't get to um, that were sites of interest, but I, I wanted to explore the things that we did explore, and I feel like we explored them pretty well. Uh, the only place that would have been maybe more fun to learn about um, would be some of those other bookstores in town. Uh, I really, um, the concept of book uh, tickles me uh, still to this day, and uh, I still want to know more about the Crown Books guy. What's his deal? What's his story? Stay tuned. Mm -hmm. uh, elephant in the boom. This is a great question. Garav slash Dean. Did Calvin and Rosa ever think about dating? Like defo, right? I mean, Calvin. It definitely crossed Calvin's mind because he just he doesn't know how that would even work. But I, I think he definitely thought about it. I felt it from the not them characters side of things, right? Like, I I I will say though we never really touched on it directly. I always played Rosa of being uh, a bit possessive of Calvin and always jealous of other women that he uh, was into if she didn't feel like they were good enough for him. Oh, he, she also had a bit of a problem with me at the beginning, right? Because I actually remember being in a car, being in the car and she was responding kind of like, I don't like her. <laughs> you, were a, you were a bit of a try hard at first, Adelaide. Sure. Yeah. Like, I'm into I was. <laughs> I'm super cool with ghosts. <laughs> Be my friend too. That's um, Adelaide. And uh, Rosa wasn't into that at first, but she warmed up. Yeah. Um, Ron slash the Dean, how's football? It's good. I missed football slash coach related stuff in the last year. It's a shame, but like. We, yeah, we talked about it and it was just, it's, it's, yeah. 
realistically, it would be very hard for Ron to participate in anything and maintain a college football career. Which we could have played with. Which we could have played with. But uh, beyond that, it was it's just the football stuff takes a lot and uh, it's it's a big scene when we do do it and uh, to make it impactful like would take a lot out of everything else we were trying to fit in to the to the show so it wasn't something that we I think it was more of a from a production standpoint we I loved I loved doing the football stuff I loved working with coach and all of that stuff and that was super fun but it just Stevens we yeah think- we had we had to we had to cut something I think, I think out of what we played- wanted to do we played that out, I think, pretty pretty well in season three, and it really would have just been sort of retreading the same ground. And with a truncated uh, bit of time to end things in the last season, it just it felt like something we could afford to to let go and move on. We did have one episode where the football schedule was pretty difficult for uh, for Ron to like be a part of the investigation the rest of the group was doing, yeah. and that felt like enough. Well, uh, we were somewhat limited in 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 the final episodes and. And I remember, like, because because I asked when we were like first talking about like starting season four. I thought I was like, "Hey, should we like wait two weeks and see if we should start it then, and th- and then maybe we could like not have to do it in this weird separated situation? Like, maybe we could be back in the um, the the studio." But like, it became very clear that like, no, this is a longer time period than just. A couple weeks kind of thing yeah yeah so i mean you know we had to roll with a lot of punches for this last season but i mean we did the best we could and i think it worked out um the elephant in the boom asks addy slash dean after the convergence is it still possible to cast rituals this is a multiple part question but i'm gonna answer them as they come yes it is would addy still use them Hmm. Um, uh, yes, but I think with a lot more research and knowledge, especially if she's going to continue working with the Sweetheart Foundation in that way, I think she would learn to become, uh, figure out a way to be safer with them as much as possible. (laughs) And would she still have contact with Glenn Mack and Sonia, especially regarding occult or ritual stuff? Uh, my answer for that is probably yes. Yes, she didn't, she always felt like Glenn Mack was good even in the fact of learning everything, she never felt like his intentions were fully negative. I think she was frustrated and disappointed by the things she learned, but she seemingly, at least from what I could tell, differed from the rest of the study group in that uh, yeah. viewpoint. Um, we'll, I think we'll have a chance to address that in one of the last questions. Uh, we're doing pretty well, we're moving through it. We can do this, guys. Um, the elephant in the- 31. Uh, the elephant in the boom asks Sawyer slash Dean, is Sawyer's appearance still older after the convergence? Yes. I think is, so, Forrest, yeah. is Forrester Harris still around? Yes. <laughs> Sawyer, if he had a chance, try to find out how to get his younger body back. I think I think he would look into it, but but I kind of think that Sawyer realizes that like part of what he dealt with by asking these questions, especially the third question, which is like he 100% knew what he was asking when he asked it. I think he knows that that's, that's what he sacrificed, you know? But the elephant in the boom finishes up the question by saying, sounds like searching for rejuvenation or immortality magic stuff to me. And we know where that leads. Cough, Nazi mummy, cough. <laughs> yeah. Good point. Um, the elephant in the boom also asks, Grob, did you think about establishing the Dean Club for real? That would have been awesome. Uh, I, I did think about making that more of a thing, but then everybody uh, dis, uh, was giving me threatening looks at the table every time I mentioned it. <laughs> so I thought I was going to get stabbed after the show. So I just decided to just keep it to be a paper list. Like keeping um, a list of all the people that gave extra credit to oh. me, the dean, instead of uh, instead of to the table. That was the dean. Yeah. I thought it was a fun thing to, to get some uh, more uh, d- uh, coins over to the dean side, just because, yeah, uh, I like it. it. We were getting to the point where like, oh, well. we had no extra credit, and the dean had like forty, and we <laughs> and were like, "Fine, we lived through it." Uh, fucking gross, making this shit happen. Neon Hime asks, "My question is for the dean. I'm looking to run an ETU campaign, and I remember in the second or so session of Wild Cards, the players showed off their class schedules. I would like class schedules to be a thing in my campaign as well, but I have no idea where to begin." Do you have any suggestions or tips on how to set that up for my players? Correct me if I'm wrong, guys, but I think what we did 
was we went to the UT, uh, the University of Texas website and yep. access to their course catalog. Yep. Uh, yep. And just look what happened. Yeah. Yep. Well, we did that and then we found a uh, calendar, a course like calendar builder and just input it in there. The one we found was kind of crappy, but yeah. We sort of just made it up and it was a thing that was fun to play with at first, but we, we kind of let it go over time. Um, it, but it was kind of like the football thing and that, yes. that it was just kind of, yeah, it, I, oh, I really fun to play with. But I think the website we use is freecollegeschedulemaker.com free college schedule maker .com yeah. that and also, definitely won't give you audio problems if you download it onto your computer <laughs> um we are also relatively <laughs> uh sure that it was the university of texas course catalog that we looked at because it was readily available online and because it was a major texas school it seemed like it would be kind of uh, close right what's up it seemed kind of close right right um Zwater wants to know what happened to Nikita after the convergence and how long will it be before we see them again because yeah, he, obviously, made it. he was the best right obviously every campaign needs a Nikita character now um Nikita survived uh and Nikita would gr would go on to eventually reconcile with his daughter and become Aww. an important part of her life Aww. and and um would would serve as her silent guardian and protector for the rest of her life. Aww. Um, that's what happened to Nikita. Mm. I like Nikita. Great. Evil Dice Monkey wants to know who or what was supplying the answer for the app. Was it magic itself? A knowledge demon trapped inside? Something else? I ask because the question Sawyer asked was vague enough that an answer of agree to do the ritual could have been something answering honestly on the best course of action or knowing that the PCs would have the opportunity to sabotage it later. My answer is it was Forrester Harris directly um, using his um, unfair knowledge of everything that was going on uh, and his ability to pierce the veil a little bit. He was aware that if they agreed to do the ritual, um, the events that would occur right after that would lead Helen to realizing what the uh, the other option was, which was why it I have a answered that way. Can I ask you this? What? In the like last couple episodes, did you expect me to use the 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 app? I didn't know what to expect um, from from using the app. I just knew that it was the last season, so it was okay to start giving you answers to questions. Like at one point, one of the questions that you wanted to ask, I think it was the first one. Yeah. You were trying to figure out what to ask, and Adelaide went, or someone at the table said, maybe we should ask who the person behind uh, the Sweetheart Foundation is. And I was like, that would be a cool question to ask right now because you'll get the answer that it's Helen and that'll kind of set you off on a path of discussion. Um, but that was not the question you ended up asking. It was a great yes. And wait, wait. So I, I want to point out the, the first question I think Adelaide mentioned was what happened to fucking, um, God, what's his name? You know, the guy who we ran into. Jackson, Jackson, Jackson. Jackson. What happened oh, to yeah. I think Adelaide mentioned that. And that I did also would have been an interesting question to ask because I was going to tell you the answer to that as well. I was prepared. I was all ready for it. And um, then you didn't ask any of those questions. We asked but... if... No, we asked some bullshit question. We asked if that was Glenn Mac. Like, who was Glenn Mac? We asked if Glenn Mac was the guy who, like, talked with us in yeah. that one... And it was, and we'll get to that. Um, Evil Dice Monkey asks, JCC, what types of cards did you take out of the adventure deck? How many you got in there? Because you seem to get the same one pretty regularly. Um, that's all accident, uh, the accident of fate. I did take out a few of the cards in the deck. The ones I took out were the obvious gimmies. Uh, ETU is an investigation-based campaign, at least the way I run it. So the, the cards that were like, you find all the information you need to know, or this person tells you everything about what's going on. <laughs> Um, I took those out because I was like, well, that's just the whole episode gone if they draw that card. Um, I also took out the ones that would add uh, in too many additional elements to the game because I had a lot that I was juggling already. Like there's cards that give you an, a love interest. Uh, there's cards that give you a reputation or followers or things like that. I took those out in the interest of um, simplicity, but uh, the rest were just them drawing the same cards over and over again. I, I can't answer that. Um, Evil Dice Monkey wants to know, Dom, is Ron excited for the new Moto Razor smart flip phone? <laughs> the, 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 yeah, the new, uh, I don't think he even knows that a new one is coming out. That's how, that's how apart Ron is from, 
from those things. But when he sees it, oh man. Yeah. What happened to that phone? Maybe the best. I still have it. Oh, you still have it. Okay, I was like, where did yeah. it go? Well, we still have your phone, Dom, so I guess an exchange must be made. We do? No. No. <laughs> Evil Dice Monkey wants to know, uh, and, and this is uh, uh, the same question, but there's a new element to it. Was there ever a point at the end, Dom, where you wanted to go against Ron's innate goodness and submit to the Devourer? Uh, had you and Jordan discussed this beforehand, Jordan, did you have a plan for if Dom had made the decision? Would it have extended the finale beyond wild cards' usual late times? By the so, way, I how bullshit it is that people like use the, the name Jordan to mean just like not me. <laughs> what? It's bullshit, yes. right? it, it's, yeah, it's total like, bullshit. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so no, we did not discuss that ahead of time, uh, as has become clear. Um, and it would not have extended the finale out past uh, the end time. It just would have added a stinger uh, to the end of the finale that I was very excited about, but I guess we'll never see it. Okay. Oh, it was sad. <laughs> um, okay, Evil Dice Monkey wants to know for everyone, choose the form of the Destroyer. Which of the three campaigns you have done would you choose to live in? Deadlands, East Texas University, or Prickly Tall Stag and the <laughs> Danger Seekers, comma, pairs? Why? Is it the possibility of bumping into your character, the story of the world, the NPCs, the location? Why? So each of you, which world would you live in? And very quickly, why? Live in probably okay. Prickly Tall Stag or Ooh, ETU. No, that'd be the worst one. And the uh, Danger Seekers, comma, pairs. <laughs> simply because I all don't- incorrect. Because I don't want to live in Deadlands because that seems bad. I'd probably um, live in Pine Box. Box. Yeah, Pine Box probably. Pine does. Box. Yeah. Uh, I also go to Prickly Tall Stag. It sounds no. like fun. No, you guys are wrong. You're you're all wrong. Uh, uh, I didn't know it was a wrong answer. Pine Box. Pine Box would be my answer too. The reason you don't want to live in Prickly Tall Stag. Any world where um, an entire town can plot to murder a guy because he loves a Christmas analog um, yeah. as much as he does, but it won't end until yeah, you're everyone right. agrees. That's a nightmare world. Um, and in the Prickly Tall Stag and the Danger Come of Pairs world. Rat Seekers. If I'm like, I hate this person, <laughs> I could kill them. That, that's true, but if that person was Helm, um, then you would instead just die horrifically and accidentally. So uh, I, I don't know. I would, mask. I would stay away from all of those guys, whether they're Prickly Tall Stag or, or Lovely Thola and the something something comma mangoes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, the Jersey Amicite group. That's what we're going to do next, right? Yeah, that's going to be the next one. <laughs> um, the Jersey driver wants to know for everyone, what do you think was the biggest surprise of the campaign? We did already talk a little bit about yeah. Twist. So does anyone have anything new to add? No. Nah, I, I think, think we already so. covered that one. But yeah. again, wait, okay. I, I do want to say that, um, um, God, what's his name? The professor. Glenn Glenn Mac? Mac? A lot of professors. Mac. Being like against us was like a fun, interesting surprise. We're gonna get to that. We're gonna get to that. Um, <laughs> no, I'm saying I, I thought it was interesting. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, Toa forty seven wants to know. Uh, uh, oh, this is another question, Dean. With the curse beta deck, I need to know what were the curses we didn't see with Addie's curse table, and what was the Joker curse? Uh, we just talked about that. The Joker curse was positive. We did actually see all of the all of the curse results. At Pretty sure we did. Yeah. The Joker curse. What was the Joker curse? We just talked about it. It's a good yeah. thing. It's a plus one to your spirit roll. <laughs> okay. Um, Bondo wants to know, is there any story thread that you wish you had more time to explore? We already, I think, addressed that yeah, one. Yeah, um, Toa47 wants to know, to the group, how was it throughout the ETU campaign where you couldn't do classic healing and had to rely on the old-fashioned way? And if there was an edge, perk, or ritual of healing, would you take it? So my thought... And I think a lot of people agree with this. Is that like, and this is sort of because we playing ETU, we're not just playing like okay, we're we're, we're a, a home group playing ETU, and when we come back, we're, we're playing where we were. We we played every time we came back, we were like weeks ahead of where we were. So the the damage we took in. Um, various adventures like almost never stuck with us for things sure Does that make i sense? think i think in the sense of etu in general i think that we would have maybe taken 
I think the way we played ETU, it wasn't a big deal, like JP said. I think playing ETU in general, if you could find a way to heal, yes, that would be helpful. <laughs> yeah. I almost wanted like our our damage to matter more, and it was just like it's almost like we couldn't because like how things were structured, because it would be like okay, we 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 get in a fight this time, and then we we don't even deal with this fight until months later, you know? Sure. Yeah, I mean that could make it a little bit uh, a little bit tricky, but um, yeah, I, I think the the general answer is yes. Get them heels. <laughs> uh, Toa forty seven asks to the cast, what was your favorite use of a Benny for an item, a reroll, or anything in general? Does anything stand out? I mean, obviously the famous use of a Benny for Megan to roll that ridiculously uh, high number in the thing in the corner episode was a classic one. Garav, I know. Um, is a is a great deal maker when it comes to convincing me to give him things for a Benny. Um, so there's mm -hmm. probably a fair amount of things that uh, that Garav brought in as items that I uh, begrudgingly allowed. Yeah, uh, there's definitely I can't think of one specifically. Was the boomerang one of them? I don't think I don't know if it was. I don't know if it was, but if it was, that was pretty funny. I feel like it was, but I'm not positive. It no. might have been, and then you I feel like it was. Roll. Yeah, I could feel the. I loved it. I love that moment. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I can't. I can't think of anything beyond those. Well, that's fine. You don't have to. I mean, you don't have to think about everything. I don't um, think about everything. <laughs> it's too late. Toa47 wants to know, to the hungry boy, how was it to be blessed or cursed with being a pirate and a werewolf? And what was your favorite moment being it? I was like, who's the hungry boy? Yeah. <laughs> it's angry. The um, made it pretty clear. Uh, so uh, both of those things, I guess they didn't happen too late, but I never found a time to use, like the, the, werewolf, the werewolf thing, the way it's written out, it has a bunch of negatives, as in, I think one episode detailed them pretty well, uh, where I tried to attack Sawyer, because I, my bloodthirst was out of control. So that's why I didn't activate it every time, because it's not always a positive. Um, but the, the, I think I only used the mist for, uh, for uh, Jack LaSalle one other time than in the actual episode where I was Jack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember thinking that was like very like loosely used. And I think that was interesting. I think it was yeah, it, it's partially because like I sometimes just don't, it's not like something on my sheet, something I just have to remember. I probably should have put it on my sheet, but it, it I had a gun at that point too. And it's like, I'd rather just shoot this thing than blind it most times. It, it's Dom's fault. It's, why would it be Dom's fault? Because Dom didn't remember it. <laughs> okay. I guess. Sorry, Dom. Blame Dom. That's okay. For you. I don't, I'm not going to blame Dom. <laughs> um, from Mellow Wolf, tell no one wants to know. Stupid question, but will we get a full song of Mellow Wolf? Um, listen, we are not musicians. We are TTRPG players. But even yeah. if we did have a full Mellow Wolf song, we couldn't share it with you. Mm -hmm. yeah, it might not be okay. Yeah, sorry. Uh, it, it goes against uh, their express wishes. That being said, the, the, the Mellow Wolf like image that um, the Hossman slash Obo cop together with the wolf with a pipe in its mouth and Mellow Wolf over it is like. Very fantastic. Yeah. Just kiss. Great design. Uh, Cult of Goths wants to know, to the Dean, some spoiler question for the season finale. Uh, their question is also about what would have happened if Ron had failed those spirit rolls and, and also asks a little bit about what would have happened. Um, if he had failed the spirit rolls, he would have been compelled to, uh, to uh, invite Ron to Goth. It was a Lovecraftian um, resistance of fear and madness. And had he failed that role, uh, he he would have invited the destroyer, so that we can say for sure. Um, Toa forty seven asks to Addy, what was your favorite ritual casting moment and your worst ritual casting moment? Good question. Oh, that is a good question. Um, man, I don't know. I feel like early on. Well, I, and to be honest, it was really. <laughs> It was fun to do talk with the dead uh, and to call her cat to try it out. Right, that was the first time you cast a ritual, you guys. Mm -hmm. It was, and and partially why is because I panicked and input the my childhood cat who was super important to me, <laughs> and so it was very like kind of I mean it was goofy and I felt kind of silly about it, but at the same time I was like oh mocha, <laughs> um, and the worst I don't know I feel like there was one time where I was like okay. Let's get all the things. Let's do this this thing, this uh, uh, ritual. It's gonna be really important. And then I like crit failed or something, but I don't I don't remember specifically what it was. The rituals sure. were tough, man. They're they tough. Are. They are tough. They're risky. 
Um, the Time Wizard wants to know, time for an old favorite question. If you had a chance to redo a past role, event, box card, or something in the story of all this season, what would it be and why? I don't what know that I have season? anything. This past season. I feel like this is a better answer than I have in my mind. But like, I feel like all our failures are like important to how this mm-hmm. works, you know? Sure. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's hard because it's hard to separate it out like that because yeah, this led to this, this that led to that. I like to think of it like playing until dawn. Uh, <laughs> when you're playing until dawn, you can't save the game and go back and make a different decision. The decision that you make is just the decision you have to live with as the story moves forward. And uh, I feel like that's kind of uh, the way the way this works out when we play. So I, I have a very specific answer to this, and it's actually it happened in the finale um, when. Uh, when we were exiting that realm, that d- demonic hellscape, uh, we, I was, uh, when Ron had fallen from the sky, Calvin and Sawyer were trying to help him up. And uh, I had rolled to help him. And uh, one of my dies in the, inside the tray was one and it rolled and the other one rolled out and it was also a one, which is technically a crit fail, but I immediately picked it up because I've only been counting dice that went into the tray. But I'm like, ah, oh, what if I had failed that? That would have been kind of cool. I don't know what would have happened. But I, I thought that would have been a cool moment to have I a crit. Yeah, I know, I know. And I was like, maybe I should have just let it happen, even though it technically didn't go in the tray. And I've been counting only tray dice. So like, but technically it wasn't a crit fail because it didn't go in the dice tray. You are consistent. I I, I, I will I will say that like uh, Garav as a narc. A narc is a a, a tough position to be in because Real narc, yeah. it easily be a tattletale that everyone hates. But I will say you consistently do it for everybody which makes it equal opportunity and you even though rules which is important even though the 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 narc emote is my face going like this <laughs> yeah Garav's a real narc let's it, do it should, yeah i mean let's be honest Garav's a narc with pleasure. well it was more because you kept calling him a narc <laughs> oh yeah yeah that too. that's true um, Jackson wants to know, throughout this season, was any of the sessions from the ETU book or something you created, Dean? Um, The episode where they reunited with Jackson, the last two episodes, and the siege was inspired by a plot point campaign. The rest of the episodes this season, unless I'm much mistaken, I believe were my own creation. But again, I would have to check the titles. Um... Storyteller wants to know, will there be an epilogue of each of the characters or will they just go on with their lives? Uh, there will be, this and there was. <laughs> I hope you're watching this. There was. Uh, there is one more epilogue that was unlocked that we will get to uh, once we are done with these questions. Um, Zarchanku wants to know, did we ever find out Rosa's cause of death? If not, what was it? Um, no, we didn't. Next question. Did you know, did you know what her cause of death were? Uh, was yes. Ooh. Um. Oh, oh! What made her a ghost? Yeah. Uh. She, yes. Uh. She was. We did not find out what what happened. Um. But it, there were mysterious circumstances around her killing. Um. I did not have a specific instance in mind. Uh. And had had it been something that we chose to explore, we would have created one. Um, but the idea was she was just another victim of the weird, uh, the weirdness of Pinebox and had fallen through the cracks uh, of uh, being covered up. And uh, that was what was up with Rosa. Mm. Zarchan Ku wants to know, what other Savage Tales from Degrees of Horror, Plot Point Campaign, or 12 to Midnight Library would you like to have included if you had the time? All of them. They are all um, worth your time to read, if for nothing else, to plunder and plumb for ideas. Um, but I only had the time to run a few of them and I had to make the decisions that I did. Would I do things different if I went back? Maybe, but just like an Until Dawn, I made these decisions and that's the game we played. <laughs> um, I'm going to keep using exactly. Until Dawn. Until Dawn. Uh, uh, that's a good one. That's a real um, story behind this whole thing. Mr. X wants to know, Dean, what is Mr. one X? secret that the study group missed in ETU? Oh. Love it. Actually, is connected to everyone's favorite moment in the game, which was oh, Adelaide like... making that clutch roll against the thing in the corner. What was going to happen after that, um, had she failed as I expected her to, uh, was Adelaide would have become possessed, and Ooh. the next episode would have been about them realizing that Adelaide was possessed and realizing that the uh, the 
Cross, uh, De La Cruz's Cross, um, had the ability to exercise demons and spirits, which was not something that you all discovered even at the end. The spear um, that the Cross became had the power to heal the corrupted spirits and uh, return them to their original form and have them join your side in the battle. Um, that property of De La Garza's Cross was never discovered. That's one. There are more. Um, Savage Clint asks, for the Dean, every GM deals with players throwing them for a loop with some idea they never expected. What was the most interesting and or significant time that happened during this campaign? Um, I think this campaign. <laughs> we, I, I mean, we already touched on this. There is no, as far as I'm aware, uh, uh, I would say um, both of Ron's major decisions in this in this last season, as we've already touched on, were big ones. But there are minor ones that happen all the time, and I'm just trying to learn to roll with the punches, um, as every GM, excuse me, should I think. Um, Savage Clint wants to know for everyone. This was your first time using the new suede rules. What's your favorite change or new rule? Oh. Crit fails for me. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say crit fails. Yeah. As much as I hate them, it adds a an extra bit of just like fear yeah <laughs> and like unavoidable negative problems i mean a, a gm of savage worlds at a table that isn't littered with extra credit can also freely hand out bennies and i've played in many games like that but oh, every reroll comes with the risk of rolling a crit fail. So the the ability to just sit and re-roll until you get the result you want is definitely mitigated by that rules change. So yeah. my biggest, my, my biggest, most most exciting thing about the whole thing is binnings. It, it's like what it's, it's the amount of things you can do with binnings. And I know that we 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 have a system where we don't end up using binnings as much as like perhaps a regular Savage Worlds group. But like, I think the expansion of Benny's as a resource is just like, and I've always thought it's great. And I've always thought that Benny's is like one of the strongest elements of Savage Worlds in general. Yeah. And like is what makes it fascinating. And it allows you to take your character and let them do things that are cinematic and fantastic and out of the normal. And I, I think expanding it like even more than it already was, is just like a brilliant move. It's so good. Uh, Dom, did you have a favorite rules change? Uh, no, I mean, I, I would probably say crit, uh, crit fails also, just because of what they're, the, the capability of storytelling, I think, that you, in a way, are forced into doing mm -hmm. um, uh, through it. I think it's a really great uh, RP mechanic and just rpg mechanic in general uh it's it's just essentially um weaponizing a you know that that one like what okay now act something major is going to happen here it's not you're not you didn't just fail you failed miserably and and i i like that concept i hate it but i love it yeah yeah <laughs> Um, it, it definitely adds a lot of really fun, unavoidable wrinkles to things. And, and for that reason, I think, yeah, we, we hate it and love it. Um, yeah. We are so close, guys. We're doing really well. We're, we're in the final stretch here. Let's nail, let's nail these final questions here. Okay, go, 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 go. Savage Clint wants to know, for the players, in two parts, so be concise, what original backstory concept or later plot element for your character never ended coming up uh, in the game, or at least not as much as you expected, no. part one. Part two... What unexpected storyline for your character did you enjoy the most? So, uh, go ahead. I really wanted Adelaide to be um, more directly influenced or affected by demons or possessed. I really wanted to do that because I wanted to play with sort of the Willow uh, story arc. Um, mm -hmm. But as it went on, it was apparent that there really just wasn't time and space for that in a lot of ways. <laughs> Um, and I think the one that was um, interesting was playing with Lauren. Um, that was, um, it was difficult and it was extra difficult with ETU, but um, I, I feel like it was, a, um, uh, yeah, it, it was a, it, an interesting, difficult, but sort of um, paralleled some of the things I wanted. It wasn't quite the same, but within the context and the space that we had time for, it, it sort of allowed some of that. 
Um, I, I I wanted Calvin to do a little more with the frat stuff, but I just didn't go. I just it's partially my fault because I just didn't have any more ideas of what to do because he did essentially become one of the top people in the frat, but then like it just barely came uh, into the show because it just didn't happen. You were the skeeter. Uh, the skeeter is right. much like the title of Pan being passed around the Lost <laughs> Boys. Uh, you, you were the skeeter now. I was the skeeter. Yeah, exactly. And um, I think his uh, relationship with Rosa was the one that I enjoyed exploring the most uh, throughout the show. And uh, even though it ended a little bit tragically, uh, it was heroic on her end. So I think it ended well. I think for me, um, the thing that was like a little, um, that I didn't get to explore as much was that like Sawyer wanted to understand what was going on. It was sort of essential to the plot that he couldn't, you know? And, and there was a little bit of a, I, I don't, I don't mean like emasculation is the word I'll use, but like I don't mean it like that. It, it's more like he just like couldn't quite reach the the point of that he wanted with his group and his even his secret society because it was almost essential that he could not actually understand what's going on. You know, sure. Um, I would have uh, liked to see more happening with the the cult and the compound and stuff, having having more instances. But um, I liked what we were able to do, uh, and um, I think Ron becoming the Captain America um, uh, idol for like the school basically. But was... you didn't say the line in the last episode when it was like totally. Sure, sure I did. Sure I did. Let's go. <laughs> you did. Yeah, let's go. The, the 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 battle cry that will echo through through the ages yeah. uh, and be written about by the bards. Mm -hmm. Let's go, <laughs> let's go, let's go, let's go. New T-shirt um, on the T Public. Store. Let's go. We are on, says we are in the final ten questions. BSB Care asks for everyone: Did y'all have an "Oh crap, we may not get out of this alive" moment this season? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The this... penultimate, right? <laughs> Well, that yeah, was... I mean, thing in, thing in the Corner was definitely mm. one. Uh, just from the... this season, though. Oh, just for this season? Um, yeah, there yeah, was a couple Randy, Siege. Randy's episode where, yeah. where yeah. I, I, I mean, I've already said it, but, like, I, I thought I was dead. I, I swear to God, I thought I was dead. Yeah. All right. All right. Uh, <laughs> the Care also wants to know, um, he, he wanted to know about backup characters, which we already addressed, but he also said, Dean, could you tell us how you plan to introduce one or more new characters if they were needed? Um, if they were needed, I think the easiest and best way to do it would have been to introduce them as the, uh, the victim of some sort of supernatural uh, event happening on campus that the study group came to the aid of, and then through that they became integrated into the study group, uh, much like uh, we introduced Howell in uh in deadlands mm -hmm. um i feel like that's the, the the cleanest easiest way but it really would have depended on the character uh that they created um so it's hard to say um uh, inex spitter uh has a bit of a uh, multi-part question so we're going to answer these as they come question for the dean when did you start doing the costumes for character distinctions and do you find it's helpful for you as much as it is for the players in the audience i started doing that i think in the first season of Wild Cards, uh, and it yeah. just kind of started off as a joke. I was able to buy these uh, Western photo booth props for like 15 bucks, and it was just a quick and easy cheat code to be like, these glasses are this character, this mustache <laughs> is this character. It took a little bit of the pressure of me trying to come up with like incredibly distinct personality traits that I had to remember to act out for each person, and I feel like it's great visual shorthand for the players to be like, oh no, those glasses, it's Barrett. Um, like it's, it's just an easy way to, to kind of create an NPC reference point for people. So I have become a fan of using it. I started as a joke and now it's something I think is really helpful. Um, question for the study group. If you went to ETU, would you fare well against the paranormal threats or transfer out ASAP? Uh, realistically, I'd probably transfer out. Transfer I... out, right? Yeah. I transfer, I transfer. <laughs> Oh, I don't know, man. <laughs> I might stick around for a little bit, and then when things got too dangerous, I might transfer, but I'd probably stick around for a bit. I think I would, like, die sophomore year. 
Um, question for the Dean, which horror were you most excited to unleash upon the study group or just really excites you as an idea? For some reason, uh, I don't know. I, I feel like at the risk of sounding like a broken record, I, I really enjoyed the thing in the corner. It was just meant to be like sort of a one-off episode. Um, but the uh, idea of what was happening there, bringing it back as the way that Randy was defeated in the season two finale, um, I, I just really started to like enjoy like what what is the deal with this thing? Like um, what's going on here? And and that was fun. Um, question for the study group: Which ETU horror would most likely have ended your college career early? The Needler, the Small Business Cultists, the LARP Death Knight, etc. It's not a, it's not any of those. It's, it, it's, um, for me, it was when Sawyer, after, um, God, what's her name? Um, the person who tried to seduce Stacy, uh, Ron, Stacy, oh. after he found all the like bodies in her house, like the dead bodies there, I think that would have been, that would have been the end for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to, I'm going to say Bug Boy. Bug boy. Okay. Yeah. Not a big fan of bugs. I, I have to say for me in college, I would have been, um, I'd have been murdered by someone like Stacy easily. I'd have fallen for that. Yeah. Um, I'd have been like, I'd have been like, oh, yeah, they noticed me. And then uh, I would have been killed. 100%. <laughs> oh, I don't know. If it was me, it'd probably be something ghost related. I would just, I don't know. I, I can't think of a specific one. I don't know. All you I can think of is ET undeclared. Uh, you could have died from doing an actual ritual and just yeah, probably it, it roofed somehow. Probably would have been possessed by the thing in the corner. <laughs> yeah. Dom? Yeah. Uh, you wouldn't get in that role. I would say probably either Stacy or um or honestly the small business uh, association, just because like when <sighs> I was in high school and stuff, like I got a lot of local scholarships for for college and stuff from local businesses so like that completely like rang true that's your so I, yeah yeah so it was so it's like so it's like yeah i would yeah okay well thanks thanks very much for this oh thanks right your scholarship. yeah why are you turning me up <laughs> belgorod wants to know did you stop updating the character sheets on the stream it seemed like some of the characters had higher stats than were displayed is there a place to see their final stats uh if you're talking about the cards that are scrolling by dom was always really good about keeping those up to date as long as we gave him timely information for uh stat increases which i, I often didn't <laughs> i believe the final character sheets it should be on our website they're still scrolling by are these not i'm, I'm looking these are this. yeah these are these correct. are updated well, these are all correct yeah if you're wanting the full character sheets, they're linked on our website, wildcards.savingthrowshow.com. Did I up Spirit as my last move? I don't remember, man. I have so many things after remember. I don't remember what your last advance was. I, I, I know people were questioning, uh, maybe this is a question later, people were questioning Ron's, why Ron's attributes were lower than everybody else's or or didn't seem to be raised as, as highly. And I just, I didn't do it. I didn't do it that way. I, just, I chose I chose edges over over trade increases. So. Um, the Knight of Knee wants to know what is your favorite color, and I will answer for all of us. Uh, it's green. It's green. Uh, no, it's I not. think the answer is me. No, it's green. Yellow. Evil dice monkey. Red. You no. Know, is this the last question on the list? No, sorry, close. <laughs> um, Vampire fifty four wants to know other than the world ending things. Uh, other than the world ending, things you wanted in the last season, we already, I think, kind of addressed that. Some wish list things that we could have explored with the characters. Um, DJ Regular wants to know, uh, for the Dean, given that you were working with the plot point campaign, were the bits that you altered or added the result more of the players or your own whims? Wait. Can I, can I go back for one thing that I kind of wish we had in the fourth season that we didn't? Yes, if it's quick. <laughs> yeah. I... We had talked about potentially having a, a, a reason for Sawyer and Barrett to work together. Oh, yeah. Mm. And, like, potentially, like, have to create a channel together, like like a YouTube channel. And it never really happened. Never but, like, happened. as much as Sawyer hated him, I think it could have been fun for, like, them to have to work together. For um, Barrett already has a production partner, and it's Malkaroth, the Imperator of Ash. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, DJ Regular had asked about the plot point campaign. This was really, really difficult, um, especially Glenn Mac. 
the fact that Glenn Mac was lying to them the whole time, it didn't sit well with me. And the reason for that is, uh, while I thought it was an interesting thing, um, I feel like RPG players in general uh, have the meta knowledge, typically, that most people who seem um, likable and trustworthy, um, anyone can betray them and will for the interest of the story. And, and for me, I didn't find it as dramatically interesting that Glenn Mac was just working against them. So I did alter that a bit in a way that was never made perfectly clear. Um, the mind control tech that Randy used on Sawyer was the prototype for what Helen wanted to use on Glenn Mac. Helen's manipulation of Glenn Mac was magical, emotional, and also technological. The reason Glenn Mac didn't remember having that breakfast with you guys is because it was erased from his memory. Um, whenever he would get, whenever things would get too heated with Helen or he would get too protective of you, um, she had that fail safe that she could just turn on and wipe uh, selective bits of his memory what? or get him to act in different ways. It was still largely coming from him, but he would have fought more for you all. I really liked Glenn Mack as a character, and I feel like I did a disservice to him in the way that I played him. There were also some difficult points, specifically the Lantern of the Deep, that episode with the alligator attack. I remember reading that and being like, my players are never going to get back in the water after an alligator <laughs> attacks them. Why would they? Why would they do that? I was like... Because <laughs> <laughs> we, we very much were like... Why would we do that? It was at that point when I was reading ETU and we were already three seasons in, I was like, I think we might be playing this. I think we might be trying to play this a little too realistically for the set. I feel like we kind of, our approach, while it works for us and was dramatically grounded, I feel like it got in the way of some of the plot point campaign stuff and that was difficult. So I did alter some things to make it easier for uh, them to be able to justify some stuff, or at least I tried to, and I tried to alter things to make to, to make myself happier with the way they turned out. Was it successful? You be the judge. Um, but good question, DJ Regular. Uh, Ghost in the Network asks, Dean, at what point in the campaign did you most fear the study group would perish? The first time was the thing in the corner. I thought one of you was gonna get possessed for sure. Um, other times I thought you were gonna die most fearfully. The three-eyed Jack LaSalle episode, I was like, what if what a freaking backfire? I was oh, just God. trying to do like a fun little wacky episode and it everyone wasn't even in that episode. So it was just like, whatever, we'll have a fun time with pirates. Yeah. Um it, those times were the closest. And then uh uh the siege uh, came pretty close as well. But at that point I was like, we're almost done. So if someone dies now, it can be like a like a like a moment mm -hmm. um but but yeah uh fractured avatar 13 asks did you expect everyone to make it and who specifically did you think would not make it i was oh. almost positive sawyer would die i'm uh, right most like, because serious. he just kept getting shot by mm -hmm. calvin and other people <laughs> um i was gonna die like it, it, it was very clear it was gonna happen i tried i was pretty sure it was gonna be sawyer I tried. But they, all, <laughs> they all lived I wait. I was really, really, really close to dying. That one. Hey, I, I actually, I haven't seen this question because this came in last minute. I think this is a really interesting question to end uh, the document on. Fractured Avatar Thirteen asks Garav, were you worried about playing an African American character? Uh, yes, absolutely, I was a hundred percent. And I think I talked to the group. Like, I asked you guys, like, is this okay? that I do this, like, I know I'm a person of color, but I'm not that person of color. So it's like, and also like, I, I actually, I think I, I also messaged um, DJ regular about this. Cause he's someone that I know through who has played RPGs and is a person of color that uh, I was like, Hey, is this like cool? And he's like, yeah, yeah, I think it's fine. And I, I think uh, I, I didn't like go into any tropes that were too racially relevant or anything, but um no, I, I, I will say, I think you did. I, I was really nervous about that uh, initially because yeah. I, I was worried about um, potential missteps or the way that uh, people might react if they felt like we were um, not being respectful or, or, or any reason. It was a potential, it's a, always a potential minefield. And as, as, a, as a white person, I also have a little bit of like that, that sort of like 
um, I, I want to be helpful, but I'm also oversensitive about things because oh. I'm white. Right. Um, I think, okay. this, this, I think, go on. Oh, sorry. This was actually a, a point that was brought up in a panel that we did at, oh God, I forget the convention. P, uh, it was a- uh, DreamHack. Yep. Thank you. Uh, and uh, this this was interesting because um, that, that panel had Abria Ingar, which uh, she's the GM of uh, a Pirates Assault Bay on our channel. Um, we had Stephen Pope, we had me, Ashlyn, and Dom. I think that was it. And uh, it was interesting because Abria had some thoughts on that. And, and her thoughts were, I think it's important to step out of your um, comfort zone and play other um, like play POCs, play to essentially to represent it and to kind of get into that space and to be willing to kind of mess up, but also to be willing to go, I messed up and you shared with me what I did or I've learned and now I know better. Um, and also, yes, to stay away from stereotypes and to not describe skin color using food. That was, uh, <laughs> that was uh, one, those were the things that really stood out to me that she said. And, and, and because that is also something that I, I am afraid of, but I, I think it's important, especially like our table is predominantly white. Um, and I think it's, if, if that's what we are and we're all here, then much like Gaurav did, we can represent other people uh, at the table that we don't actually literally have sitting at the table. And, and I think being a streamed RPG that, that can actually be important. And whether it's uh, people of color or it's um, uh, different uh, sexualities or different genders, things like that. It's scary, but I think it's important. I, I, think, I, I think it's important to point out the fact that like, despite who we are as people, like we think, and I, I guess I can't make a statement for everybody, but like diversity is something that's very important to us as a group, you know. And um, I, I don't know. I thought it, I thought it was an interesting element to add that into Calvin as a character. And I don't think it's something like I should have done, and I didn't. You know, it, it's not my story to tell. If that makes sense. But I'm glad that we like tried to address some of that stuff. In, I also, uh, I just want to say like hats off to you, Gaurav, um, because I feel like you played uh, Cal and, and this is from my point of view, but I, I feel like you didn't, you, you were not stereotypical. You didn't make his character about the race that he was, but you were very clear in playing him as a three-dimensional character who was also an African-American character. And um, I, I feel like it worked. I, I feel I, I felt like you did a really good job with it um, and walked that line. And even though it can be a little bit of a uh, uh, a uh, balancing act and, and, a, and a place to put yourself in a position of vulnerability because you could mess up and you could make people mm -hmm. upset. Um, I feel like you you handled it bravely and well, and um, I just want to want to say kudos to you for that. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, um, I I I can't imagine Calvin in any other way. Honestly, now if I if I decided to even try, like it, he is that he is that person now. Yeah. Um, that is the end of the questions that were submitted. So I think now it's time for the final epilogue. Epilogue, the one you really want to see, is what I titled this. So, um, in a place filled with mist and darkness and a sky dotted with innumerable stars, a woman falls uh, to her hands and knees from, from somewhere and looks up wildly around her to see where she is. Off in the distance, not too far away, shrouded somewhat by the mist is what looks like a small wooden house and hidden in darkness a figure sits on the front step of that house his face encircled in smoke and he sees the woman and calls back behind him uh whatever it was that you were doing i i think you got one and looks back to the the woman and tips his hat, miss. And as a tall, very broad man with a kind face walks out from inside of the house, he says, well, hell, she's just a kid. She, she, she's, she's just a kid. She shouldn't be here. Another man dressed in black walks out after him. Well, 
I think that you of all people should be aware that we shouldn't be judging people uh, just by their appearance. Last but not least, a woman comes bursting out of the house and stands not on the porch, but moves over to the woman who has arrived and hushes the men on, on the porch. Why don't you all just give her a moment while we sit here and say, welcome to you. I know this must be confusing and I'm, I know you must have a lot of questions, but why don't you come inside and we can answer some of those questions and, and give you a safe place to stay and be protected from all of this until you figure out your own way around. And Rosa looks up from the ground into the, the beautiful but haunted face of the woman in front of her and says, well, thank you very much. I, uh, I, I like that. And that is final epilogue for our ETU campaign. And now, having finished that, before we do our lightning round to uh, answer the questions from chat, I guess we owe you one more bit of information. What are we doing next on Wild Cards? What will be the next thing that we bring to you? What will be happening next season? Where are we going? What are we playing? Drum roll, please. Don't the answer drunk. to that question <laughs> is 50 fathoms. Which would have been a much more fun joke if you guys hadn't ruined it in the Discord by guessing that I would say that and not. <laughs> I've been planning to do that this entire time, um, but it just got ruined at the last minute by the Hussman's Deadpool. So whatever, ha ha, 50 fathoms. No, um, and also we don't hate 50 fathoms. It's just a joke at this point. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's, here's the deal. Oh, I think it'd be fun. We're doing 49 fathoms. We, we have been playing wild cards and I have been running it for um, a, a little over three years now. And it has been, um, it, for me, the experience of, of a lifetime uh, definitely ranks very highly. It's very important to me. It is also incredibly draining um, emotionally, physically, and uh, creatively. Uh, in this past year, uh, it has been very, uh, it's been a very difficult for one, me, one for me personally um uh, professionally and then also there's all this pandemic that's happening right now what um, what are you what doing? Is happening is i need a little bit of a break i need a sabbatical i need some time to recharge creatively uh and to get back in touch with uh with uh the the system and the game and myself as a gm and to take some time which i haven't had the chance to do in a while to uh read up on some stuff and uh, learn some, do some more reading, do some more learning, uh, do some more growing as a GM. As a result of that, the next thing that we will be doing are wild cards interludes. Each one of the players here at the table is going to take their turn in the GM seat at the wild cards table. I will be a player, not a GM. And each one of them is going to present a two-part episode in a world or a setting that is exciting to them to show off some other aspects of Savage Worlds and for us to just do whatever feels fun and just blow it out. After that is done, we will return with a new campaign of wild cards that I will be GMing. What will that be? You will have to tune in for our wild cards interlude <laughs> episodes because we will be doling out hints and uh, and and uh, little little tips towards what we might be doing throughout that process. <laughs> but three weeks from now, three Fridays from, or sorry, uh, we will take a three week break. And then the Friday after that, which uh, the date, uh, do you have that June date? June 12th, offhand? I believe. June 12th? I believe. Stay, hang, hang, yes. hang tight to our socials. We'll announce it for sure. But June 12th. Don Zook will be the first taking the GM seat as he runs us through two sessions of Wild Cards Interludes, Indiana Jones. <laughs> so that is what we will be starting with. Each one of the Wild Cards will have a chance to take the GM spot as we go through their interludes. And then at the end of the season, we will tell you what the new campaign will be. But I hope that you are as excited to join us as each of them takes a spin in the chair and uh, some of them returning spins to the chair. I mean, let's be honest, these guys are no strangers to running games themselves. Um, but- uh, I mean, I've, I've never run a, uh, I've, I've never run a, a, a campaign in my life, so. 
and I'm very excited to see what you bring to the <laughs> table. Uh, I'm excited to play in your games, and I hope that the rest of you will join us for this as well. Um, I think it's going to be a lot of fun, and uh, like I said, there will be some information to be gleaned about what we will be doing next. So Wild Cards Interludes will what will be the next thing on the docket for the wild cards and uh, i personally am very excited about it both for the restorative break that i get to take and also all the cool games i get to play in with my friends so <laughs> that will be happening next we have a few minutes before 12 30 in that time <laughs> Uh, send us send us your questions in the chat panel uh, in the chat panel and we will answer them lightning round style. I do not have the chat window pulled up, but those of you who okay. call out questions that you see and we I'll will do it. I'll do it. Dom will do it. Dom will call out the questions. Yeah. All right. So submit your questions. We'll go lightning round style. It can be a question about anything at all. The game, whatever, um, whatever you want. Not fifty fathoms, correct, Belgarad. Um, no, 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 no questions have come in. Okay, yet. Uh, wait, well, we can't guarantee not fifty fathoms, right? I mean, I can't guarantee it. Probably not fifty fathoms. How many rejected creature ideas did you have, JCC? A pixel puffin asks. How many rejected creature ideas? Yeah. I, I always dance with the girl I came with. If I have a if I have a creature idea and it seems weird, I'm like, I don't know. I'm gonna figure out a way to make this work. Let's just do it. So none, no rejected what, creature ideas. What happened to Jennifer Sanders, asked Thrithland. Uh, Jennifer Sanders, uh, that is a great question. I'm going to say um, that uh, she, despite the, the machinations of her family to get, uh, to get her to come back home, I will say Jennifer Sanders, uh, you, you know, after the study group graduates, somebody's gotta be around to investigate the weird happenings in Pine Box and it, it might as well be Jennifer and her friends. Love it. Uh, uh, young Gandeldorf asks, uh, favorite whiskey? Um, none. None. <laughs> we got none, none. I'll also say none. Um, Pull it. Um, um, but I also actually, so Teeling whiskey is my very favorite, which, which I had in, um, in, in, uh, uh, Ireland. And I went to their thing and I, I went to their, their distillery and got a really nice thing out of that. So Teeling or Bullet? Teeling or Bullet, you yeah. know. Uh, uh, JCC, what mystical being did you have to pledge your undying devotion to to make sure the same character was saved by both the dice rolls and the donations in the ETU Undeclared episode that kicked off season three? Um, that was that was all you guys. Um, I, it, it just I, I knew at that point that um, Mike Squire had been chosen to survive. The dice rolls falling the way they did just helped me tell that story. That was a happy accident. Um, so How I fun will... was that episode though, right? What's up? How fun was that episode, though? It was right? pretty fun. Was, I, I gotta give great. it up uh, to the to, to the RNG. Um, uh, Butcher Pete asked, "Where can I get one of them shirts?" JCC uh, Scott Thulu made us these shirts. Yeah. Uh, we, there are two versions: one there with are. Barrett and one without Barrett. Uh, uh, I'm the Barrett graffiti uh, version. Yeah. They're my so, favorite damn shirts. But. There's no so, copy. Yeah, un we wear them all the time. Unfortunately, uh, you'd have to talk to Scott Thulu You'll about that. You'll have to ask. Wait, wait, wait. wait. I, I also have to say that Scott Thulu is is just like one of my favorite fans of all time because at Gen Con, um, the I think it was two years ago, um, he came up to me and he was like, "Excuse me, aren't you the guy who plays Jeremiah Stibbins?" <laughs> and for a moment, I was like, "I don't know who this guy is talking about." Anyways, when he said Jeremiah Stibbins, I was like. Pretty, that's, pretty good opening line. That's my favorite interaction ever. It's, it's <laughs> Scott Thulu, uh, you're the best. Who were Ron's parents? I don't know. Oh, <laughs> yeah. uh, when will we the see Darth Savage? Sidious. When will we see Savage Harry Potter? Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have done Savage Harry Potter a couple of times on the channel. Um, Megan did that yeah. three times. Three. Uh, I have. I, I did it twice. Savage Harry Potter. Um, I have never run Savage Harry Potter, um, no. and I have some ideas of different mm -hmm. ways to do it. We've tried many different ways of doing yes. Harry Potter. It's tough. It's Maybe tough. One day I'll take a stab at it. I was in one of them. Uh, I was in that the one was that uh, uh, Sergeant that Awesome. Gravity ran, but but Megan was in it with me. Mm -hmm. uh, Relative D Pod asks, uh, "What was your favorite mystery box submission from the community?" There was oh, one man. recently that was really cool, but I don't remember what it was. <laughs> 
you guys come up with some cool stuff. I, I like yeah. the ones that think outside the box. Um, I liked I liked the ones um, that, uh, what was the, oh, there was one in the Siege episode that combined all your bennies, I think, into a comic. Yeah, that, oh, one. Yeah. that yeah. one was yeah. super like that. cool. That, that was kind of interesting. Um, the, I like, uh, I like I the one it. where like it was it was weird the way that we play this game it, it 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 was functionally very weird but I loved what the results were where we black out for an hour and then we come back I, and everyone's like oh my god look at all the <laughs> stuff that you did anytime I drew that card I was like what am I gonna do this time yeah yeah somehow it worked uh uh Neon Hime asks uh, any chance of seeing Rippers as a future wild card so I don't know I guess so maybe um uh join us for interludes. <laughs> Any thoughts on Ripper Psychosis and Ripper's Resurrected? I've got nothing. I, I don't know enough about that. We'll have, wait, to wait, wait. we'll have to get back to you on that one. Let me say something to like everyone about like various Savage World settings. The majority of us like do not and almost cannot look into Savage World <laughs> That's true. Because JCC prefers it for us to like discover it when he tells us about it. So I like even with even even with Deadlands, which we've done a decent amount, like we know less than a lot of people who are like big fans of Deadlands, and I'm a huge Deadlands fan. I love this shit. Um, but like I in um, in uh, the... lightning round, JCC. <laughs> hey, that's me. I'm JCC. <laughs> You're JCC. Yeah. yeah. Oh, lightning round, Jordan. But like even Hell on Earth, I started reading the book and it, it spoiled something for me, and I stopped. And I was like, oh no. I can't. very good. Uh, uh, number one tip for GMing a Deadlands game. Um, start with what people know from Westerns and then build to the weirdness. Um, give, give them the hook so they can get into the world and then make their magnificent seven characters have to deal with ghosts and ghouls and goblins and stuff. Uh, it's, it's a, I feel like a more organic progression. That's my number one bit of advice. I like that. Uh, where did you get the ETU hoodies? Um, I we we made them. Uh, yeah, yeah. This is a patch. I I ordered a patch. Yeah, Megan's Megan's got a patch, and I I had mine screen printed on my hoodie. Yeah, I um, have a patch Megan made for me, but I haven't put on anything. Garab too. Yeah, yeah, I will. Where's and gonna go? See me, oh David God. has one, I believe. Uh, yeah. Which character was your funniest improv, JCC? bookstore guy like I, I, yeah. I will i don't know that i'll ever come up with an idea that <laughs> me as much as that on the you spot well yeah. you will it's lily um uh we kind of answered that one uh personal uh yeah we we got it belgrad we don't know who his true parents are um <laughs> ink spitter uh uh personal non-rpg hobbies video games uh, yeah. video games sure yeah i love me some video games uh cooking Oh, you could, you know. Hey, miniature. That's RPGs. Miniatures. Oh, I guess it's the biggest one. Read for me. comic books. Yeah, I, all of my hobbies are squarely in the realm of geekdom: comic books, board games, video games, uh, all that stuff. Two video. Yeah. Arena Valor. Text. Stuff. I write and make films. Oh, uh, we all are like me and JCC and Megan. Well, me, me and Megan most, but also. Uh, um <laughs> what are we okay right. moving on we play arena valor <laughs> arena valor yeah. yes yeah it's a yeah. mobile you, you do you do you absolutely League of legend. Do. um uh let's a see a couple more before we end if there are any uh owen lean says we all freaking rock lightning round what was the name of the orange cat in the tom and jerry cartoons what do we call the phenomenon of naturally occurring electrostatic discharge during which two electrically changed charged regions in the atmosphere or ground temporarily equalize themselves lightning lightning <laughs> uh we will see some uh savage world one shots savage world one shots in the future yes uh, uh two well shots. they're two shots basically two shot. yeah. yes uh yes. two part episodes coming at you you doubled your fun uh yeah there there is some official uh merch that uh that the 12 to midnight folks have uh favorite video game during this pandemic arena of valor yeah that, that's Early. what i most. arena of valor a lot. i've been playing i just purchased Star stardew valley because i only get into oh. video games years after they're relevant uh and oh that one God. has been really helpful that's for me. so good yeah. animal crossing is what i'll say uh uh, what is everyone's favorite superhero? Green Batman. Lantern. Spider-Man. Green Spider Lantern, Superman. 
It's Spider Man. Constantine. Gambit. Yeah, well, Constantine's great. Batman, because yeah. that's. I'm, 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 a, I'm a Green Lantern Spider Man guy Spider-Man. for sure. Um, Green, Green Spider. Spider. That's my favorite. Yeah, yeah the Green Spider. What? Green Spider. Um, Spider Lantern. What's your favorite <laughs> animal? What's your favorite animal? Cat. Spider Monkey. Wolf. Yeah, meow. Uh, uh, rhinoceros. Rhinoceros. What IP would you like to see Savage the most? Uh, everything. Just everything, uh, man. A lot of things. Uh, yeah. Yeah, everything. everything. Mystery Man. <laughs> uh, favorite show to binge right now, Community. Oh, Community. Uh, I, I've been binging Community. It's amazing. It's I, fantastic. Uh, the it's Office is my favorite binging. back when it first came out. And like watching it again, it's just like, it's been amazing. It's There's very, only three episodes, but Middle Ditch and Schwartz on uh, oh, Netflix oh, yeah. is, is just really great improv comedy. And so, I Lethal Weapon? <laughs> Lethal Weapon's not a TV. Well, it is a TV <laughs> I know. Show. That's not what we're binging. It was ridiculous. Oh, okay, wait. Um, uh, Midnight Gospel is also phenomenal. And the first episode's like fine. But like it gets it gets really really good. It, you keep saying that. Uh, thoughts on a uh, I think sixth gun tarot themed Deadlands campaign. Yeah, let's do uh, it. Sure. Cool. Yeah, I, I have a lot of thoughts. Um, <laughs> gr- gr- sorry, we can't get specific. I don't know any uh, much. I, I love six gun stuff. Um, I read the uh, first Garav- draft novel. Yeah, Garav and JP. If for the rest of your life you could choose one magic or video games. Uh, I pick video games because there's video games about magic. So, you, you oh. magic for me. Uh, have you, you ever heard of? Have you ever heard of uh, Crystal Hearts? Yes, those those folks yeah. are awesome. They're very cool. Yeah, they are really great. Uh, check check out um, up to four players if you want to learn mm-hmm. Savage Worlds. You can learn it through a web through the yeah. format of a web comic, and it's really really great. Yeah. It's super helpful. Easy web. Uh, yeah. Uh, and highly recommend Six Gun. Yeah, Six Gun is very cool. Some of the best graphic novels. Yes, have the RPG books. Yep. Okay, done. All right, great. Hey, that was our lightning round. Thank you guys so so much for submitting your questions. Um, I, I, this this time especially, I I feel like you guys had a lot of really insightful, really cool questions. Yeah. Like, it's always interesting to see what stands out to you and what we can talk about from from the game. Um, thank you so much for continuing to support the channel too. You guys unlocked every single epilogue, um, which means a lot. And I, I hope that you found them enjoyable and a fitting end to the characters that you all have spent so much time <laughs> with us here uh, living with and, and uh, experiencing. Uh, thank you to all of you for being uh, awesome players and uh, thoughtful responders to these questions. Thank uh, you. And also, I want to say, like, if, if you have a question that you feel like wasn't answered here, join our Discord. Like, yeah. Ask us about it, because this campaign is, like, wrapped up. So, like, I I mean, you know, we're all, we would love to talk more about our thoughts on the whole thing. Now that yeah. we've done this chat back, um, it's open season on uh, the ETU campaign. 100%. 100%. So you yeah. can ask us uh, stuff in the Discord if you want. We're not always in there in the Discord. Some of us are more active than others, but we will always mm-hmm. try uh, if we if we see it. It helps if you tag us. Uh, it does, yeah. <laughs> I will, uh, yeah, as we're wrapping up here, I will say on Sunday, uh, which at this point is tomorrow, um, <laughs> uh, we are doing a special fundraiser for Raises, uh, which uh, raises money for legal and social services for immigrants. Uh, and especially now during coronavirus and stuff, uh, a lot of things are happening uh, in that world and, uh, and especially the detainees and stuff. So we are trying to do our part uh, and it's going to be a special tempting fate one-off of DuckTales. So I'm excited. I also heard there's a cool special guest that got announced for that today. There Ooh. is, yes. We have one of the writers, uh, although it's still a potential disney is disney is a tricky beast to run through so we've we've, we went through one hoop but yes potentially one of the writers of ducktales will be uh playing with us that's pretty cool Um, it's it's very cool yes uh uh so do please tune in for that that's five o'clock pacific standard time uh and uh pirates of salt bay continues on tuesday nights so i hope that you can watch that i mentioned this because wild cards is going to be going away and we t- currently don't have anything there were things that we were going to be filling spaces with uh but because of covid19 uh some of the programming that we had planned is is not happening right now so i hope that you can come in and check out some of the other shows that we do here uh i'm very very proud and happy of of the stuff that we work on and i think that you would enjoy it if you don't watch it already um so please do come by uh and watch uh, salt bay with me and uh, and and I can chat with you in, in the chat. It's going to be awesome. 
And um, like I said, we will be uh, gone for the next three weeks. We come back with Wild Cards interludes on June 12th. We're pretty sure. Check social media for the exact date. Um, but uh, we hope in the meantime, we have both of our campaigns that are up on YouTube. You can watch them, uh, a lot of them as Twitch VODs. Spread the word about the show. The more people that we can have who, uh, if, if you enjoy it, if you can get someone else to come in who also enjoys it, then they get someone to come in who enjoys it, and it goes on and on. You guys Friends. are an awesome community, and we want, we want you to grow. We want the, we want the show to, to succeed, obviously, but we also just love uh, what a great community you guys have been around this. So, so mm -hmm. please do spread the word about yeah. the show, about the channel, um, and uh, if you have friends who want to see awesome RPGs being played, we're a great place to do it. After we, we, we each run our campaigns, which I guess we'll, we'll figure out a piece by piece as it goes on, you'll figure out what the new major campaign for Deadlift for wild cards that'll be great right it's yes awesome. that will also be happening so uh stay tuned also uh we are now on instagram at wild cards rpg and we're on twitter although twitter doesn't seem to be sure. on twitter so keep what your eyes that? peeled three-year-olds can't have accounts megan yeah megan no babies on twitter no yeah. babies i just want to be responded to oh my god i just want to be responded to anyway uh oh. keep an eye out for that uh hopefully that will be running soon um players study group Thank you very much for uh, playing this game. Alumni. Thank you. Thank you, JCC. Thank you guys. Alumni. Uh, thank you guys for, for being here and being such great supporters and advocates for the show. Um, it means a lot to us. And uh, we hope that you will join us for the adventures ahead. And for one last time, go Ravens. Oh, 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 o